Introduction to the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Introduction. Cellini Introductory Sonnet and Note Introductory Sonnet This tale of my sore troubled life I write, To thank the God of nature who conveyed My soul to me, and with such care has stayed That diverse noble deeds I brought to light. It was he subdued my cruel fortune's spite, Life glory virtue measureless hath made, Such grace worth beauty, be through me displayed, that few can rival, none surpass me quite. Only it grieves me when I understand what precious time in vanity I have spent. The wind it bears man's frail thoughts away, yet since remorse avails not, I am content. As erst I came, welcome to go one day, here in the flower of this fair Tuscan land. Introductory Note among the vast number of men who have thought fit to write down the history of their own lives, three or four have achieved masterpieces which stand out preeminently. St. Augustine in his Confessions, Samuel Pepys in his Diary, Rousseau in his Confessions. It is among these extraordinary documents, and unsurpassed by any of them, that the autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini takes its place. The life of himself, which Cellini wrote as due to other motives than those which produced its chief competitors, for first place in its class. St. Augustine's aim was religious and didactic. Pepys noted down in his diary the daily events of his life, for his sole satisfaction and with no intention that any one should read the cipher in which they were recorded. But Cellini wrote that the world might know, after he was dead, what a fellow he had been, what great things he had attempted, and against what odds he had carried them through. All men, he held, whatever be their condition, who have done anything of merit, or which barely has a semblance of merit, if so be they are men of truth and good repute, should write the tale of their life with their own hand. That he had done many things of merit, he had no manner of doubt. His repute was great in his day, and perhaps good in the sense in which he meant goodness. As to whether he was a man of truth, there is still dispute among scholars. Of some misrepresentations, some suppression of damaging facts, there seems to be evidence only too good a man, with Cellini's passion for proving himself in the right, could hardly have avoided being guilty of such. But of the general trustworthiness of his record, of the kind of man he was and the kind of life he led, there is no reasonable doubt. The period covered by the autobiography is from Cellini's birth in 1500 to 1562. The scene is mainly in Italy and France. Of the great events of the time, the time of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, of the strife of Pope and Emperor and King, we get only glimpses. The leaders in these events appear in the foreground of the picture, only when they come into personal relations with the hero, and then not mainly as statesmen or warriors, but as connoisseurs and patrons of art. Such an event as the sack of Rome is described because Benevento himself fought in it. Much more complete is the view he gives of the artistic life of the time. It was the age of Michelangelo, and in the throng of great artists, which then filled the Italian cities, Cellini was no inconsiderable figure. Michelangelo himself he knew and adored. Nowhere can we gain a better idea than in this book of the passionate enthusiasm for the creation of beauty which has bestowed upon the Italy of the Renaissance its greatest glory. Very vivid, too, is the impression we receive of the social life of the sixteenth century, of its violence and licentiousness, of its zeal for fine craftsmanship, of its abounding vitality, its versatility, and its idealism. For Cellini himself is an epitome of that century. This man, who tells here the story of his life, was a murderer and a braggart, insolent, sensual, inordinately proud and passionate, 
but he was also a worker in gold and silver, rejoicing in delicate chasing and subtle modelling of precious surfaces, a sculptor and a musician, and as all who read his book must testify, a great master of narrative, keen as was Benevento's interest in himself, and much as he loved to dwell on the splendour of his exploits and achievements, he had little idea that centuries after his death he would live again, less by his Perseus and his goldsmith's work than by the book which he dictated casually to a lad of fourteen while he went about his work. The autobiography was composed between 1558 and 1566, but it brings the record down only to 1562. The remainder of Cellini's life seems to have been somewhat more peaceful. In 1565, he married Piera de Salvadore Parigi, a servant who had nursed him when he was sick, and in the care of his children, as earlier of his sister and nieces, he showed more tenderness than might have been expected from a man of his boisterous nature. He died at Florence, May 13th, 1571, and was buried in the church of the Annunziata in that city. End of Introduction Chapters 1 through 6 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Eddington Simons. Chapters 1 to 6. 1. All men of whatsoever quality they be, who have done anything of excellence, or which may properly resemble excellence, ought, if they are persons of truth and honesty, to describe their life with their own hand. But they ought not to attempt so fine an enterprise till they have passed the age of forty. This duty occurs to my own mind, now that I am travelling beyond the term of fifty-eight years, and am in Florence, the city of my birth. Many untoward things can I remember, such as happen to all who live upon our earth, and from those adversities I am now more free than at any previous period of my career. Nay, it seems to me that I enjoy greater content of soul and health of body than ever I did in bygone years. I can also bring to mind some pleasant goods and some inestimable evils, which, when I turn my thoughts backward, strike terror in me, and astonishment that I should have reached this age of fifty-eight, wherein, thanks be to God, I am still travelling prosperously forward. 2. It is true that men who have laboured with some show of excellence have already given knowledge of themselves to the world, and this alone ought to suffice them. I mean the fact that they have proved their manhood and achieved renown. Yet one must needs live like others, and so in a work like this there will always be found occasion for natural bragging, which is of diverse kinds, and the first is that a man should let others know he draws his lineage from persons of worse and most ancient origin. I am called Benvenuto Cellini, son of Maestro Giovanni, son of Andrea, son of Cristofano Cellini. My mother was Madonna Elisabetta daughter to Stefano Granacci, both parents citizens of Florence. It is found written in chronicles made by our ancestors of Florence, men of old time and of credibility, even as Giovanni Villani writes, that the city of Florence was evidently built in imitation of the fair city of Rome, and certain remnants of the Colosseum and the baths can yet be traced. These things are near Santa Croce, the capital was where is now the old market. The rotonda is entire, which was made for the temple of Mars, and is now dedicated to our St. John. That thus as was, can very well be seen, and cannot be denied. But the said buildings are much smaller than those of Rome. He who caused them to be built, they say, was Julius Caesar, in concert with some noble Romans, who, when Fiesole had been stormed and taken, raised a city in this place, and each of them took in hand 
to erect one of these notable edifices. Julius Caesar had among his captains a man of highest rank and valor, who was called Fiorini of Celino, which is a village about two miles distant from Montefiascone. Now this Fiorino took up his quarters under the hill of Fiesole, on the ground where Florence now stands, in order to be near the river Arno, and for the convenience of the troops. All those soldiers and others who had to do with the said captain used then to say, Let us go to Fiorence, as well because the said captain was called Fiorino, as also because the place he had chosen for his quarters was by nature very rich in flowers. Upon the foundation of the city, therefore, since this name struck Julius Caesar as being fair and apt, and given by circumstance, and seeing furthermore that flowers themselves bring good augury, he appointed the name of Florence for the town. He wished besides to pay his valiant captain this compliment, and he loved him all the more for having drawn him from a very humble place and for the reason that so excellent a man was a creature of his own. The names that learned inventors and investigators of such etymologies adduce, as that Florence is flowing at the Arno, cannot hold, seeing that Rome is flowing at the Tiber, Ferrara is flowing at the Po, Lyons is flowing at the Saone, Paris is flowing at the Seine, and yet the names of all these towns are different, and have come to them by other ways. Thus then we find, and thus we believe, that we are descendant from a man of worth. Furthermore, we find that there are Cellinis of our stock in Ravenna, that most ancient town of Italy, where too are plenty of gentle folk. In Pisa also there are some, and I have discovered them in many parts of Christendom. And in this state also the breed exists, men devoted to the profession of arms, for not many years ago a young man, called Luca Cellini, a beardless youth, fought with a soldier of experience, and a most valorous man, named Francesco da Vicorati, who had frequently fought before in single combat. This Luca, by his own valor, with sword in hand, overcame and slew him, with such bravery and stoutness, that he moved the folk to wonder, who were expecting quite the contrary issue, so that I glory in tracing my descent from men of valor. As for the trifling honors which I have gained for my house, under the well-known conditions of our present ways of living, and by means of my art, albeit the same are matters of no great moment, I will relate these in their proper time and place, taking much more pride in having been born humble, and having laid some honorable foundation for my family, than if I had been born of great lineage, and had stained or overclouded that by my base qualities. So then I will make a beginning by saying how it pleased God I should be born. Chapter 3 My ancestors dwelt in Wald Ambra, where they owned large estates and lived like little lords in retirement, however, on account of the then contending factions. They were all men devoted to arms and of notable bravery. In that time one of their sons, the younger, who was called Cristofano, roused a great void with certain of their friends and neighbors. Now the heads of the families on both sides took part in it, and the fire kindled seemed to them so threatening that their houses were like to perish utterly. The elders upon this consideration, in concert with my own ancestors, removed Cristofano, and the other youth with whom he quarreled began was also sent away. They sent their young man to Siena, our folks sent Cristofano to Florence, and there they bought for him a little house in Via Chiara, close to the convent of St. Orsola, and they also purchased for him some very good property near the Ponte Arifredi. The said Cristofano took wife in Florence, and had sons and daughters, and when all the daughters had been portioned off, the sons, after their father's death, divided what remained. The house in Via Chiara with some other trifles fell to the share of one of the said sons, who had the name of Andrea. He also took wife, and had four male children. The first was called Girolamo, the second Bartolomeo, the third Giovanni, who was afterwards my father, and the fourth Francesco. This Andrea Cellini 
was very well versed in architecture, and it was then practised, and lived by it as his trade. Giovanni, who was my father, paid more attention to it than any of the other brothers. And since, Vitruvius says, amongst other things, that one who wishes to practise the art well must have something of music and good drawing. Giovanni, when he had mastered drawing, began to turn his mind to music, and together with the theory learned to play most excellent on the viol and the flute, and being a person of studious habits, he left his home but seldom. They had four neighbor, in the same house a man, called Stefano Granacci, who had several daughters, all of them of remarkable beauty. As it pleased God, Giovanni noticed one of these girls, who was named Elisabetta, and she found such favor with him, that he asked her in marriage. The fathers of both of them being well acquainted through their close neighborhood, it was easy to make this match up, and each thought that he had very well arranged his affairs. First of all, the two good old men agreed upon the marriage. Then they began to discuss the dowry, which led to a certain amount of friendly difference. For Andrea said to Stefano, My son Giovanni is the stoutest youth of Florence, and of all Italy to boot, and if I had wanted earlier to have him married, I could have procured one of the largest dowries which folk of our rank get in Florence. Whereupon Stefano answered, You have a thousand reasons on your side, but here am I with five daughters and as many sons, and when my reckoning is made, this is as much as I can possibly afford. Giovanni, who had been listening a while unseen by them, suddenly broke in and said, O oh, my father, I have sought and loved that girl and not their money. Ill luck to those who seek to fill their pockets by the dowry of their wife. As you have boasted that I am a fellow of such parts, do you not think that I shall be able to provide for my wife and satisfy her needs, even if I receive something short of the portion you would like to get? Now I must make you understand that the woman is mine, and you may take the dowry for yourself. At this Andrea Cellini, who was a man of rather awkward temper, grew a trifle angry. But after a few days Giovanni took his wife, and never asked for other portion with her. They enjoyed their youth and wedded love through eighteen years, always greatly desiring to be blessed with children. At the end of this time Giovanni's wife miscarried of two boys through the unskillfulness of the doctors. Later on she was again with child, and gave birth to a girl, whom they called Cosa, after the mother of my father. At the end of two years she was once more with child, and inasmuch as those longings to which pregnant women are subject, and to which they pay much attention, were now exactly the same as those of her former pregnancy, they made their minds up that she would give birth to a female as before, and agreed to call the child Reparata, after the mother of my mother. It happened that she was delivered on a night of all saints, following the feast day, at half-past four precisely, in the year 1500. The midwife, who knew that they were expecting a girl, after she had washed the baby and wrapped it in the fairest white linen, came softly to my father Giovanni and said, I am bringing you a fine present, such as you did not anticipate. My father, who was a true philosopher, was walking up and down, and answered, What God gives me is always dear to me. And when he opened the swaddling clothes, he saw with his own eyes the unexpected male child. Joining together the palms of his old hands, he raised them with his eyes to God, and said, Lord, I thank thee with my whole heart. This gift is very dear to me. Let him be welcome. All the persons who were there asked him joyfully what name the child should bear. Giovanni would make no other answer then, let him be welcome, benvenuto. And so they resolved, and this name was given me at holy baptism, and by it I still am living with the grace of God. Chapter 4 Andrea Cellini was yet alive, when I was about three years old, and he had passed his hundreds. One day they had been altering a certain conduit pertaining to a cistern, and there issued from it a great scorpion, and perceived by them, 
which crept down from the cistern to the ground and slank away beneath the bench i saw it and ran up to it and laid my hands upon it it was so big that when i had it in my little hands it put out its tail on one side and on the other thrust forth both its mouths they relate that i ran in high joy to my grandfather crying out look grandpapa at my pretty little crab when he recognized that the creature was a scorpion he was on the point of falling dead for the great fear he had an anxiety about me he coaxed and entreated me to give it him but the more he begged the tighter i clasped it crying and saying i would not give it to any one my father who was also in the house ran up when he heard my screams and in his stupefaction could not think how to prevent the venomous animal from killing me just then his eyes chanced to fall upon a pair of scissors and so while soothing and caressing me he cut its tail and mouth off afterwards when the great peril had been thus averted he took the occurrence for a good augury when i was about five years old my father happened to be in a basement chamber of our house where they had been washing and where a good fire of oak logs was still burning he had a vial in his hand and was playing and singing alone beside the fire the weather was very cold happening to look into the fire he spied in the middle of those most burning flames a little creature like a lizard which was sporting in the core of the intensest coals becoming instantly aware of what the thing was he had my sister and me called and pointing it out to us children gave me a great box on the ears which caused me to howl and weep with all my might then he pacified me good-humouredly and spoke as follows my dear little boy i am not striking you for any wrong that you have done but only to make you remember that that lizard which you see in the fire is a salamander a creature which has never been seen before by any one of whom we have credible information so saying he kissed me and gave me some pieces of money chapter five my father began teaching me to play upon the flute and sing by note by notwithstanding i was of that tender age when little children are wont to take pastime in whistles and such toys i had an inexpressible dislike for it and played and sang only to obey him my father in those times fashioned wonderful organs with pipes of wood spinets the fairest and most excellent which then could be seen vials and lutes and harps of the most beautiful and perfect construction he was an engineer and had marvellous skill in making instruments for lowering bridges and for working mills and other machines of that sort in ivory he was the first who wrought really well but after he had fallen in love with the woman who was destined to become my mother perhaps what brought them together was that little flute to which indeed he paid more attention than was proper he was entreated by the fifers of the seigneury to play in their company accordingly he did so for some time to amuse himself until by constant importunity they induced him to become a member of their band lorenzo de medici and pietro his son who had a great liking for him perceived later on that he was devoting himself wholly to the five and was neglecting his fine engineering talent and his beautiful art so they had him removed from that post my father took this very ill and it seemed to him that they had done him a great despite yet he immediately resumed his art and fashioned a mirror about a cubit in diameter out of bone and ivory with figures and foliage of great finish and grand design the mirror was in the form of a wheel in the middle was the looking-glass around it were seven circular pieces on which were the seven virtues carved and joined of ivory and black bone the whole mirror together with the virtues was placed in equilibrium so that when the wheel turned all the virtues moved and they had weights at their feet to keep them upright possessing some acquaintance with the latin tongue he put a legend in latin round his this looking-glass to this effect with her so ever the wheel of fortune turns virtue stands firm upon her feet rota sum semper quoque verto stat virtus a little while after this 
he obtained his place again among the fifers. Although some of these things happened before I was born, my familiarity with them has moved me to set them down here. In those days the musicians of the seigneury were all of them members of the most honorable trades, and some of them belonged to the greater guilds of silk and wool, and that was the reason why my father did not disdain to follow this profession, and his chief desire with regard to me was always that I should become a great performer on the flute. I, for my part, felt never more discontented than when he chose to talk to me about this scheme, and to tell me that, if I liked, he discerned in me such aptitudes that I might become the best man in the world. CHAPTER Six, As I have said, my father was a devoted servant and attached friend of the house of Medici, and when Piero was banished, he entrusted him with many affairs of the greatest possible importance. Afterwards, when the magnificent Piero Soderini was elected, and my father continued in his office of musician, Soderini, perceiving his wonderful talent, began to employ him in many matters of great importance as an engineer. So long as Soderini remained in Florence, he showed the utmost good will to my father, and in those days, I being still of tender age, my father had me carried, and made me perform upon the flute. I used to play treble in concert with the musicians of the palace before the seigneury, following my notes, and the beadle used to carry me upon his shoulders. The gonfalonier, that is, Sondarini, whom I have already mentioned, took much pleasure in making me chatter, and gave me comfits, and was wont to say to my father, Maestro Giovanni, besides music, teach the boy those other arts which do you so much honor. To which my father answered, I do not wish him to practice any art but playing and composing, for in this profession I hope to make him the greatest man of the world, if God prolongs his life. To these words one of the old conciliars make answer, Ah, Maestro Giovanni, do what the gonfalonier tells you, for why should he never become anything more than a good musician? Thus some time passed, until the Medici returned. When they arrived, the cardinal, who afterwards became Pope Leo, received my father very kindly. During their exile, the scutcheons which were on the palace of the Medici had had their balls erased, and the great red cross painted over them, which was the bearing of the commune. Accordingly, as soon as they returned, the red cross was scratched out, and on the scutcheon the red balls and the golden field were painted in again, and finished with great beauty. My father, who possessed a simple vein of poetry, instilled in him by nature, together with a certain touch of prophecy, which was doubtless a divine gift in him, wrote these four verses under the said arms of the Medici, when they were uncovered to the view. These arms, which have so long from sight been led, Beneath the holy cross, that symbol meek, Now lift their glorious clad face, and seek, With Peter's sacred cloak to be arrayed. This epigram was read by all Florence. A few days afterwards Pope Julius II died. The Cardinal de' Medici went to Rome, And was elected Pope against the expectation of everybody. He reigned as Leo X, that generous and great soul. My father sent him his four prophetic verses. The Pope sent to tell him to come to Rome, for this would be to his advantage. But he had no will to go, and so, in lieu of reward, his place in the palace was taken from him by Jacopo Salviati, upon that man's election as Gonfalonier. This was the reason why I commenced Goldsmith, after which I spent part of my time in learning that art, and part in playing much against my will. End of chapters 1 through 6 Chapters 7 through 11 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Eddington Simons. 
Chapter Seven through Eleven. Chapter Seven. When my father spoke to me in the way I have above described, I entreated him to let me draw a certain fixed number of hours in the day. All the rest of my time I would give to music, only with the view of satisfying his desire. Upon this he said to me, "So then you take no pleasure in playing?" To which I answered, "No." because that art seemed too base in comparison with what I had in my own mind. My good father, driven to despair by this fixed idea of mine, placed me in the workshop of Cavalier Bandinello's father, who was called Michel Angnolo, a goldsmith from Pinci di Monte, and a master excellent in that craft. He had no distinction of birth whatever, but was the son of a charcoal seller. This is no blame to Bandinello, who was founded the owner of the family, if only he had done so honestly. However that may be, I have no cause now to talk about him. After I had stayed there some days, my father took me away from Michel Agnolo, finding himself unable to live without having me always under his eyes. Accordingly, much to my discontent, I remained at music till I reached the age of fifteen. If I were to describe all the wonderful things that happened to me up to that time, and all the great dangers to my own life which I ran, I should astound my readers. But in order to avoid prolixity, and having very much to relate, I will omit these incidents. When I reached the age of fifteen, I put myself, against my father's will, to the goldsmith's trade with a man called Antonio, son of Sandro, known commonly as Marcone, the goldsmith. He was a most excellent craftsman, and a very good fellow to boot, high-spirited and frank in all his ways. My father would not let him give me wages, like the other apprentices, for having taken up the study of this art to please myself, he wished me to indulge my whim for drawing to the full. I did so willingly enough, and that honest master of mine took marvellous delight in my performances. He had an only son, a bastard, to whom he often gave his orders, in order to spare me. My liking for the art was so great, or, I may truly say, my natural bias, both one and the other, that in a few months I caught up the good, nay, the best young craftsman in our business, and began to reap the fruits of my labors. I did not, however, neglect to gratify my good father from time to time by playing on the flute or cornet. Each time he heard me, I used to make his tears fall accompanied with deep draw sighs of satisfaction. My filial piety often made me give him that contentment, and induced me to pretend that I enjoyed the music too. CHAPTER Eight. At that time I had a brother, younger by two years, a youth of extreme boldness and fierce temper. He afterwards became one of the great soldiers in the school of that marvellous general, Giovannino de' Medici, father of Duke Cosimo. The boy was about fourteen, and I two years older. One Sunday evening, just before nightfall, he happened to find himself between the gate San Gallo and the Porta Apinti. In this quarter he came to duel with a young fellow of twenty or thereabouts. They both had swords, and my brother dealt so valiantly that, after having badly wounded him, he was upon the point of following up his advantage. There was a great crowd of people present, among whom were many of the adversaries' kinsfolk. Seeing that the thing was going ill for their own man, they put hand to their slings, a stone from one of which hit my poor brother in the head. He fell to the ground at once in a dead faint. It so chanced that I had been upon the spot alone, and without arms, and I had done my best to get my brother out of the fray, by calling to him, Make off, you have done enough. Meanwhile, as luck would have it, he fell, as I have said, half dead to earth. I ran up at once, seized his sword, and stood in front of him, bearing the brunt of several rapiers and a shower of stones. I never left his side until some brave soldiers came from the gate San Gallo and rescued me from the ranging crowd. They marveled much, the while, to find such valor in a young a boy. Then I carried my brother home for dead and it was only with great difficulty that he came to himself again. When he was cured, the eight, who had already condemned out adversaries, 
and banished them for a term of years, sent us also into exile for six months, at the distance of ten miles from Florence. I said to my brother, Come along with me, and so we took leave of our poor father, and instead of giving us money, for he had none, he bestowed on us his blessing. I went to Siena, wishing to look up a certain worthy man, called Maestro Francesco Castoro. On another occasion, when I had run away from my father, I went to this good man, and stayed some time with him, working at the goldsmith's trade, until my father sent for me back. Francesco, when I reached him, recognized me at once, and gave me work to do. While thus occupied, he placed a house at my disposal for the whole time of my sojourn in Siena. Into this I moved, together with my brother, and applied myself to labor for the space of several months. My brother had acquired the rudiments of Latin, but was still so young that he could not yet relish the taste of virtuous employment, but passed his time with dissipation. CHAPTER Nine. The Cardinal de' Medici, who afterwards became Pope Clement VII, had us recalled to Florence at the entreaty of my father. A certain pupil of my father's, moved by his own bad nature, suggested to the Cardinal that he ought to send me to Bologna, in order to learn to play well from a great master there. The name of this master was Antonio, and he was in truth a worthy man in the musician's art. The cardinal said to my father, then, if he sent me there, he would give me letters of recommendation and support. My father, dying with joy at such an opportunity, sent me off, and I, being eager to see the world, went with good grace. When I reached Bologna, I put myself under a certain maestro Ercola del Pifero, and began to earn something by my trade. In the meantime, I used to go every day to take my music lesson and in a few weeks made considerable progress in that accursed art. However, I made still greater in my trade of goldsmith, for the cardinal having given me no assistance, I went to live with a Bolognese illuminator who was called Scipione Cavaletti. His house was in the street of Our Lady del Baracan. And while there I devoted myself to drawing and working for one Graziadio, a Jew, with whom I earned considerably. At the end of six months I returned to Florence, for that fellow Pierino, who had been my father's pupil, was greatly mortified by my return. To please my father I went to his house and played the cornet and the flute with one of his brothers, who was named Girolamo, several years younger than the said Piero, a very worthy young man, and quite the contrary of his brother. On one of those days my father came to Piero's house to hear us play, and in ecstasy at my performance exclaimed, I shall yet make you a marvellous musician against the will of all, or any one who may desire to prevent me. To this Piero answered and spoke the truth. Your Benvenuto will get much more honour and profit if he devotes himself to the goldsmith's trade than to this piping. These words made my father angry, seeing that I too had the same opinion as Piero that he flew into a rage and cried out at him. Well did I know that it was you, you who put obstacles in the way of my cherished wish. You are the man who had me ousted from my place at the palace, paying me back with that black ingratitude, which is the usual recompense of great benefits. I got you promoted, and you have got me care sheared. I taught you to play with all the little art you have, and you are preventing my son from obeying me. But bear in mind these words of prophecy, not years or months, I say, but only a few weeks will pass before this dirty ingratitude of yours shall plunge you into ruin. To these words answered Pierino, and said, Maestro Giovanni, the majority of men, when they grow old, go mad at the same time, and this had happened to you. I am not astonished at it, because most liberally have you squandered all your property, without reflecting that your children had need of it. I mind to do just the opposite, and to leave my children so much, that she shall be able to succor yours. To this my father answered, No bad tree ever bore good fruit, quite the contrary, and I tell you further that you are bad, and that your children will be mad and paupers, 
and will cringe for alms to my virtues and wealthy sons. Thereupon we left the house, muttering words of anger on both sides. I had taken my father's part, and when we stepped into the street together, I told him I was quite ready to take vengeance for the insults heaped on him by that scoundrel, provided he permit me to give myself up to the art of design. He answered, My dear son, I too in my time was a good draughtsman, but for recreation, after such stupendous labors, and for the love of me, who am your father, who begot you and brought you up, and implanted so many honorable talents in you, for the sake of recreation, I say, will not you promise sometimes to take in hand your flute, and that seductive cornet, and to play upon them to your heart's content, inviting the delight of music? I promised I would do so, and very willingly for his love's sake. Then my good father said, that such excellent parts I possessed would be the greatest vengeance I could take for the insults of his enemies. Not a whole month had been completed after this scene, before the man Pierino happened to be building a vault in a house of his, which he had in the Via dello Studio, and being one day in a ground floor, room above the vault which he was making, together with much company around him, he fell to talking about his old master, my father, while repeating the words which he had said to him concerning his ruin, no sooner had they escaped his lips than the floor where he was standing, either because the vault had been badly built, or rather through the sheer mightiness of God, who does not always pay on Saturday, suddenly gave way. Some of the stones and bricks of the vault, which fell with him, broke both his legs. The friends who were with him, remaining on the border of the broken vault, took no harm, but were astounded and full of wonder, especially because of the prophecy which he had just contemptuously repeated to them. When my father heard of this, he took his sword and went to see the man. There, in the presence of his father, who was called Nicolaio de Volterra, a trumpeter of the seigneury, he said, O Piero, my dear pupil, I am sorely grieved at your mischance, but if you remember, it was only a short time ago that I warned you of it and as much as I then said will come to happen between your children and mine. Shortly afterwards the ungrateful Piero died of that illness. He loved a wife of bad character and one son, who after the lapse of some years came to me to beg for alms in Rome. I gave him something, as well because it is my nature to be charitable, as also because I recalled with tears the happy state which Pierino held when my father spake those words of prophecy, namely, that Pierino's children would live to crave succor from his own virtuous sons. Of this, perhaps, enough is now said, but let none ever laugh at the prognostications of any worthy man whom he has wrongfully insulted, because it is not he who speaks, nay, but the very voice of God through him. CHAPTER Ten. All this while I worked as a goldsmith, and was able to assist my good father. His other son, my brother Cecino, had, as I said before, been instructed in the rudiments of Latin letters. It was our father's wish to make me, the elder, a great musician and composer, and him, the younger, a great and learned jurist. He would not, however, put force upon the inclinations of our nature which directed me to the arts of design, and my brother, who had a fine and graceful person, to the profession of arms. Cecino, being still quite a lad, was returning from his first lesson in the school of the stupendous Giovannino de' Medici. On the day when he reached home, I happened to be absent, and he, being in want of proper clothes, thought out our sisters, who, unknown to my father, gave him a cloak and doubled of mine, both new and of good quality. I ought to say that, beside the aid I gave my father and my excellent and honest sisters, I had bought those handsome clothes out of my own savings. When I found I had been cheated and my clothes taken from me, and my brother for whom I should have recovered them was gone, I asked my father why he suffered so great a wrong to be done me, seeing that I was always ready to assist him. He replied that I was his good son, but that the other, whom he sought to have lost, 
had been found again. Also that it was a duty, nay, a precept from God himself, that he who has should give to him who has not, and that for his sake I ought to bear this injustice, for God would increase me in all good things. I, like a youth without experience, retorted on my poor afflicted parent, and taking the miserable remnants of my clothes and money, went toward a gate of the city. As I did not know which gate would start me on the road to Rome, I arrived at Lucca, and from Lucca reached Pisa. When I came to Pisa, I was about sixteen years of age at the time. I stopped near the middle bridge, by what is called the fish-stone, at the shop of a goldsmith, and began attentively to watch what the master was about. He asked me who I was, and what was my profession. I told him that I worked a little in the same trade as his own. This worthy man bade me come into his shop, and at once gave me work to do, and spoke as follows. Your good appearance makes me believe you are a decent, honest youth. Then he told me out gold, silver, and gems, and when the first day's work was finished, he took me in the evening to his house, where he dwelt respectably with his handsome wife and children. Thinking of the grief which my good father might be feeling for me, I wrote him that I was sojourning with a very excellent and honest man, called Maestro Oliveria della Chiostra, and was working with him at many good things of beauty and importance. I bade him be of good cheer, for that I was bent on learning, and hoped by my acquirements to bring him back both profit and honor before long. My good father answered the letter at once, in words like these. My son, the love I bear you is so great, that if it were not for the honor of our family, which above all things I regard, I should immediately have set off for you. For indeed it seems like being without the light of my eyes when I do not see you daily, as I used to do. I will make it my business to complete the training of my household, up to virtuous honesty, do you make it yours to acquire excellence in your art, and I only wish you to remember these four simple words, obey them, and never let them escape your memory. In whatever house you be, steal not and live honestly. Chapter 11 This letter fell into the hands of my master Olivieri, and he read it unknown to me. Afterwards he avowed that he had read it, and added, so then, my Benvenuto, your good looks did not deceive me, as a letter from your father, which has come into my hands, gives me assurance, which proves him to be a man of notable honesty and worth. Consider yourself, then, to be at home here, and as though in your own father's house. While I stayed at Pisa, I went to see the Campo Santo, and there I found many beautiful fragments of antiquity, that is to say, marble, sarcophagi, in other parts of Pisa also I saw many antique objects, which I diligently studied, whenever I had days or hours free from the labor of the workshop. My master, who took pleasure in coming to visit me in the little room which he had allotted me, observing that I spent all my time in studious occupations, began to love me like a father. I made great progress in the one year that I stayed there, and completed several fine and valuable things, in gold and silver, which inspired me with a resolute ambition to advance in my art. My father, in the meanwhile, kept writing piteous entreaties that I should return to him, and in every letter bade me not to lose the music he had taught me with such trouble. On this I suddenly gave up all wish to go back to him. So much did I hate that accursed music, and I felt as though so of a truth I were in paradise, the whole year I stayed at Pisa, where I never played the flute. At the end of the year my master Olivieri had occasion to go to Florence, in order to sell certain gold and silver sweepings which he had, and inasmuch as the bad air of Pisa had given me a touch of fever, I went with the fever hanging still about me, in my master's company, back to Florence. There my father received him most affectionately, and lovingly prayed him, unknown by me, not to insist on taking me again to Pisa. I was ill about two months, during which time my father had me most kindly treated and cured, always repeating 
that it seemed to him a thousand years till I got well again, in order that he might hear me play a little. But when he talked to me of music, with his fingers on my pulse, seeing he had some acquaintance with medicine and Latin learning, he felt it change so much if he approached that topic, that he was often dismayed and left my side in tears. When I perceived how greatly he was disappointed, I bade one of my sisters bring me a flute, for though the fever never left me, that instrument is so easy that it did not hurt me to play upon it, and I used it with such dexterity of hand and tongue that my father coming suddenly upon me blessed me a thousand times, exclaiming that while I was away from him I had made great progress, as he thought, and he begged me to go forwards and not to sacrifice so fine an accomplishment. End of chapters 7 through 11「Chapters 12 through 17 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Eddington Simons. Chapters 12 through 17. Chapter 12. When I had recovered my health, I returned to my old friend Marcone, the worthy goldsmith, who put me in the way of earning money, with which I helped my father and our household. About that time there came to Florence a sculptor named Piero Torrigiani. He arrived from England, where he had resided many years, and being intimate with my master, he daily visited his house. And when he saw my drawings and the things which I was making, he said, I have come to Florence to enlist as many young men as I can, for I have undertaken to execute a great work of my king, and want some of my own Florentines to help me. Now your method of working and your designs are worthy, rather of a sculptor than a goldsmith, and since I have to turn out a great piece of bronze, I will at the same time turn you into a rich and able artist." This man had a splendid person and a most arrogant spirit, with the air of a great soldier more than a sculptor, especially in regard to his vehement gestures and his resonant voice, together with the habit he had of knitting his brows, enough to frighten any man of courage. He kept talking every day about his gallant feats among those beasts of Englishmen. In course of conversation he happened to mention Michel Angolo Buonarroti, led thereto by a drawing I had made from a cartoon of that divinest painter. This cartoon was the first masterpiece which Michel Agnolo exhibited, in proof of his stupendous talents. He produced it in a competition with another painter, Leonardo da Vinci, who also made a cartoon, and both were intended for the council hall in the palace of the Signory. They represented the taking of Pisa by the Florentines, and our admirable Leonardo had chosen to depict a battle of horses, with the capture of some standards, in as divine a style as could possibly be imagined. Michel Agnolo, in his cartoon, portrayed a number of foot soldiers, who, the season being summer, had gone to bathe in Arno. He drew them at the very moment the alarm is sounded, and the men all naked run to arms, so splendid in their action that nothing survives of ancient or of modern art which touches the same lofty point of excellence. And as I have already said, the design of the great Leonardo was itself most admirably beautiful. These two curtains stood, one in the palace of the Medici, the other in the hall of the Pope. So long as they remained intact, they were the school of the world. Though the divine Michel Agnolo, in later life, finished the great chapel of Pope Julius, he never rose halfway to the same pitch of power. His genius never afterwards attained to the force of those first studies. Chapter 13 Now let us return to Piero Torrigiani, who with my drawing in his hand spoke as follows. This Bonarotti and I used, when we were boys, to go into the church of the Carmine, 
to learn drawing from the chapel of Masaccio. It was Bonarotti's habit to banter all who were drawing there, and one day, among others, when he was annoying me, I got more angry than usual, and clenching my fist, gave him such a blow on the nose that I felt bone and cartilage go down like biscuit beneath my knuckles, and this mark of mine he will carry with him to the grave. These words begat in me such hatred of the man, since I was always gazing at the masterpieces of the divine Michel Agnolo, that although I felt a wish to go with him to England, I now could never bear the sight of him. All the while I was at Florence, I studied the noble manner of Michel Agnolo, and from this I have never deviated. About that time I contracted a close and familiar friendship with an amiable lad of my own age, who was also in the goldsmith's trade. He was called Francesco, son of Filippo, and grandson of Fra Lippo Lippi, that most excellent painter. Through intercourse together such love grew between us that day or night we never stayed apart. The house where he lived was still full of the fine studies which his father had made, bound up in several books of drawings by his hand, and taken from the best antiquities of Rome. The sight of these things filled me with passionate enthusiasm, and for two years or thereabouts we lived in intimacy. At that time I fashioned a silver bass relief of the size of a little child's hand. It was intended for the clasp to a man's belt, for they were then worn as large as that. I carved on it a knot of leaves in the antique style, with figures of children and other masks of great beauty. This piece I made in the workshop of one Francesco Salimbene, and on its being exhibited to the trade, the goldsmiths praised me as the best young craftsman of their art. There was one Giovan Battista, surnamed Il Tasso, a woodcarver, precisely of my own age, who one day said to me that if I was willing to go to Rome, he should be glad to join me. Now we had this conversation together immediately after dinner, and I being angry with my father, for the same old reason of the music, said to Tasso, You are a fellow of words, not deeds. He answered, I too have come to anger with my mother and if I had cash enough to take me to Rome, I would not turn back to lock the door of that wretched little workshop I call mine. To these words I replied, that if that was all that kept him in Florence, I had money enough in my pockets to bring us both to Rome. Talking thus and walking onwards, we found ourselves at the gate San Piero Gattolini, without noticing that we had got there. Whereupon I said, Friend Tasso, this is God's doing, that we have reached this gate, without either you or me noticing that we were there. And now that I am here, it seems to me that I have finished half the journey. And so, being of one accord, we pursued our way together, saying, Oh, what will our old folks say this evening? We then made an agreement not to think more about them till we reached Rome. So we tied our aprons behind our backs, and trudged almost in silence to Siena. When we arrived at Siena, Tasso said, for he had hurt his feet, that he would not go farther, and asked me to lend him money to get back. I made answer, I should not have enough left to go forward. You ought indeed to have thought of this on leaving Florence. And if it is because of your feet that you shirk the journey, we will find a return horse for Rome, which will deprive you of the excuse. Accordingly, I hired a horse, and seeing that he did not answer, I took my way towards the gate of Rome. When he knew that I was firmly resolved to go, muttering between his teeth, and limping as well as he could, he came on behind me very slowly and at a great distance. On reaching the gate, I felt pity for my comrade, and waited for him and took him on the crupper, saying, What would our friends speak of us to-morrow, if, having left for Rome, we had not luck to get beyond Siena? Then the good Tasso said, I spoke the truth, and as he was a pleasant fellow, he began to laugh and sing, and in this way, always singing and laughing, we travelled the whole way to Rome. I had just nineteen years then, and so had the century. When we reached Rome, I put myself under a master, 
who was known as Il Firenzuola. His name was Giovanni, and he came from Firenzuola in Lombardy, a most able craftsman in large vases and big plate of that kind. I showed him part of the model for the clasp, which I had made in Florence at Salimbenes. It pleased him exceedingly. And turning to one of his journeymen, a Florentine called Gianotto Gianotti, who had been several years with him, he spoke as follows. This fellow is one of the Florentines, who know something, and you are one of those who know nothing. Then I recognized the man, and turned to speak with him, for before he went to Rome we often went to draw together, and had been very intimate comrades. He was so put out by the words his master flung at him, that he said he did not recognize me, or know who I was, whereupon I got angry and cried out, O oh, Gianotto, you who were once my friend, for have we not been together in such and such places, and drawn and ate and drunk? and slept in company at your house in the country. I don't want you to bear witness on my behalf to this worthy man, your master, because I hope my hands are such that without aid from you they will declare what sort of a fellow I am. Chapter 14 When I had thus spoken, Firenzola, who was a man of hot spirit and brave, turned to Giannotto and said to him, you vile rascal, aren't you ashamed to treat a man who has been so intimate a comrade with you in this way? And with the same movement of quick feeling, he faced round and said to me, Welcome to my workshop, and do as you have promised, let your hands declare what man you are. He gave me a very fine piece of silver plate to work on for a cardinal. It was a little oblong box copied from the porphyry sarcophagus before the door of the rotonda. Beside what I copied, I enriched it with so many elegant masks of my invention, that my master went about showing it through the art, and boasting that so good a piece of work had been turned out from his shop. It was about half a cubit in size, and was so constructed as to serve for a salt cellar at table. This was the first earning that I touched at Rome and part of it I sent to assist my good father. The rest I kept for my own use, living upon it while I went about studying the antiquities of Rome, until my money failed and I had to return to the shop for work. But Tista del Tasso, my comrade, did not stay long in Rome, but went back to Florence. After undertaking some new commissions, I took it into my head, as soon as I had finished them, to change my master, I had indeed been worried into doing so by a certain Milanese, called Pagolo Arsago. My first master, Firenzuola, had a great quarrel about this with Arsago, and abused him in my presence, whereupon I took up speech in defense of my new master. I said that I was born free, and free I meant to live, and that there was no reason to complain of him, far less of me since some few crowns of wages were still due to me, also that I chose to go, like a free journeyman, where it pleased me, knowing I did wrong to no man. My new master then put in with his excuses, saying that he had not asked me to come, and that I should gratify him by returning with Firenzola. To this I replied that I was not aware of wronging the latter in any way, and as I had completed his commissions, I choose to be my own master, and not the man of others, and that he who wanted me must beg me of myself. Firenzola cried, I don't intend to beg you of yourself. I have done with you. Don't show yourself again upon my premises. I reminded him of the money he owed me. He laughed me in the face, on which I said that if I knew how to use my tools in handicraft, as well as he had seen, I could be quite as clever with my sword, in claiming the just payment of my labor. While we were exchanging these words, an old man happened to come up, called Maestro Antonio of San Marino. He was the chief among the Roman goldsmiths, and had been Firenzola's master. Hearing what I had to say, which I took good care that he should understand, he immediately espoused my cause, and bade Firenzola pay me. The dispute vexed warm, because Firenzola was an admirable swordsman, 
far better than he was a goldsmith. Yet reason made it so hard, and I backed my cause with the same spirit, till I got myself paid. In course of time, Firenze Ola and I became friends, and at his request I stood godfather to one of his children. Chapter 15 I went on working with Pagolo Arsago, and earned a good deal of money, the greater part of which I always sent to my good father. At the end of two years, upon my father's entreaty, I returned to Florence, and put myself once more under Francesco Salimbene, with whom I earned a great deal, and took continual pains to improve in my art. I renewed my intimacy with Francesco di Filippo, and though I was too much given to pleasure, owing to that accursed music, I never neglected to devote some hours of the day or night to study. At that time I fashioned a silver heart ski, Shivakur, as it was then so called. This was a girdle, three inches broad, which used to be made for brides, and was executed in half-relief with some small figures in the round. It was a commission from a man called Raffaello Lapacini. I was very badly paid, but the honor which it brought me was worth far more than the gain I might have justly made by it. Having at this time worked with many different persons in Florence, I had come to know some worthy men among the goldsmiths, as for instance Marcone, my first master, but I also met with others reputed honest, who did all they could to ruin me, and robbed me grossly. When I perceived this, I left their company, and held them for thieves and blackguards. One of the goldsmiths, called Giovan Battista Sogliani, called Giovanni Battista Sogliani, kindly accommodated me with part of his shop, which stood at the side of the new market near the Landi's bank. There I finished several pretty pieces, and made good gains, and was able to give my family much help. This roused the jealousy of the bad men among my former masters, who were called Salvadore and Michele Guasconti. In the guild of the goldsmiths they had three big shops, and drove a thriving trade. On becoming aware of their evil will against me, I complained to certain worthy fellows, and remarked that they ought to have been satisfied with the thievery they practiced on me under the cloak of hypocritical kindness. This coming to their ears, they threatened to make me sorely repent of such words, but I, who knew not what the color of fear was, paid them little or no heed. Chapter 16 It chanced one day that I was leaning against a shop of one of these men, who called out to me, and began partly reproaching, partly bullying. I answered that had they done their duty by me, I should have spoken of them, what one speaks of good and worthy men. But as they had done the contrary, they ought to complain of themselves and not of me. While I was standing there and talking, one of them, named Gerardo Guasconti, their cousin, having perhaps been put up to it by them, lay in wait till a beast of burden went by. It was a load of bricks. When the load reached me, Gijarda pushed it so violently on my body that I was very much hurt. Turning suddenly round and seeing him laughing, I struck him such a blow on the temple that he fell down, stunned like one dead. Then I faced round to his cousins and said, That's the way to treat cowardly thieves of your sort and when they wanted to make a move upon me, trusting to their numbers, I, whose blood was now well up, laid hands to a little knife I had, and cried, If one of you comes out of the shop, let the other run for the confessor, because the doctor will have nothing to do here. These words so frightened them, that not one stirred to help their cousin. As soon as I had gone, the fathers and sons ran to the aid, and declared that I had assaulted them in their shops with sword in hand, a thing which had never yet been seen in Florence. The magistrates had me summoned. I appeared before them, and they began to upbraid and cry out upon me, partly, I think, because they saw me in my cloak, while the others were dressed like citizens in mantle and hood, but also because my adversaries had been to the houses of those magistrates, and had talked with all of them in private while I, inexperienced in such matters, had not spoken to any of them, trusting in the goodness of my cause. 
I said that, having received such outrage and insult from Jehardo, and in my fury having only given him a box on the ear, I did not think I deserved such a vehement reprimand. I had hardly time to finish the word box before Principale de la Stufa, who was one of the eight, interrupted me by saying, You gave him a blow and not a box on the ear. The bell was rung and we were all ordered out when Principale spoke thus in my defence to his brother judges. Mark, sirs, the simplicity of this poor young man, who has accused himself of him giving a box on the ear, under the impression that this is of less importance than a blow, whereas a box on the ear in the new market carries a fine of twenty-five crowns, while a blow costs little or nothing. He is a young man of admirable talents, and supports his poor family by his labor and great abundance. I would to God that our city had plenty of this sort, instead of the present dearth of them. CHAPTER Seventeen. Among the magistrates were some radical fellows, with turned-up hoods, who had been influenced by the entreaties and the calumnies of my opponents, because they all belonged to the party of Fra Girolamo. And these men would have had me sent to prison and punished without too close a reckoning. But the good Principale put a stop to that. So they sentenced me to pay four measures of flour, which were to be given as alms to the nunnery of the murate. I was called in again, and he ordered me not to speak a word under pain of their displeasure, and to perform the sentence they had passed. Then, after giving me another sharp rebuke, they sent us to the counsellor, I muttering all the while, it was a slap and not a blow, with which we left the eight, bursting with laughter. The counsellor bound us over upon bail on both sides, but only I was punished by having to pay the four measures of meal albeit just then I felt as though I had been massacred. I sent for one of my cousins, called Maestro Annibale, the surgeon, father of Messer Librodoro Librodori, desiring that he should go bail for me. He refused to come, which made me so angry, that fuming with fury and swelling like an asp, I took a desperate resolve. At this point one may observe how the stars do not so much sway as force our conduct. When I reflected on the great obligations which this Annibale owed my family, my rage grew to such a pitch that, turning wholly to evil, and being also by nature somewhat choleric, I waited till the magistrates had gone to dinner, and when I was alone, and observed that none of their officers were watching me, in the fire of my anger I left the palace, ran to my shop, seized a dagger, and rushed to the house of my enemies who were at home and shop together. I found them at table, and Gerardo, who had been the cause of the quarrel, flung himself upon me. I stabbed him in the breast, piercing doublet and jerkin through and through to the shirt, without however grazing his flesh, or doing him the least harm in the world. When I felt my hand go in, and heard the closest tear, I thought that I had killed him, and seeing him fall terror-struck to earth, I cried, traitors this day is the day on which i mean to murder you all father mother and sisters thinking the last day had come threw themselves upon their knees screaming out for mercy with all their might but i perceiving that they offered no resistance and that he was stretched for dead upon the ground thought it too base a thing to touch them i ran storming down the staircase and when I reached the street, I found all the rest of the household, more than twelve persons. One of them had seized an iron shovel, another a thick iron pipe, one had an anvil, some of them hammered, and some cudgels. When I got among them, raging like a mad bull, I flung four or five to the earth, and fell down with them myself, continually aiming my dagger, now at one and now at another. Those who remained upright plied both hands with all their force, giving it me with hammers, cudgels, and anvil. But inasmuch as God does sometimes mercifully intervene, he so ordered that neither they nor I did any harm to one another. I only lost my cap, on which my adversary seized, though they had run away from it before, and struck at it with all their weapons. 
Afterwards, they searched among their dead and wounded, and saw that not a single man was injured. End of chapters 12 through 17 Chapters 18 through 22 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 18 through 22. 18. I went off in the direction of Santa Maria Novella, and stumbling up against Friar Alessio Strozzi, whom by the way I did not know, I entreated this good friar for the love of God to save my life, since I had committed a great fault. He told me to have no fear, for had I done every sin in the world, I was yet in perfect safety in his little cell. After about an hour, the eight, in an extraordinary meeting, caused one of the most dreadful bans which ever were heard of to be published against me, announcing heavy penalties against who should harbour me or know where I was, without regard to place or to the quality of my protector. My poor afflicted father went to the eight, threw himself upon his knees, and prayed for mercy for his unfortunate young son. Thereupon one of those radical fellows, shaking the crest of his twisted hood, stood up and addressed my father with these insulting words, Get up from there, and be gone at once, for tomorrow we shall send your son into the country with the lances. My poor father had still the spirit to answer, What God shall have ordained, that will you do and not a jot or tittle more. Whereto the same man replied that for certain God had ordained as he had spoken. My father said, The thought consoles me that you do not know for certain. And quitting their presence, he came to visit me, together with a young man of my own age, called Piero di Giovanni Landi. We loved one another as though we had been brothers. Under his mantle, the lad carried a first-rate sword, and a splendid coat of mail, and when they found me, my brave father told me what had happened, and what the magistrate had said to him. Then he kissed me on the forehead, and both eyes, and gave me his hearty blessing, saying, May the power of goodness of God be your protection. And reaching me the sword and armour, he helped me with his own hands to put them on. Afterwards he added, O oh, my good son, with these arms in thy hand thou shalt either live or die. Pierre Landy, who was present, kept shedding tears, and when he had given me ten golden crowns I bade him remove a few hairs from my chin, which were the first down of my manhood. Frate Alessio disguised me like a friar, and gave me a lay brother to go with me. Quitting the convent, and issuing from the city by the gate of Prato, I went along the walls as far as the Piazza di San Gallo. Then I ascended the slope of Montui, and in one of the first houses there I found a man called Il Grassuccio, own brother to Messer Benedetto da Montevaci. I flung off my monk's clothes and became once more a man. Then we mounted two horses, which were waiting there for us, and went by night to Siena. Grassuccio returned to Florence, sought out my father, and gave him the news of my safe escape. In the excess of his joy it seemed a thousand years to my father till he should meet the member of the eight who had insulted him. And when he came across the man he said, See you, Antonio, that it was God who knew what had to happen to my son, and not yourself? To which the fellow answered, Only let him get another time into our clutches. And my father, I shall spend my time in thanking God that he has rescued him from that fate. 19. At Siena I waited for the mail to Rome, which I afterwards joined, and when we passed the Paglia we met a courier carrying news of the new Pope, Clement the Seventh. Upon my arrival in Rome I went to work in the shop of the master goldsmith Santi. He was dead, but a son of his carried on the business. He did not work himself, 
but entrusted all his commissions to a young man called Lucagnolo from Iesi, a country fellow who while yet a child had come into Santi's service. This man was short, but well proportioned, and was a more skilful craftsman than any one whom I had met with up to that time, remarkable for facility and excellent in design. He executed large plate only, that is to say, vases of the utmost beauty, basons and such pieces. Having put myself to work there, I began to make some cantalabra for the Bishop of Salamanca, a Spaniard. They were richly chaste, so far as that sort of work admits. A pupil of Raffaello da Abino, called Gian Francesco, and commonly known as Il Fattore, was a painter of great ability, and being on terms of friendship with the bishop, he introduced me to his favour, so that I obtained many commissions from their prelate, and earned considerable sums of money. During that time I went to draw, sometimes in Michelagnolo's chapel, and sometimes in the house of Agostino Cicchi of Siena, which contained many incomparable paintings by the hand of that great master, Raffaello. This I did on feast days, because the house was then inhabited by Messer Gismondo, Agostino's brother. They plumed themselves exceedingly when they saw young men of my sort coming to study in their palaces. Gismondo's wife, noticing my frequent presence in that house, she was a lady as courteous as could be, and of surpassing beauty, came up to me one day, looked at my drawings, and asked me if I was a sculptor or a painter, to whom I said I was a goldsmith. She remarked that I drew too well for a goldsmith, and having made one of her waiting-maids bring a lily of the finest diamonds set in gold, she showed it to me, and bade me value it. I valued it at eight hundred crowns. Then she said that I had very nearly hit the mark, and asked me whether I felt capable of setting the stones really well. I said that I should much like to do so, and began before her eyes to make a little sketch for it, working all the better because of the pleasure I took in conversing with so lovely and agreeable a gentlewoman. When the sketch was finished, another Roman lady of great beauty joined us. She had been above, now descending to the ground floor, asked Madonna Pozzia what she was doing there. She answered with a smile, I am amusing myself by watching this worthy young man at his drawing. He is as good as he is handsome. I had by this time acquired a trifle of assurance, mixed, however, with some honest bashfulness. So I blushed, and said, Such as I am, lady, I shall ever be most ready to serve you. The gentlewoman, also slightly blushing, said, You know well that I want you to serve me. And reaching me the lily, told me to take it away and gave me besides twenty golden crowns which she had in her bag, and added, Set me the jewel after the fashion you have sketched, and keep for me the old gold in which it is now set. On this the Roman lady observed, If I were in that young man's body, I should go off without asking leave. Madonna Portia replied that virtues rarely are at home with vices, and that if I did such a thing I should strongly belie my good looks of an honest man. Then turning round, she took the Roman lady's hand, and with a pleasant smile said, Farewell, Benvenuto. I stayed on a short while at the drawing I was making, which was a copy of a Jove by Raffaello. When I had finished it and left the house, I set myself to making a little model of wax, in order to show how the jewel would look when it was completed. This I took to Madonna Pozzia, whom I found with the same Roman lady. Both of them were highly satisfied with my work, and treated me so kindly that, being somewhat emboldened, I promised the jewel should be twice as good as the model. Accordingly, I set hand to it, and in twelve days I finished it in the form of a fleur-de-lis, as I have said above, ornamenting it with little masks, children, and animals, exquisitely enamelled, whereby the diamonds which formed the lily were more than doubled in effect. 20. While I was working at this piece, Lucagnolo, of whose ability I have before spoken, showed considerable discontent, telling me over and over again that I might acquire far more profit and honour by helping him to execute large plate, as I had done at first. I made him answer that, whenever I chose, I should always be capable of working at great silver pieces, but that things like that on which I was now engaged were not commissioned every day, 
and besides their bringing no less honour than large silver plate, there was also more profit to be made by them. He laughed me in the face, and said, Wait and see, Benvenuto, for by the time that you have finished that work of yours, I will make haste to have finished this vase, which I took in hand when you did the jewel, and then experience shall teach you what profit I shall get from my vase, and what you will get from your ornament. I answered that I was very glad indeed to enter into such a competition with so good a craftsman as he was, because the end would show which of us was mistaken. Accordingly, both the one and the other of us, with a scornful smile upon our lips, bent our heads in grim earnest to the work, which both were now desirous of accomplishing, so that after about ten days each had finished his undertaking with great delicacy and artistic skill. Lucagnolo's was a huge silver piece, used at the table of Pope Clement, into which he flung away bits of bone and the rind of diverse fruits while eating, an object of ostentation, rather than necessity. The vase was adorned with two fine handles, together with many masks, both small and great, and masses of lovely foliage, in as exquisite a style of elegance as could be imagined on seeing which I said it was the most beautiful vase that ever I set eyes on. Thinking he had convinced me, Luke Agnello replied, Your work seems to me no less beautiful, but we shall soon perceive the difference between the two. So he took his vase and carried it to the Pope, who was very well pleased with it, and ordered at once that he should be paid at the ordinary rate of such large plate. Meanwhile, I carried mine to Madonna Pozia, who looked at it with astonishment, and told me I had far surpassed my promise. Then she bade me ask for my reward whatever I liked, for it seemed to her my desert was so great that if I craved a castle she could hardly recompense me. But since that was not in her hands to bestow, she added laughing that I must beg what lay within her power. I answered that the greatest reward I could desire for my labour was to have satisfied her ladyship. Then smiling in my turn and bowing to her, I took my leave, saying I wanted no reward but that. She turned to the Roman lady and said, You see that the qualities we discerned in him are accompanied by virtues and not vices. They both expressed their admiration, and then Madonna Pozia continued, Friend Benvenuto, have you never heard it said that when the poor give to the rich, the devil laughs? I replied, Quite true and yet in the midst of all his troubles I should like this time to see him laugh. And as I took my leave, she said that this time she had no will to bestow on him that favour. When I came back to the shop, Lucagnolo had the money for his vase in a paper packet, and on my arrival he cried out, Come and compare the price of your jewel with the price of my plate. I said that he must leave things as they were till the next day, because I hoped that even as my work in its kind was not less excellent than his, so I should be able to show him quite an equal price for it. 21. On the day following, Madonna Pozia sent a major domo of hers to my shop, who called me out and, putting into my hands a paper packet full of money from his lady, told me that she did not choose the devil should have his whole laugh out by which he hinted that the money sent me was not the entire payment merited by my industry, and other messages were added worthy of so courteous a lady. Duke Agnolo, who was burning to compare his packet with mine, burst into the shop, then in the presence of twelve journeymen and some neighbours, eager to behold the result of this competition, he seized his packet, scornfully exclaiming, Ooh, ooh, three or four times, while he poured his money on the counter with a great noise. They were twenty-five crowns in Julio's, and he fancied that mine would be four or five crowns di moneta. I, for my part, stunned and stifled by his cries, and by the looks and smiles of the bystanders, first peeped into my packet, then, after seeing that it contained nothing but gold, I retired to one end of the counter, and, keeping my eyes lowered and making no noise at all, I lifted it with both hands suddenly above my head and emptied it like a mill-hopper. My coin was twice as much as his, which caused the onlookers, who had fixed their eyes on me with some derision, to turn round suddenly to him and say, Luke Agnolo, Benvenuto's pieces, being all of gold and twice as many as yours, make a far finer effect. I thought for certain 
that what with jealousy and what with shame, Lucagnolo would have fallen dead upon the spot, and though he took the third part of my gain, since I was a journeyman, for such is the custom of the trade, two-thirds fall to the workmen and one-third to the masters of the shop. Yet inconsiderate envy had more power in him than avarice. It ought indeed to have worked quite the other way, he being a peasant's son from Yezi. He cursed his art and those who taught it him, vowing that thenceforth he would never work at large plate, but give his whole attention to those brothel gugors, since they were so well paid. Equally enraged on my side, I answered that every bird sank its own note, that he talked after the fashion of the hovels he came from, but that I dared swear that I should succeed with ease in making his lubberly lumber, while he would never be successful in my brothel gugors. Thus I flung off in a passion, telling him that I would soon show him that I spoke truth. The bystanders openly declared against him, holding him for a lout, as indeed he was, and me for a man, as I had proved myself. 22. Next day I went to thank Madonna Pozia, and told her that her ladyship had done the opposite of what she said she would, for that while I wanted to make the devil laugh, she had made him once more deny God. We both laughed pleasantly at this, and she gave me other commissions for fine and substantial work. Meanwhile I contrived, by means of a pupil of Raffaello d'Abino, to get an order from the Bishop of Salamanca for one of those great water vessels called Aquarecia, which are used for ornaments to place on sideboards. He wanted a pair made of equal size, and one of them he entrusted to Luc Agnolo, the other to me. Giovan Francesco, the painter I have mentioned, gave us the design. Accordingly I set hand with marvellous good will to this piece of plate, and was accommodated with a part of his workshop by a Milanese named Maestro Giovan Piero de la Tacca. Having made my preparations, I calculated how much money I should need for certain affairs of my own, and sent all the rest to assist my poor father. It so happened that just when this was being paid to him in Florence, he stumbled upon one of those radicals who were in the eight at the time when I got into that little trouble there. It was the very man who had abused him so rudely, and who swore that I should certainly be sent into the country with the lances. Now this fellow had some sons of very bad morals and repute. Wherefore my father said to him, Misfortunes can happen to anybody, especially to men of choleric humour when they are in the right, even as it happened to my son. But let the rest of his life bear witness how virtuously I have brought him up. Would God, for your well-being, that your sons may act neither worse nor better toward you than mine do to me. God rendered me able to bring them up as I have done, and where my own power could not reach, it was he who rescued them, against your expectation, out of your violent hands. On leaving the man, he wrote me all this story, begging me for God's sake to practice music at times, in order that I might not lose the fine accomplishment which he had taught me with such trouble. The letter so overflowed with expressions of the tenderest fatherly affection, that I was moved to tears of filial piety, resolving, before he died, to gratify him amply with regard to music, Thus God grants us those lawful blessings which we ask in prayer, nothing doubting. End of chapters 18 through 22or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 23 through 26. 23. While I was pushing forward Salamanca's vase, I had only one little boy as help, whom I had taken at the entreaty of friends and half against my own will, to be my workman. He was about fourteen years of age, bore the name of Paulino, and was son to a Roman burgess, who lived upon the income of his property. Paulino was the best-mannered, the most honest, and the most beautiful boy I ever saw in my whole life. His modest ways and actions, together with his superlative beauty, 
and his devotion to myself, bred in me as great an affection for him as a man's breast can hold. This passionate love led me oftentimes to delight the lad with music, for I observed that his marvellous features, which by complexion wore a tone of modest melancholy, brightened up, and when I took my cornet, broke into a smile so lovely and so sweet that I do not marvel at the silly stories which the Greeks have written about the deities of heaven. Indeed, if my boy had lived in those times, he would probably have turned their heads still more. He had a sister, named Faustina, more beautiful, I verily believe, than that Faustina about whom the old books gossip so. Sometimes he took me to their vineyard, and so far as I could judge, it struck me that Paulino's good father would have welcomed me as a son-in-law. This affair led me to play more than I was used to do. It happened at that time that one Gian Giacomo of Cesena, a musician in the Pope's band and a very excellent performer, sent word through Lorenzo, the trumpeter of Luca, who is now in our Duke's service, to inquire whether I was inclined to help them at the Pope's Ferragosto, playing soprano with my cornet in some motets of great beauty selected by them for that occasion. Although I had the greatest desire to finish the vase I had begun, yet, since music has a wondrous charm of its own, and also because I wished to please my old father, I consented to join them. During eight days before the festival, we practised two hours a day together. Then on the 1st of August, we went to the Belvedere, and while Pope Clement was at table, we played those carefully studied motets so well that His Holiness protested he had never heard music more sweetly executed or with better harmony of parts. He sent for Gian Giacomo and asked him where and how he had procured so excellent a cornet for soprano and inquired particularly who I was. Gian Giacomo told him my name in full, whereupon the Pope said, So then, he is the son of Maestro Giovanni. On being assured I was, the Pope expressed his wish to have me in his service with the other bandsmen. Gian Giacomo replied, Most blessed father, I cannot pretend for certain that you will get him, for his profession, to which he devotes himself assiduously, is that of a goldsmith and he works in it miraculously well, and earns by it far more than he could do by playing. To this the Pope added, I am the better inclined to him now that I find him possessor of a talent more than I expected. See that he obtains the same salary as the rest of you, and tell him from me to join my service, and that I will find work enough by the day for him to do in his other trade. Then stretching out his hand, he gave him a hundred golden crowns of the camera in a handkerchief, and said, Divide these so that he may take his share. When Gian Giacomo left the Pope, he came to us, and related in detail all that the Pope had said, and after dividing the money between the eight of us, and giving me my share, he said to me, Now I am going to have you inscribed among our company. I replied, Let the day pass, to-morrow I will give my answer. When I left them, I went meditating whether I ought to accept the invitation, inasmuch as I could not but suffer if I abandoned the noble studies of my art. The following night my father appeared to me in a dream, and begged me with tears of tenderest affection, for God's love and his, to enter upon this engagement. Methought I answered that nothing would induce me to do so. In an instant he assumed so horrible an aspect as to frighten me out of my wits, and cried, If you do not, you will have a father's curse, but if you do, may you be ever blessed by me. When I woke, I ran, for very fright, to have myself inscribed. Then I wrote to my old father, telling him the news, which so affected him with extreme joy, that a sudden fit of illness took him, and well nigh brought him to death's door. In his answer to my letter, he told me that he too had dreamed nearly the same as I had. 24. Knowing now that I had gratified my father's honest wish, I began to think that everything would prosper with me to a glorious and honourable end. Accordingly, I set myself with indefatigable industry to the completion of the vase I had begun for Salamanca. That prelate was a very extraordinary man, extremely rich, but difficult to please. He sent daily to learn what I was doing, and when his messenger did not find me at home, he broke into fury, saying that he would take the work out of my hands and give it to others to finish. 
this came of my slavery to that accursed music. Still I laboured diligently night and day, until, when I had brought my work to a point when it could be exhibited, I submitted it to the inspection of the bishop. This so increased his desire to see it finished that I was sorry I had shown it. At the end of three months I had it ready, with little animals and foliage and masks as beautiful as one could hope to see. No sooner was it done than I sent it by the hand of my workman Paulino to show that able artist Luke Hagnolo, of whom I have spoken above. Paulino, with the grace and beauty which belonged to him, spoke as follows. Messer Luke Hagnolo, Benvenuto bids me say that he has sent to show you his promises and your lumber expecting in return to see from you his gewgaws. This message given, Lucagnolo took up the vase and carefully examined it. Then he said to Paulino, Fair boy, tell your master that he is a great and able artist, and that I beg him to be willing to have me for a friend, and not to engage in aught else. The mission of that virtuous and marvellous lad caused me the greatest joy, and then the vase was carried to Salamanca, who ordered it to be valued. Luke Agnolo took part in the valuation, estimating and praising it far above my own opinion. Salamanca, lifting up the vase, cried like a true Spaniard, I swear by God that I will take as long in paying him as he has lagged in making it. When I heard this, I was exceedingly put out, and fell to cursing all Spain and every one who wished well to it. Amongst other beautiful ornaments, this vase had a handle, made all of one piece, with most delicate mechanism, which, when a spring was touched, stood upright above the mouth of it. While the prelate was one day ostentatiously exhibiting my vase to certain Spanish gentlemen of his suite, it chanced that one of them, upon Monsignor's quitting the room, began roughly to work the handle, and as the gentle spring which moved it could not bear his loutish violence, it broke in his hand. Aware what mischief he had done, he begged the butler who had charge of the bishop's plate to take it to the master who had made it, for him to mend, and promised to pay what price he asked, provided it was set to rights at once. So the vase came once more into my hands, and I promised to put it forthwith in order, which indeed I did. It was brought to me before dinner, and at twenty-two o'clock the man who brought it returned, all in a sweat, for he had run the whole way, Monsignor having again asked for it to show to certain other gentlemen. The butler then, without giving me time to utter a word, cried, Quick, quick, bring the vase! I, who wanted to act at leisure, and not to give up to him, said that I did not mean to be so quick. The serving-man got into such a rage that he made as though he would put one hand to his sword, while with the other he threatened to break the shop open. To this I put a stop at once with my own weapon, using therewith spirited language and saying, I am not going to give it to you. Go and tell Monsignor, your master, that I want the money for my work before I let it leave this shop. When the fellow saw he could not obtain it by swaggering, he fell to praying me, as one prays to the cross, declaring that if I would only give it up, he would take care I should be paid. These words did not make me swerve from my purpose, but I kept on saying the same thing. At last, despairing of success, he swore to come with Spaniards enough to cut me in pieces. Then he took to his heels, while I, who inclined to believe partly in their murderous attack, resolved that I would defend myself with courage. So I got an admirable little gun ready, which I used for shooting game, and muttered to myself, he who robs me of my property and labour may take my life too, and welcome. While I was carrying on this debate in my own mind, a crowd of Spaniards arrived, led by the Major Domo, who with the headstrong rashness of his race bade them go in and take the vase and give me a good beating. Hearing these words, I showed them the muzzle of my gun, and prepared to fire, and cried in a loud voice, Renegade Jews! Traitors! Is it thus that one breaks into houses and shops in our city of Rome? Come as many of you thieves as like, an inch nearer to this wicket, and I'll blow all their brains out with my gun. Then I turned the muzzle toward their major domo, and making as though I would discharge it, called out, And you big thief, who are egging them on, I mean to kill you first. He clapped spurs to the genet he was riding, and took flight headlong. 
the commotion we were making stirred up all the neighbours, who came crowding round together with some Roman gentlemen who chanced to pass, and cried, Do but kill the renegades, and we will stand by you. These words had the effect of frightening the Spaniards in good earnest. They withdrew, and were compelled by the circumstances to relate the whole affair to Monsignor. Being a man of inordinate haughtiness, he rated the members of his household, both because they had engaged in such an act of violence, and also because, having begun, they had not gone through with it. At this juncture, the painter, who had been concerned in the whole matter, came in, and the bishop bade him go and tell me that if I did not bring the vase at once, he would make mincemeat of me, but if I brought it, he would pay its price down. These threats were so far from terrifying me, that I sent him word I was going immediately to lay my case before the Pope. In the meantime, his anger and my fear subsided, whereupon, being guaranteed by some Roman noblemen of high degree that the prelate would not harm me, and having assurance that I should be paid, I armed myself with a large poniard, and my good coat of mail, and betook myself to his palace, where he had drawn up all his household. I entered, and Paulino followed with the silver vase. It was just like passing through the zodiac, neither more nor less, for one of them had the face of the lion, another of the scorpion, a third of the crab. However, we passed onward to the presence of the rascally priest, who spouted out a torrent of such language as only priests and Spaniards have at their command. In return, I never raised my eyes to look at him, nor answered word for word. That seemed to augment the fury of his anger, and causing paper to be put before me, he commanded me to write an acknowledgment to the effect that I had been amply satisfied and paid in full. Then I raised my head, and said I should be very glad to do so when I had received the money. The bishop's rage continued to rise, threats and recriminations were flung about, but at last the money was paid, and I wrote the receipt. Then I departed, glad at heart, and in high spirits. 25. When Pope Clement heard the story, he had seen the vase before, but it was not shown him as my work. He expressed much pleasure and spoke warmly in my praise, publicly saying that he felt very favourably toward me. This caused Monsignor Salamanca to repent that he had hectored over me and in order to make up our quarrel he sent the same painter to inform me that he meant to give me large commissions i replied that i was willing to undertake them but that i should require to be paid in advance this speech too came to pope clement's ears and made him laugh heartily cardinal Gibo was in the presence and the pope narrated to him the whole history of my dispute with the bishop then he turned to one of his people and ordered him to go on supplying me with work for the palace Cardinal Cibo sent for me, and after some time spent in agreeable conversation, gave me the order for a large vase, bigger than Salamanca's. I likewise obtained commissions from Cardinal Conaro, and many others of the Holy College, especially Ridolfi and Salviati. They all kept me well employed, so that I earned plenty of money. Madonna Ponzia now advised me to open a shop on my own. This I did, and I never stopped working for that excellent and gentle lady, who paid me exceedingly well, and by whose means perhaps it was that I came to make a figure in the world. I contracted close friendship with Signor Gabriello Cesarino, at that time Gonfalonier of Rome, and executed many pieces for him. One among the rest is worthy of mention. It was a large golden medal to wear in the hat. I engraved upon it Lida with her swan and being very well pleased with workmanship, he said he should like to have it valued, in order that I might be properly paid. Now, since the medal was executed with consummate skill, the valuers of the trade set a far higher price on it than he had thought of. I therefore kept the medal, and got nothing for my pains. The same sort of adventures happened in this case as in that of Salamanca's vase but I shall pass such matters briefly by, lest they hinder me from telling things of greater importance. 26. Since I am writing my life, I must from time to time diverge from my profession, in order to describe with brevity, if not in detail, some incidents which have no bearing on my career as artist. On the morning of St. John's Day, I happened to be dining with several men of our nation, 
painters, sculptors, goldsmiths, amongst the most notable of whom was Rosso and Gianfrancesco, the pupil of Raffaello. I had invited them without restraint or ceremony to the place of our meeting, and they were all laughing and joking, as is natural when a crowd of men come together to make merry on so great a festival. It chanced that a light-brained, swaggering young fellow passed by. He was a soldier of Rienzo d'Aceri, who, when he heard the noise that we were making, gave vent to a string of appropriate sarcasms upon the folk of Florence. I, who was the host of those great artists and men of worth, taking the insult to myself, slipped out quietly without being observed, and went up to him. I ought to say that he had a punk of his there, and was going on with his stupid ribaldries to amuse her. When I met him, I asked if he was the rash fellow who was speaking evil of the Florentines. He answered at once, I am that man. On this I raised my hand, struck him in the face, and said, And I am this man. Then we each of us drew our swords with spirit. But the fray had hardly begun, when a crowd of persons intervened, who rather took my part than not, hearing and seeing that I was in the right. On the following day, a challenge to fight with him was brought me which I accepted very gladly, saying that I expected to complete this job far quicker than those of the other art I practised. So I went at once to confer with a fine old man called Bevilacqua, who was reputed to have been the first sword of Italy, because he had fought more than twenty serious duels, and had always come off with honour. This excellent man was a great friend of mine. He knew me as an artist, and had also been concerned as intermediary in certain ugly quarrels between me and others. Accordingly, when he had learned my business, he answered with a smile, My Benvenuto, if you had an affair with Mars, I'm sure you would come out with honour, because through all the years that I have known you, I have never seen you wrongfully take up a quarrel. So he consented to be my second, and we repaired with sword in hand to the appointed place, but no blood was shed, for my opponent made the matter up, and I came with much credit out of the affair. I will not add further particulars, for though they would be very interesting in their own way, I wish to keep both space and words for my art, which has been my chief inducement to write as I am doing, and about which I shall have only too much to say. The spirit of honourable rivalry impelled me to attempt some other masterpiece, which should equal, or even surpass, the productions of that able craftsman Lucagnolo, whom I have mentioned. Still I did not on this account neglect my own fine art of jewellery, and so both the one and the other wrought me much profit and more credit, and in both of them I continued to produce things of marked originality. There was at that time in Rome a very able artist of Perugia, named Lauticio, who worked only in one department, where he was sole and unrivalled throughout the world. You must know that at Rome every cardinal has a seal, upon which his title is engraved, and these seals are made just as large as a child's hand of about twelve years of age, and, as I have already said, the cardinal's title is engraved upon the seal together with a great many ornamental figures. A well-made article of the kind fetches a hundred, or more than a hundred crowns. This excellent workman, like Lucagnolo, roused in me some honest rivalry, although the art he practised is far remote from the other branches of goldsmithery, and consequently Lautizio was not skilled in making anything but seals. I gave my mind to acquiring his craft also, although I found it very difficult, and, unrepelled by the trouble which it gave me, I went on zealously upon the path of profit and improvement. There was in Rome another most excellent craftsman of ability, who was a Milanese named Messer Caradosso, he dealt in nothing but little chiselled medals, made of plates of metal and such like things. I've seen of his some paxes in half-relief, and some Christs of palm in length wrought of the thinnest golden plates, so exquisitely done that I esteemed him the greatest master in that kind I had ever seen, and envied him more than all the rest together. There were also other masters who worked at medals carved in steel, which may be called the models and true guides for those who aim at striking coins in the most perfect style. All these diverse arts I set myself with unflagging industry to learn. I must not omit the exquisite art of enamelling, in which I have never known any one excel save a Florentine, our countryman, called Amerigo. 
I did not know him, but was well acquainted with his incomparable masterpieces. Nothing in any part of the world or by craftsmen that I have seen approached the divine beauty of their workmanship. To this branch, too, I devoted myself with all my strength, although it is extremely difficult, chiefly because of the fire, which, after long time and trouble spent in other processes, has to be applied at last, and not unfrequently brings the whole to ruin. In spite of its great difficulties, it gave me so much pleasure that I looked upon them as recreation, and this came from the special gift which the God of nature bestowed on me, that is to say, a temperament so happy and of such excellent parts that I was freely able to accomplish whatever it pleased me to take in hand. The various departments of art which I have described are very different one from the other, so that a man who excels in one of them, if he undertakes the others, hardly ever achieves the same success, whereas I strove with all my power to become equally versed in all of them, and in the proper place I shall demonstrate that I attained my object. End of chapters 23 through 26《Chapters 27 through 30 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Coleman. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 27 through 30. 27. At that time, while I was still a young man of about twenty-three, there raged a plague of such extraordinary violence that many thousands died of it every day in Rome. Somewhat terrified at this calamity, I began to take certain amusements, as my mind suggested, and for a reason which I will presently relate. I had formed a habit of going on feast days to the ancient buildings, and copying parts of them in wax or with the pencil, and since these buildings are all ruins, and the ruins house innumerable pigeons, it came into my head to use my gun against these birds. So then, avoiding all commerce with people, in my terror of the plague, I used to put a fowling piece on my boy Pagolino's shoulder, and he and I went out alone into the ruins and oftentimes we came home laden with a cargo of the fattest pigeons. I did not care to charge my gun with more than a single ball, and thus it was by pure skill in the art that I filled such heavy bags. I had a fowling piece which I had made myself. Inside and out it was as bright as any mirror. I also used to make a very fine sort of powder, in doing which I discovered secret processes beyond any which have yet been found and on this point, in order to be brief, I will give but one particular, which will astonish good shots of every degree. This is, that when I charged my gun with powder weighing one-fifth of the ball, it carried two hundred paces point-blank. It is true that the great delight I took in this exercise bid fair to withdraw me from my art and studies, yet in another way it gave me more than it deprived me of, seeing that each time I went out shooting I returned with greatly better health, because the open air was a benefit to my constitution. My natural temperament was melancholy, and while I was taking these amusements, my heart leapt up with joy, and I found that I could work better, and with far greater mastery than when I spent my whole time in study and manual labour. In this way, my gun, at the end of the game, stood me more in profit than in loss. It was also the cause of my making acquaintance with certain hunters after curiosities, who followed in the track of those Lombard peasants who used to come to Rome to till the vineyards at the proper season. While digging the ground, they frequently turned up antique medals, agates, chrysoprases, cornelians and cameos, also sometimes jewels, as for instance emeralds, sapphires, diamonds and rubies. The peasants used to sell things of this sort to the traders for a mere trifle, and I very often, when I met them, paid the latter several times as many golden crowns as they had given Julio's for some object. Independently of the profit I made by this traffic, which was at least tenfold, it brought me also into agreeable relations with nearly all the cardinals of Rome. I will only touch upon a few of the most notable and the rarest of these curiosities. 
There came into my hands, among many other fragments, the head of a dolphin about as big as a good-sized ballot bean. Not only was the style of this head extremely beautiful, but nature had here far surpassed art, for the stone was an emerald of such good colour that the man who bought it from me for tens of crowns sold it again for hundreds after setting it as a finger ring. I will mention another kind of gem. This was a magnificent topaz, and here art equalled nature. It was as large as a big hazelnut, with the head of Minerva in a style of inconceivable beauty. I remember yet another precious stone, different from these. It was a cameo engraved with Hercules binding Kerberus of the triple throat. Such was its beauty and the skill of its workmanship that our great Michelagnolo protested he had never seen anything so wonderful. Among many bronze medals I obtained one upon which was a head of Jupiter. It was the largest that had ever been seen, the head of the most perfect execution and it had on the reverse side a very fine design of some little figures in the same style. I might enlarge at great length on this curiosity, but I will refrain, for fear of being prolix. 28. As I have said above, the plague had broken out in Rome, but though I must return a little way upon my steps, I shall not therefore abandon the main path of my history. There arrived in Rome a surgeon of the highest renown, who was called Maestro Giacomo da Carpi. This able man, in the course of his other practice, undertook the most desperate cases of the so-called French disease. In Rome this kind of illness is very partial to the priests, and especially to the richest of them. When, therefore, Maestro Giacomo had made his talents known, he professed to work miracles in the treatment of such cases by means of certain fumigations, but he only undertook a cure after stipulating for his fees, which he reckoned not by tens, but by hundreds of crowns. He was a great connoisseur in the arts of design. Chancing to pass one day before my shop, he saw a lot of drawings which I had laid upon the counter, and among these were several designs for little vases in a capricious style, which I had sketched for my amusement. These vases were in quite a different fashion from any which had been seen up to that date. He was anxious that I should finish one or two of them for him in silver, and this I did with the fullest satisfaction, seeing they exactly suited my own fancy. The clever surgeon paid me very well, and yet the honour which the vases brought me was worth a hundred times as much for the best craftsmen in the goldsmith's trade declared they had never seen anything more beautiful or better executed. No sooner had I finished them than he showed them to the Pope, and the next day following he betook himself away from Rome. He was a man of much learning who used to discourse wonderfully about medicine. The Pope would fain have had him in his service, but he replied that he would not take service with anybody in the world, and that whoso had need of him might come to seek him out. He was a person of great sagacity, and did wisely to get out of Rome, for not many months afterwards all the patients he had treated grew so ill that they were a hundred times worse off than before he came. He would certainly have been murdered if he had stopped. He showed my little vases to several persons of quality, amongst others to the most excellent Duke of Ferrara, and pretended that he had got them from a great lord in Rome, by telling this nobleman that if he wanted to be cured he must give him those two vases, and that the lord had answered that they were antique, and besought him to ask for anything else which it might be convenient for him to give, provided only he would leave him those. But according to his own account, Maestro Giacomo made as though he would not undertake the cure, and so he got them. I was told this by Messer Alberto Bendedio in Ferrara, who with great ostentation showed me some earthenware copies he possessed of them. Thereupon I laughed, and as I said nothing, Messer Alberto Bendedio, who was a haughty man, flew into a rage and said, You are laughing at them, are you? And I tell you that during the last thousand years there has not been born a man capable of so much as copying them. I then, not caring to deprive them of so eminent a reputation, kept silence and admired them with mute stupefaction. It was said to me in Rome by many great lords, some of whom were my friends, that the work of which I had been speaking was, in their opinion, of marvellous excellence and genuine antiquity, whereupon, emboldened by their praises, I revealed that I had made them. 
as they would not believe it, and as I wished to prove that I had spoken truth, I was obliged to bring evidence, and to make new drawings of the vases, for my word alone was not enough, inasmuch as Maestro Giacomo had cunningly insisted upon carrying off the old drawings with him. By this little job I earned a fair amount of money. 29. The plague went dragging on for many months, but I had as yet managed to keep it at bay. For though several of my comrades were dead, I survived in health and freedom. Now it chanced one evening that an intimate comrade of mine brought home to supper a Bolognese prostitute named Faustina. She was a very fine woman, but about thirty years of age, and she had with her a little serving girl of thirteen or fourteen. Faustina belonging to my friend, I would not have touched her for all the gold in the world, and though she declared she was madly in love with me, I remained steadfast in my loyalty but after they had gone to bed I stole away the little serving-girl, who was quite a fresh maid, and woe to her if her mistress had known of it. The result was that I enjoyed a very pleasant night, far more to my satisfaction than if I had passed it with Faustina. I rose upon the hour of breaking fast, and felt tired, for I had travelled many miles that night, and was wanting to take food, when a crushing headache seized me. Several boils appeared on my left arm, together with a carbuncle which showed itself just beyond the palm of the left hand where it joins the wrist. Everybody in the house was in a panic. My friend, the cow and the calf, all fled. Left alone there with my poor little prentice, who refused to abandon me, I felt stifled at the heart, and made up my mind for certain I was a dead man. Just then, the father of the lad went by, who was physician to the Cardinal Iacoacci, and lived as member of that prelate's household. The boy called out, Come, father, and see Benvenuto. He is in bed with some trifling indisposition. Without thinking what my complaint might be, the doctor came up at once, and when he had felt my pulse, he saw and felt what was very contrary to his own wishes. Turning round to his son, he said, O oh, traitor of a child, you've ruined me. How can I venture now into the cardinal's presence? His son made answer, why, father, this man my master is worth far more than all the cardinals in Rome. Then the doctor turned to me and said, Since I am here, I will consent to treat you. But of one thing only I warn you, that if you have enjoyed a woman, you are doomed. To this I replied, I did so this very night. He answered, With whom, and to what extent? I said, Last night and with a girl in her earliest maturity. Upon this, perceiving that he had spoken foolishly, he made haste to add, Well, considering the sores are so new, and have not yet begun to stink, and that the remedies will be taken in time, you need not be too much afraid, for I have good hopes of curing you. When he had prescribed for me and gone away, a very dear friend of mine called Giovanni Rigogli, came in, who fell to commiserating my great suffering and also my desertion by my comrade, and said, Be of good cheer, my Benvenuto, for I will never leave your side until I see you restored to health. I told him not to come too close, since it was all over with me. Only I besought him to be so kind as to take a considerable quantity of crowns, which were lying in a little box near my bed, and when God had thought fit to remove me from this world, to send them to my poor father writing pleasantly to him, in the way I too had done, so far as that appalling season of the plague permitted. My beloved friend declared that he had no intention whatsoever of leaving me, and that come what might, in life or death, he knew very well what was his duty toward a friend. And so we went on by the help of God, and the admirable remedies which I had used began to work a great improvement, and I soon came well out of that dreadful sickness." The saw was still open, with a plug of lint inside it and a plaster above, when I went out riding on a little wild pony. He was covered with hair four fingers long, and was exactly as big as a well-grown bear. Indeed, he looked just like a bear. I rode out on him to visit the painter Rosso, who was then living in the country, toward Civita Vecchia, at a place of Count Anguillara's called Cevetera. I found my friend, and he was very glad to see me. Whereupon I said, I am come to do to you that which you did to me so many months ago. He burst out laughing, embraced and kissed me, and begged me for the Count's sake to keep quiet. 
I stayed in that place about a month, with much content and gladness, enjoying good wines and excellent food, and treated with the greatest kindness by the Count. Every day I used to ride out alone along the seashore, where I dismounted and filled my pockets with all sorts of pebbles, snail-shells and sea-shells of great rarity and beauty. On the last day, for after this I went there no more, I was attacked by a band of men, who had disguised themselves, and disembarked from a Moorish privateer. When they thought that they had run me into a certain passage, where it seemed impossible that I should escape from their hands, I suddenly mounted my pony, resolved to be roosted or boiled alive at their past perilous, seeing I had little hope to evade one or the other of these fates. But, as God willed, my pony, who was the same I have described above, took an incredibly wide jump, and brought me off in safety, for which I heartily thanked God. I told the story to the Count. He ran to arms, but we saw the galleys setting out to sea. The next day following, I went back sound and with good cheer to Rome. 30. The plague had by this time almost died out, so that the survivors, when they met together alive, rejoiced with much delight in one another's company. This led to the formation of a club of painters, sculptors, and goldsmiths, the best that were in Rome, and the founder of it was a sculptor with the name of Michelagnolo. He was a Sienese and a man of great ability, who could hold his own against any other workman in that art. But above all, he was the most amusing comrade, and the heartiest good fellow in the universe. Of all the members of the club, he was the eldest, and yet the youngest from the strength and vigour of his body. We often came together, at the very least twice a week, I must not omit to mention that our society counted Giulio Romano, the painter, and Gianfrancesco, both of them celebrated pupils of the mighty Raffaello da Abino. After many and many merry meetings, it seemed good to our worthy president that for the following Sunday we should repair to supper in his house, and that each one of us should be obliged to bring with him his crow. Such was the nickname Michelagnolo gave to women in the club and that whoso did not bring one should be sconced by paying a supper to the whole company. Those of us who had no familiarity with women of the town were forced to purvey themselves at no small trouble and expense in order to appear without disgrace at that distinguished feast of artists. I had reckoned upon being well provided with a young woman of considerable beauty called Pantasilia, who was very much in love with me, but I was obliged to give her up to one of my dearest friends, called Ilberciaca, who on his side had been, and still was, over head and ears in love with her. This exchange excited a certain amount of lover's anger, because the lady, seeing I had abandoned her at Baciaca's first entreaty, imagined that I held in slight esteem the great affection which she bore me. In course of time, a very serious incident grew out of this misunderstanding, through her desire to take revenge for the affront I had put upon her, whereof I shall speak hereafter in the proper place. Well, then, the hour was drawing nigh when we had to present ourselves before that company of men of genius, each with his own crow, and I was still unprovided, and yet I thought it would be stupid to fail of such a madcap bagatelle. But what particularly weighed upon my mind was that I did not choose to lend the light of my countenance in that illustrious sphere to some miserable plume-plucked scarecrow. All these considerations made me devise a pleasant trick for the increase of merriment and the diffusion of mirth in our society. Having taken this resolve, I sent for a stripling of sixteen years, who lived in the next house to mine. He was the son of a Spanish coppersmith. This young man gave his time to Latin studies, and was very diligent in their pursuit. He bore the name of Diego, had a handsome figure and a complexion of marvellous brilliancy. The outlines of his head and face were far more beautiful than those of the antique Antinous. I had often copied them, gaining thereby much honour from the works in which I used them. The youth had no acquaintances, and was therefore quite unknown, dressed very ill and negligently all his affections being set upon those wonderful studies of his. After bringing him to my house, I begged him to let me array him in the woman's clothes which I had caused to be laid out. He readily complied, and put them on at once, while I added new beauties to the beauty of his face by the elaborate and studied way in which I dressed his hair. In his ears I placed two little rings, set with two large and fair pearls. The rings were broken, they only clipped his ears, which looked as though they had been pierced. 
Afterwards I wreathed his throat with chains of gold and rich jewels, and ornamented his fair hands with rings. Then I took him in a pleasant manner by one ear, and drew him before a great looking-glass. The lad, when he beheld himself, cried out with a burst of enthusiasm, "'Heavens! Is that Diego?' I said, "'That is Diego, from whom until this day I never asked for any kind of favour. But now I only beseech Diego to do me pleasure in one harmless thing, and it is this. I want him to come in those very clothes to supper with the company of artists whereof he has often heard me speak.' The young man, who was honest, virtuous, and wise, checked his enthusiasm, bent his eyes to the ground, and stood for a short while in silence. Then, with a sudden move, he lifted up his face and said, With Benvenuto I will go. Now let us start. I wrapped his head in a large kind of napkin, which is called in Rome a summer cloth, and when we reached the place of meeting, the company had already assembled, and everybody came forward to greet me. Michelagnolo had placed himself between Giulio and Giovanni Francesco. I lifted the veil from the head of my beauty, and then Michelagnolo, who, as I have already said, was the most humorous and amusing fellow in the world, laid his two hands, the one on Giulio's and the other on Gian Francesco's shoulders, and pulling them with all his force, made them bow down, while he, on his knees upon the floor, cried out for mercy, and called to all the folk in words like these, Behold ye of what sort are the angels of paradise, for though they are called angels, here shall ye see that they are not all of the male gender. Then with a loud voice he added, Angel beauteous, angel best, save me thou, make thou me blessed. Upon this my charming creature laughed, and lifted the right hand, and gave him a papal benediction, with many pleasant words to boot. So Michelagnolo stood up, and said it was the custom to kiss the feet of the Pope, and the cheeks of angels, and having done the latter to Diego, the boy blushed deeply, which immensely enhanced his beauty. When this reception was over, we found the whole room full of sonnets, which every man of us had made, and sent to Michelagnolo. My lad began to read them, and read them all aloud so gracefully, that his infinite charms were heightened beyond the powers of language to describe. Then followed conversation and witty sayings, on which I will not enlarge, for that is not my business. Only one clever word must be mentioned, for it was spoken by that admirable painter Giulio, who, looking round with meaning in his eyes on the bystanders, and fixing them particularly upon the women, turned to Michelagnolo, and said, My dear Michelagnolo, your nickname of crow very well suits those ladies to-day, though I vow they are somewhat less fair than crows by the side of one of the most lovely peacocks which fancy could have painted. When the banquet was served and ready, and we were going to sit down to table, Julio asked leave to be allowed to place us. This being granted, he took the women by the hand, and arranged them all upon the inner side, with my fair in the centre. Then he placed all the men on the outside, and me in the middle, saying there was no honour too great for my deserts. As a background to the women, there was spread an espalier of natural jasmines in full beauty, which set off their charms, and especially Diego's, to such great advantage that words would fail to describe the effect. Then we all of us fell to enjoying the abundance of our host's well-furnished table. The supper was followed by a short concert of delightful music, voices joining in harmony with instruments. And for as much as they were singing and playing from the book, my beauty begged to be allowed to sing his part. He performed the music better than almost all the rest, which so astonished the company that Giulio and Michelagnolo dropped their earlier tone of banter, exchanging it for well-weighed terms of sober, heartfelt admiration. After the music was over, a certain Aurelio Ascalano, remarkable for his gift as an improvisatory poet, began to extol the women in choice phrases of exquisite compliment. While he was chanting, the two girls who had my beauty between them never left off chattering. One of them related how she had gone wrong. The other asked mine how it had happened with her, and who were her friends, and how long she had been settled in Rome, and many other questions of the kind. It is true that, if I chose to describe such laughable episodes, I could relate several odd things which then occurred through Pantasilia's jealousy on my account. But, since they form no part of my design, I pass them briefly over. At last the conversation of those loose women vexed my beauty 
whom we had christened Pomona for the nonce, and Pomona, wanting to escape from their silly talk, turned restlessly upon her chair, first to one side and then to the other. The female brought by Giulio asked whether she felt indisposed. Pomona answered, yes, she thought she was a month or so with a child. This gave them the opportunity of feeling her body and discovering the real sex of the supposed woman. Thereupon they quickly withdrew their hands and rose from table, uttering such jibing words as are commonly addressed to young men of eminent beauty. The whole room rang with laughter and astonishment, in the midst of which Michelagnolo, assuming a fierce aspect, called out for leave to inflict on me the penance he thought fit. When this was granted, he lifted me aloft amid the clamour of the company, crying, Long live the gentleman! Long live the gentleman! and added that this was the punishment I deserved for having played so fine a trick. Thus ended that most agreeable supper-party, and each of us returned to his own dwelling at the close of day. End of chapters 27 through 30「Chapters 31 through 33 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 31 through 33. 31. It would take too long to describe in detail all the many and diverse pieces of work which I executed for a great variety of men. At present I need only say that I devoted myself with sustained diligence and industry to acquiring mastery in the several branches of art which I enumerated a short while back. And so I went on labouring incessantly at all of them. But since no opportunity has presented itself as yet for describing my most notable performances, I shall wait to report them in their proper place before very long. The Sienese sculptor, Michel Agnolo, of whom I have recently been speaking, was at that time making the monument of the late Pope Adrian. Giulio Romano went to paint for the Marquis of Mantua. The other members of the club betook themselves in different directions, each to his own business, so that our company of artists was well nigh altogether broken up. About this time there fell into my hands some little Turkish poniard. The handle as well as the blade of these daggers was made of iron, and so too was the sheath. They were engraved by means of iron implements with foliage in the most exquisite Turkish style, very neatly filled in with gold. The sight of them stirred in me a great desire to try my own skill in that branch, so different from the others which I practised and finding that I succeeded to my satisfaction, I executed several pieces. Mine were far more beautiful and more durable than the Turkish, and this for diverse reasons. One was that I cut my grooves much deeper and with wider trenches in the steel, for this is not usual in Turkish work. Another was that the Turkish arabesques are only composed of arum leaves, a few small sunflowers, and although these have a certain grace, they do not yield so lasting a pleasure as the patterns which we use. It is true that in Italy we have several different ways of designing foliage. The Lombards, for example, construct very beautiful patterns by copying the leaves of bryony and ivy in exquisite curves, which are extremely agreeable to the eye. The Tuscans and the Romans make a better choice, because they imitate the leaves of the acanthus, commonly called bear's foot with its stalks and flowers curling in diverse wavy lines. And into these arabesques one may excellently well insert the figures of little birds and different animals, by which the good taste of the artist is displayed. Some hints for creatures of this sort can be observed in nature among the wild flowers. As, for instance, in snapdragons and some few other plants, which must be combined and developed with the help of fanciful imaginings by clever draughtsmen. Such arabesques are called grotesques by the ignorant. They have obtained this name of grotesques among the moderns through being found in certain subterranean caverns in Rome by students of antiquity, which caverns were formerly chambers, hot baths, cabinets for study, halls and apartments of like nature. The curious discovering them in such places, 
since the level of the ground has gradually been raised while they have remained below, and since in Rome these vaulted rooms are commonly called grottoes, it has followed that the word grotesque is applied to the patterns I have mentioned. But this is not the right term for them, inasmuch as the ancients, who delighted in composing monsters out of goats, cows, and horses, called these chimerical hybrids by the name of monsters, and the modern artificers of whom I speak, fashioned from the foliage which they copied monsters of like nature. For these the proper name is therefore monsters, and not grotesques. Well then, I designed patterns of this kind, and filled them in with gold as I have mentioned, and they were far more pleasing to the eye than the Turkish. It chanced at that time that I lighted upon some jars or little antique urns filled with ashes, and among the ashes were some iron rings inlaid with gold, for the ancients also used that art, and in each of the rings was set a tiny cameo of shell. On applying to men of learning, they told me that these rings were worn as amulets by folk desirous of abiding with mind unshaken in any extraordinary circumstance, whether of good or evil fortune. Hereupon, at the request of certain noblemen who were my friends, I undertook to fabricate some trifling rings of this kind, but I made them of refined steel, and after they had been well engraved and inlaid with gold, they produced a very beautiful effect, and sometimes a single ring brought me more than forty crowns, merely in payment for my labour. It was the custom of that epoch to wear little golden medals, upon which every nobleman or man of quality had some device or fancy of his own engraved, and these were worn in the cap. Of such pieces I made very many, and found them extremely difficult to work. I have already mentioned the admirable craftsman Caradosso, who used to make such ornaments, and as there were more than one figure on each piece, he asked at least a hundred gold crowns for his fee. This being so, not, however, because his prices were so high, but because he worked so slowly, I began to be employed by certain noblemen, for whom, among other things, I made a medal in competition with that great artist, and it had four figures, upon which I had expended an infinity of labour. These men of quality, when they compared my piece with that of the famous Caradosso, declared that mine was by far the better executed and more beautiful and bade me ask what I liked as the reward for my trouble, for since I had given them such perfect satisfaction, they wished to do the like by me. I replied that my greatest reward, and what I most desired, was to have rivalled the masterpieces of so eminent an artist, and that, if their lordships thought I had, I acknowledged myself to be most amply rewarded. With this I took my leave, and they immediately sent me such a very liberal present that I was well content, Indeed, there grew in me so great a spirit to do well, that to this event I attributed what will afterwards be related of my progress. 32. I shall be obliged to digress a little from the history of my art, unless I were to omit some annoying incidents which have happened in the course of my troubled career. One of these, which I am about to describe, brought me into the greatest risk of my life. I have already told the story of the artist's club, and of the farcical adventures which happened owing to the woman whom I mentioned, Pantasilea, the one who felt for me that false and fulsome love. She was furiously enraged because of the pleasant trick by which I brought Diego to our banquet, and she swore to be revenged on me. How she did so is mixed up with the history of a young man called Luigi Pulci, who had recently come to Rome. He was the son of one of the Pulcis, who had been beheaded for incest with his daughter and the youth possessed extraordinary gifts for poetry together with sound Latin scholarship. He wrote well, was graceful in manners, and of surprising personal beauty. He had just left the surface of some bishop, whose name I do not remember, and was thoroughly tainted with a very foul disease. While he was yet a lad and living in Florence, they used in certain places of the city to meet together during the nights of summer on the public streets, and he, ranking among the best of the improvisatori, sang there. His recitations were so admirable that the divine Michael Agnolo Brunarotti, that prince of sculptors and of painters, went, wherever he heard that he would be, with the greatest eagerness and delight to listen to him. There was a man called Piloto, a goldsmith, very able in his art, who together with myself joined Brunarotti upon these occasions. Thus acquaintance sprang up between me and Luigi Pulci, and after the lapse of many years, he came in the miserable plight which I have mentioned, to make himself known to me again in Rome, 
beseeching me for God's sake to help him. Moved to compassion by his great talents, by the love of my fatherland, and by my own natural tenderness of heart, I took him into my house, and had him medically treated in such wise that, being but a youth, he soon regained his health. While he was still pursuing his cure, he never omitted his studies, and I provided him with books according to the means at my disposal. The result was that Luigi, recognizing the great benefits he had received from me, oftentimes with words and tears returned me thanks, protesting that if God should ever put good fortune in his way, he would recompense me for his kindness. To this I replied that I had not done for him as much as I desired, but only what I could, and that it was the duty of human beings to be mutually serviceable. Only I suggested that he repay the service I had rendered him by doing likewise to someone who might have the same need of him as he had of me. The young man in question began to frequent the court of Rome, where he soon found a situation, and enrolled himself in the suite of a bishop, a man of eighty years, who bore the title of Gurgensis. This bishop had a nephew called Messo Giovanni. He was a nobleman of Venice, and the said Messer Giovanni made a show of marvellous attachment to Luigi Pulci's talents, and under the pretense of these talents he brought him as familiar to himself as his own flesh blood. Luigi, having talked of me and of his great obligations to me with Messer Giovanni, the latter expressed a wish to make my acquaintance. Thus when it came to pass that when I had upon a certain evening invited that woman Pantasilea to supper, and had assembled a company of men of parts who were my friends, just at that moment of our sitting down to table, Messer Giovanni and Luigi Pulci arrived, and after some complimentary speeches they both remained to sup with us. The shameless strumpet, casting her eyes upon the young man's beauty, began at once to lay her nets for him, perceiving which, when the supper had come to an agreeable end, I took Luigi aside and conjured him, by the benefits he said he owed me, to have nothing whatever to do with her. To this he answered, Good heavens, Benvenuto, do you then take me for a madman? I rejoined, Not for a madman, but for a young fellow. And I swore to him, By God, I do not give that woman the least thought, but for your sake I should be sorry if through her you came to break your neck. Upon these words he vowed and prayed to God that, if ever he but spoke with her, he might upon the moment break his neck. I think the poor lad swore this oath to God with all his heart, for he did break his neck, as I shall presently relate. Messer Giovanni showed signs too evident of loving him in a dishonourable way, for we began to notice that Luigi had new suits of silk and velvet every morning, and it was known that he abandoned himself altogether to bad courses. He neglected his fine talents, and pretended not to see or recognise me, because I had once rebuked him and told him he was giving his soul to foul vices, which would make him break his neck, as he had vowed. 33. Now Messer Giovanni brought his favourite a very fine black horse, for which he paid a hundred and fifty crowns. The beast was admirably trained to hand, so that Luigi could go daily to Caracoli around the lodgings of that prostitute Pantasilea. Though I took notice of this, I paid it no attention only remarking that all things acted as their nature prompted, and meanwhile I gave my whole mind to my studies. It came to pass one Sunday evening that we were invited to sup together with the Sienese sculptor Michael Agnolo, and the time of the year was summer. Bacciacca, of whom I have already spoken, was present at the party, and he had brought with him his old flame Pantasilea. When we were at table she sat between me and Bacciata, but in the very middle of the banquet, she rose, and excused herself upon the pretense of a natural need, saying she would speedily return. We meanwhile continued talking, very agreeably, and supping, but she remained an unaccountably long time absent. It chanced that, keeping my ears open, I thought I heard a sort of subdued tittering in the street below. I had a knife in hand which I was using for my service at the table. The window was so close to where I sat that, by merely rising, I could see Luigi in the street, together with Pantasilea, and I heard Luigi saying, Oh, if that devil Benvenuto only saw us, shouldn't we catch it? And she answered, Have no fear, only listen to the noise they're making. We're the last thing they're thinking of. At these words, having made them both well out, I leapt from the window and took Luigi by the cape, 
and certainly I should then have killed him with the knife I had, but that he was riding a white horse, to which he clapped spurs, leaving his cape in my grasp in order to preserve his life. Pantasilea took to her heels in the direction of a neighbouring church. The company at supper rose immediately and came down, entreating me in a body to refrain from putting myself and them to inconvenience for a strumpet. I told them that I should not have let myself be moved on her account, but that I was bent on punishing the infamous young man, who showed how little he regarded me. Accordingly I would not yield to the remonstrances of those ingenious and worthy men, but took my sword, and went alone toward Preti, the house where we were supping, I should say, stood close to the Castello gate, which led to Preti. Walking thus upon the road to Preti, I had not gone far before the sun sank, and I re-entered Rome itself at a slow pace. Night had fallen, a darkness had come on, but the gates of Rome were not yet shut. Towards two hours after sunset, I walked along Pantasilea's lodging, with the intention, if Luigi Pulci were there, of doing something to the discontent of both. When I heard and saw that no one but a poor servant girl called Canido was in the house, I went to put away my cloak and the scabbard of my sword, and then returned to the house, which stood behind the banshee on the river Tiber. Just opposite stretched a garden belonging to an innkeeper called Romolo. It was enclosed by a thick hedge of thorns, in which I hid myself, standing upright, and waiting till the woman came back with Luigi. After keeping watch a while there, my friend Baciaca crept up to me, whether led by his own suspicions or by the advice of others I cannot say. In a low voice he called out to me, Gossip, for so we used to name ourselves for fun, and then he prayed me for God's love, using the words which follow, with tears in the tone of his voice. Dear Gossip, I entreat you not to injure that poor girl. She at least has erred no wise in this matter. No, not at all. When I heard what he was saying, I replied, If you don't take yourself off now, at this first word I utter, I will bring my sword here down upon your head. Overwhelmed with fright, my poor Gossip was suddenly taken ill with the colic, and withdrew to ease himself apart. Indeed, he could not but obey the call. There was such a glorious heaven of stars, which shed good light to see by. All of a sudden I was aware of the noise of many horses. They were coming toward me from one side and the other. It turned out to be Luigi and Pantasilea, attended by a certain Messer Benvegnato of Perugia, who was Chamberlain to Pope Clement, and followed by four doughty captains of Perugia, with some other valiant soldiers in the flower of youth. Altogether reckoned there were more than twelve swords. When I understood the matter, and saw not how to fly, I did my best to crouch into the hedge. But the thorns pricked and hurt me, goading me to madness like a bull, and I half resolved to take a leap and hazard my escape. Just then Luigi, with his arm round Pantasilea's neck, was heard crying, I must kiss you once again, if only to insult that traitor Benvenuto. At that moment, annoyed as I was by the prickles, and irritated by the young man's words, I sprang forth, lifted my sword on high, and shouted at the top of my voice, You are all dead folk. My blow descended on the shoulder of Luigi, but the satyrs who doted on him had steeled his person round with coats of mail and such like villainous defences. Still the stroke fell with crushing force. Swerving aside, the sword hit Pantasilea full in nose and mouth. Both she and Luigi grovelled on the ground, while Baciaca, with his breeches down to heels, screamed out and ran away. Then I turned upon the others boldly with my sword, and those valiant fellows, hearing a sudden commotion in the tavern, thought there was an army coming of a hundred men, and though they drew their swords with spirit, yet two horses which had taken fright in the tumult cast them into such disorder that a couple of the best riders were thrown, and the remainder took to flight. I, seeing that the affair was turning out well for me, ran as quickly as I could, and came off with honour from the engagement, not wishing to tempt fortune more than was my duty. During the hurly-burly some of the soldiers and captains wounded themselves with their own arms, and Messer Benvegnato, the Pope's Chamberlain, was kicked and trampled by his mule. One of the servants also, who had drawn his sword, fell down together with his master, and wounded him badly in the hand. Maddened by the pain, he swore louder than all the rest in his Perugian jargon, crying out, By the body of God, I will take care that Benvegnato teaches Benvenuto how to live. He afterwards commissioned one of the captains who were with him, 
braver perhaps than the others, but with less aplomb as being but a youth, to seek me out. The fellow came to visit me in the place of by retirement. That was the palace of a great Neapolitan nobleman, who had become acquainted with me in my art, and besides taken a fancy to me because of my physical and mental aptitude for fighting, to which my lord himself was personally well inclined. So then, finding myself made much of, and being precisely in my element, I gave such answer to the captain as I think must have made him earnestly repent of having come to look me up. After a few days, when the wounds of Luigi and the strumpet and the rest were healing, the great Neapolitan nobleman received overtures from Messer Benvegnato, for the prelate's anger had cooled, and had proposed to ratify a peace between me and Luigi and the soldiers, who had personally no quarrel with me, and only wished to make my acquaintance. Accordingly, my friend and nobleman replied that he would bring me where they chose to appoint, and that he was very willing to effect a reconciliation. He stipulated that no words should be banded about on either side, seeing that would be little to their credit. It was enough to go through the form of drinking together and exchanging kisses. He, for his part, undertook to do the talking, and promised to settle the matter to their honour. This arrangement was carried out. On Thursday evening my protector took me to the house of Messer Benvegnato, where all the soldiers who had been present at that discomfiture were assembled, and already seated at table. My nobleman was attended by thirty brave fellows, all well armed, a circumstance which Messer Benvegnato had not anticipated. When we came into the hall, he walking first, I following, he speak to this effect. God save you, gentlemen. We have come to see you, I and Benvenuto, whom I love like my own brother, and we are ready to do whatever you propose. Messer Benvegnato, seeing the hall filled with such a crowd of men, called out, it is only peace, and nothing else we ask of you. Accordingly he promised that the governor of Rome, with his catchpoles, should give me no trouble. Then we made peace, and I returned to my shop, where I could not stay an hour without that Neapolitan nobleman either coming to see me or sending for me. Meanwhile, Luigi Pulci, having recovered from his wound, rode every day upon the black horse which was so well trained to heel and bridle. One day, among others, after it had rained a little, and he was making his horse curvet just before Pantasilea's door, he slipped and fell with the horse upon him. His right leg was broken short off in the thigh, and after a few days he died there in Pantasilea's lodgings, discharging thus the vow he registered so heartily to heaven. Even so it may be seen, that God keeps account of the good and the bad, and gives to each one what he merits. End of chapter 31 through 33 Chapters 34 through 37 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simons. Chapter 34 through 37. Chapter 34. The whole world was now in warfare. Pope Clement had sent to get some troops from Giovanni de' Medici, and when they came, they made such disturbances in Rome, that it was ill living in open shops. On this account I retired to a good snug house behind the Bianchi, where I worked for all the friends I had acquired. Since I produced few things of much importance at that period, I need not waste time in talking about them. I took much pleasure in music and amusements of the kind. On the death of Giovanni de' Medici in Lombardy, the Pope, at the advice of Messer Jacopi Salviati, dismissed the five bands he had engaged, and when the constable of Bourbon knew that there were no troops in Rome, he pushed his army with the utmost energy up to the city. The whole of Rome upon this flew to arms. I happened to be intimate with Alessandro, the son of Piero del Beni, who at that time, when the Colonesi entered Rome, had requested me to guard his palace. On this more serious occasion, therefore, he prayed me to enlist fifty comrades for the protection of the said house, appointing me as their captain, as I had been when the Colonnesi came. So I collected fifty young men of the highest courage, and we took up our quarters in his palace, with good pay and excellent appointments. Bourbon's army had now arrived before the walls of Rome, and Alessandro begged me to go with him to reconnoitre. So we went with one of the stoutest fellows in our company, and on the way a youth called Cicino della Casa joined himself to us. 
On reaching the walls by the Campo Santo, we could see that famous army, which was making every effort to enter the town. Upon the ramparts where we took our station, several young men were lying killed by the besiegers. The battle raged there desperately, and there was the densest fog imaginable. I turned to Alessandro and said, "'Let us go home as soon as we can, for there is nothing to be done here. You see the enemies are mounting, and our men are in flight.' Alessandro, in a panic, cried, "'Would God that we had never come here!' and turned in maddest haste to fly. I took him up somewhat sharply with these words. Since you have brought me here, I must perform some action worthy of a man, and directing my arquebus where I saw the thickest and most serried troop of fighting men, I aimed exactly at one whom I remarked to be higher than the rest. The fog prevented me from being certain whether he was on horseback or on foot. Then I turned to Alessandro and Cecchino, and bade them discharge their arquebuses, showing them how to avoid being hit by the besiegers. When we had fired two rounds apiece, I crept cautiously up to the wall, and observing among the enemy a most extraordinary confusion, I discovered afterwards that one of our shots had killed the constable of Bourbon, and from what I subsequently learned he was the man whom I had first noticed above the heads of the rest. Quitting our position on the ramparts, we crossed the Campo Santo, and entered the city by St. Peter's. Then coming out exactly at the church of Santo Agnolo, we got with the greatest difficulty to the great gate of the castle for the generals Renzo de Chieri and Orazio Baglioni were wounding and slaughtering everybody who abandoned the defense of the walls. By the time we had reached the great gate, part of the foemen had already entered Rome, and we had them in our rear. The castellan had ordered the portcullis to be lowered, in order to do which they cleared a little space, and this enabled us four to get inside. On the instant that I entered, the captain, Polone de' Medici, claimed me as being of the papal household, and forced me to abandon Alessandro, which I had to do much against my will. I ascended to the keep, and at the same instant Pope Clement came in through the corridors into the castle. He had refused to leave the palace of St. Peter earlier, being unable to believe that his enemies would effect their entrance into Rome. Having got into the castle in this way, I attached myself to certain pieces of artillery, which were under the command of a bombardier called Giuliano Fiorentino. Leaning there against the battlements, the unhappy man could see his poor house being sacked, and his wife and children outraged. Fearing to strike his own folk, he dared not discharge the cannon, and flinging the burning fuse upon the ground, he wept as though his heart would break, and tore his cheeks with both hands. Some of the other bombardiers were behaving in like manner, seeing which I took one of the matches, and got the assistance of a few men who were not overcome by their emotions. I aimed some swivels and falconets at points where I saw it would be useful, and killed with them a good number of the enemy. Had it not been for this, the troops who poured into Rome that morning, and were marching straight upon the castle, might possibly have entered it with ease, because the artillery was doing them no damage. I went on firing under the eyes of several cardinals and lords, who kept blessing me and giving me the heartiest encouragement. In my enthusiasm I strove to achieve the impossible. Let it suffice that it was I who saved the castle that morning, and brought the other bombardiers back to their duty. I worked the whole of that day, and when the evening came, while the army was marching into Rome through the Testaveri, Pope Clement appointed a great Roman nobleman named Antonio Santa Croce to be captain of all the gunners. The first thing that this man did was to come to me, and having greeted me with the utmost kindness, he stationed me with five fine pieces of artillery on the highest point of the castle, to which the name of the angel specially belongs. This circular eminence goes round the castle, and surveys both the Prati and the town of Rome. The captain put under my orders enough men to help in managing my guns, and having seen me paid in advance, he gave me rations of bread and a little wine, and begged me to go forward as I had begun. I was perhaps more inclined by nature to the profession of arms than to the one I had adopted, and took such pleasure in its duties that I discharged them better than those of my own art. Night came, the enemy had entered Rome, and we who were in the castle, especially myself, who have always taken pleasure in extraordinary sights, stayed gazing on the indescribable scene of tumult and conflagration in the streets below. People who were anywhere else but where we were could not have formed the least imagination of what it was. I will not, however, set myself to describe that tragedy, but will content myself with continuing the history of my own life, and the circumstances which properly belong to it. 35. During the course of my artillery practice, which I never intermitted through the whole month passed by us beleaguered in the castle, I met with a great many very striking accidents, all of them worthy to be related. 
but since I do not care to be too prolix, or to exhibit myself outside the sphere of my profession, I will omit the larger part of them, only touching upon those I cannot well neglect, which shall be the fewest in number and the most remarkable. The first which comes to hand is this. Messer Antonio Santa Croce had made me come down from the angel, in order to fire on some houses in the neighborhood, where certain of our besiegers had been seen to enter. While I was firing, a cannon-shot reached me, which hit the angle of a battlement, and carried off enough of it to be the cause why I sustained no injury. The whole mass struck me in the chest and took my breath away. I lay stretched upon the ground like a dead man, and could hear what the bystanders were saying. Among them all, Messer Antonio Santa Croce lamented greatly, exclaiming, Alas, alas, we have lost the best defender that we had. Attracted by the uproar, one of my comrades ran up. He was called Gian Francesco, and was a bandsman, but was far more naturally given to medicine than to music. On the spot he flew off, crying for a stoop of the very best Greek wine. Then he made a tile red-hot, and cast upon it a good handful of wormwood, after which he sprinkled the Greek wine, and when the wormwood was well soaked, he laid it on my breast, just where the bruise was visible to all. Such was the virtue of the wormwood that I immediately regained my scattered faculties. I wanted to begin to speak, but could not, for some stupid soldiers had filled my mouth with earth, imagining that by doing so they were giving me the sacrament, and indeed they were more like to have excommunicated me, since I could with difficulty come to myself again. The earth was doing me more in mischief than the below. However, I escaped that danger, and returned to the rage and fury of the guns, pursuing my work there with all the ability and eagerness that I could summon. Pope Clement, by this, had sent to demand assistance from the Duke of Urbino, who was with the troops of Venice. He commissioned the envoy to tell His Excellency that the castle of St. Angelo would send up every evening three beacons from its summit, accompanied by three discharges of the cannon thrice repeated, and that so long as this signal was continued, he might take for granted that the castle had not yielded. I was charged with lighting the beacons and firing the guns for this purpose, and all the while I pointed my artillery by day upon the places where mischief could be done. The Pope, in consequence, began to regard me with still greater favor, because he saw that I discharged my functions as intelligently as the task demanded. Aid from the Duke of Urbino never came, on which, as it is not my business, I will make no further comment. 36. While I was at work on that diabolical task of mine, there came from time to time to watch me some of the cardinals who were invested in the castle, and most frequently the cardinal of Ravenna and the cardinal de Gatti. I often told them not to show themselves, since their nasty red caps gave a fair mark to our enemies. From the neighboring buildings, such as the Torre de Bini, we ran great peril when they were there, and at last I had them locked off, and gained thereby their deep ill-will. I frequently received visits also from the general, Orazio Baglioni, who was very well affected toward me. One day, while he was talking with me, he noticed something going forward in a drinking-place outside the Porta della Castello, which bore the name of Bacanello. This tavern had for sign a sun painted between two windows, of a bright red color. The windows being closed, Signor Orazio concluded that a band of soldiers were carousing at table, just between them and behind the sun. So he said to me, Benvenuto, if you think that you could hit that wall an ell's breadth from the sun with your demi-cannon here, I believe you would be doing a good stroke of business, for there is a great commotion there, and men of much importance must probably be inside the house. I answered that I felt quite capable of hitting the sun in its center, but that a barrel full of stones, which was standing close to the muzzle of the gun, might be knocked down by the shock of the discharge and the blast of the artillery. He rejoined, Don't waste time, Benvenuto. In the first place it is not possible where it is standing that the cannon's blast should bring it down, and even if it were to fall, and the Pope himself was underneath, the mischief would not be so great as you imagine. Fire, then, only fire. Taking no more thought about it, I struck the sun in the centre exactly as I said I should. The cask was dislodged as I predicted, and fell precisely between Cardinal Farnese and Messer Jacopi Salviati. It might very well have dashed out the brains of both of them, except that, just at that very moment, Farnese was reproaching Salviati with having caused the sack of Rome, and while they stood apart from one another to exchange opprobrious remarks, my gabion fell without destroying them. When he heard the uproar in the court below, good Signor Orazio dashed off in a hurry, and I, thrusting my neck forward where the cask had fallen, heard some people saying, It would not be a bad job to kill that gunner. 
Upon this I turned two falconets toward the staircase, with mind resolved to let blaze on the first man who attempted to come up. The household of Cardinal Farnese must have received orders to go and do me some injury. Accordingly I prepared to receive them, with a lighted match in hand. Recognizing some who were approaching, I called out, "'You lazy lubbers, if you don't pack off from there, and if but a man's child among you dares to touch the staircase, I've got two cannon loaded, which will blow you into powder. Go and tell the cardinal that I was acting at the order of superior officers, and that what we have done and are doing is in defense of them priests, and not to hurt them.' They made away, and then came Signor Orazio Baglioni running. I bade him stand back, else I'd murder him, for I knew very well who he was. He drew back a little, not without a certain show of fear, and called out, "'Benvenuto, I am your friend.' To this I answered, "'Sir, come up, but come alone, and then come as you like.' The general, who was a man of mighty pride, stood still a moment, and then said angrily, "'I've a good mind not to come up again, and to do quite the opposite of that which I intended toward you.' I replied that, just as I was put there to defend my neighbors, I was equally well able to defend myself, too. He said that he was coming alone, and when he arrived at the top of the stairs, his features were more discomposed than I thought reasonable. So I kept my hand upon my sword, and stood eyeing him askance. Upon this he began to laugh, and the color coming back into his face, he said to me, with the most pleasant manner, "'Friend Benvenuto, I bear you as great love as I have it in my heart to give, and in God's good time I will render you proof of this.' Would to God that you had killed those two rascals, for one of them is the cause of all this trouble, and the day perchance will come when the other will be found the cause of something even worse. He then begged me, if I should be asked, not to say that he was with me when I fired the gun, and for the rest bade me be of good cheer. The commotion which the affair made was enormous, and lasted a long while. However, I will not enlarge upon it further, only adding that I was within an inch of revenging my father on Messer Jacopo Salviati, who had grievously injured him according to my father's complaints. As it was, unwittingly I gave the fellow a great fright. Of Farnese I shall say nothing here, because it will appear in its proper place how well it would have been if I had killed him. 37. I pursued my business of artillerymen, and every day performed some extraordinary feat, whereby the credit and the favor I acquired with the Pope was something indescribable. There never passed a day but what I killed one or another of our enemies in the besieging army. On one occasion the Pope was walking around the circular keep, when he observed a Spanish colonel in the Prati. He recognized the man by certain indications, seeing that this officer had formerly been in his service, and while he fixed his eyes on him, he kept talking about him. I, above by the angel, knew nothing of this, but spied a fellow down there, busying himself about the trenches with a javelin in his hand. He was dressed entirely in rose color, and so, studying the worst that I could do against him, I selected a gerfalcon which I had at hand. It is a piece of ordnance larger and longer than a swivel, and about the size of a demi culverin. This I emptied, and loaded it again with a good charge of fine powder mixed with the coarser sort. Then I aimed it exactly at the man in red, elevating prodigiously, because a piece of that caliber could hardly be expected to carry true at such a distance. I fired, and hit my man exactly in the middle. He had trussed his sword in front, for swagger, after a way those Spaniards have, and my ball, when it struck him, broke upon the blade, and one could see the fellow cut in two fair halves. The Pope, who was expecting nothing of this kind, derived great pleasure and amazement from the sight, both because it seemed to him impossible that one should aim and hit the mark at such a distance, and also because the man was cut in two, and he could not comprehend how this should happen. He sent for me, and asked about it. I explained all the devices I had used in firing, but told him that, why the man was cut in two halves, neither he nor I could know. Upon my bended knees I then besought him to give me the pardon of his blessing for that homicide, and for all the others I had committed in the castle in the service of the church. Thereat the Pope, raising his hand, and making a large open sign of the cross upon my face, told me that he blessed me, and that he gave me pardon for all murders I had ever perpetrated, or should ever perpetrate, in the service of the apostolic church. When I felt him, I went aloft, and never stayed from firing to the utmost of my power, and few were the shots of mine that missed their mark. My drawing, and my fine studies in my craft, and my charming art of music, all were swallowed up in the din of that artillery, and if I were to relate in detail all the splendid things I did in that infernal work of cruelty, I should make the world stand by and wonder. But not to be too prolix, I will pass over them. Only I must tell a few of the most remarkable, which are, as it were, forced in upon me. To begin, then, 
pondering day and night what I could render for my own part in defence of Holy Church, and having noticed that the enemy changed guard and marched past the great gate of Santo Spirito, which was within a reasonable range, I thereupon directed my attention to that spot. But having to shoot sideways, I could not do the damage that I wished, although I killed a fair percentage every day. This induced our adversaries, when they saw their passage covered by my guns, to load the roof of a certain house one night with thirty gabions, which obstructed the view I formerly enjoyed. Taking better thought than I had done of the whole situation, I now turned all my five pieces of artillery directly on the gabions, and waited till the evening hour, when they changed guard. Our enemies, thinking they were safe, came on at greater ease and in a closer body than usual, whereupon I set fire to my blowpipes. Not merely did I dash to pieces the gabions which stood in my way, but what was better, by that one blast I slaughtered more than thirty men. In consequence of this manoeuvre, which I repeated twice, the soldiers were thrown into such disorder, that being, moreover, encumbered with the spoils of that great sack, and some of them desirous of enjoying the fruits of their labour, they oftentimes showed a mind to mutiny and take themselves away from Rome. However, after coming to terms with their valiant captain, Gian di Urbino, they were ultimately compelled, at their excessive inconvenience, to take another road when they changed guard. It cost them three miles of march, whereas before they had but half a mile. Having achieved this feat, I was entreated with prodigious favours by all the men of quality who were invested in the castle. This incident was so important that I thought it well to relate it, before finishing the history of things outside my art, which is the real object of my writing. Forsooth, if I wanted to ornament my biography with such matters, I should have far too much to tell. There was only one more circumstance which, now that the occasion offers, I propose to record. End of chapters 34 through 37. Chapters 38 through 41 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini. Volume One, translated by John Addington Simons, chapters thirty-eight through forty-one. Thirty-eight. I shall skip over some intervening circumstances and tell how Pope Clement, wishing to save the tiaras and the whole collection of the great jewels of the Apostolic Camera, had me called and the Cavalierino in a room alone. This Cavalierino had been a groom in the stable of Filippo Strozzi. He was French and a person of the lowest birth but being a most faithful servant, the Pope had made him very rich, and confided in him like himself. So the Pope, the Cavalier, and I, being shut up together, they laid before me the tiaras and jewels of the regalia, and His Holiness ordered me to take all the gems out of their gold settings. This I accordingly did. Afterwards I wrapped them separately up in bits of paper, and we sewed them into the linings of the Pope's and the Cavalier's clothes. Then they gave me all the gold, which weighed about two hundred pounds, and bade me melt it down as secretly as I was able. I went up to the angel where I had my lodging, and could lock the door so as to be free from interruption. There I built a little draught furnace of bricks, with a largish pot, shaped like an open dish, at the bottom of it, and throwing the gold upon the coals, it gradually sank through and dropped into the pan. While the furnace was working, I never left off watching how to annoy our enemies, and as their trenches were less than a stone's throw right below us, I was able to inflict considerable damage on them with some useless missiles, of which there were several piles, forming the old munition of the castle. I chose a swivel and a falconet, which were both a little damaged in the muzzle, and filled them with the projectiles I have mentioned. When I fired my guns, they hurtled down like mad, occasioning all sorts of unexpected mischief in the trenches." Accordingly I kept those pieces always going at the same time that the gold was being melted down, and a little before vespers I noticed some one coming along the margin of the trench on muleback. The mule was trotting very quickly, and the man was talking to the soldiers in the trenches. I took the precaution of discharging my artillery just before he came to the immediate opposite, and so, making a good calculation, I hit my mark. One of the fragments struck him in the face. The rest were scattered on the mule, which fell dead. A tremendous uproar rose from the trench. I opened fire with my other piece, doing them a great hurt. 
the man turned out to be the Prince of Orange, who was carried through the trenches to a certain tavern in the neighbourhood, whither in a short while all the chief folk of the army came together. When Pope Clement heard what I had done, he sent at once to call for me, and inquired into the circumstances. I related the whole, and added that the man must have been of the greatest consequence, because the inn to which they carried him had been immediately filled by all the chiefs of the army, so far at least as I could judge. The Pope, with a shrewd instinct, sent for Messer Antonio Santa Croce, the nobleman who, as I have said, was chief and commander of the gunners. He bade him order all us bombardiers to point our pieces, which were very numerous, in one mass upon the house, and to discharge them all together upon the signal of an arquebus being fired. He judged that if we killed the generals, the army, which was already almost on the point of breaking up, would take flight. God perhaps had heard the prayers they kept continually making, and meant to rid them in this manner of these impious scoundrels. We put our cannon in order at the command of Santa Croce, and waited for the signal. But when Cardinal Orsini became aware of what was going forward, he began to expostulate with the Pope, protesting that the thing by no means ought to happen, seeing they were on the point of concluding an accommodation, and that if the generals were killed, the rabble of the troops without a leader would storm the castle and complete their utter ruin. Consequently, they could by no means allow the Pope's plan to be carried out. The poor Pope, in despair, seeing himself assassinated both inside the castle and without, said that he left them to arrange it. On this our orders were countermanded, but I, who chafed against the leash, when I knew that they were coming round to bid me stop from firing, let blaze one of my demi-cannons, and struck a pillar in the courtyard of the house, around which I saw a crowd of people clustering. This shot did such damage to the enemy that it was like to have made them evacuate the house. Cardinal Orsini was absolutely for having me hanged or put to death, but the Pope took up my cause with spirit. The high words that passed between them, though I well know what they are, I will not here relate, because I make no profession of writing history. It is enough for me to occupy myself with my own affairs. 39. After I had melted down the gold, I took it to the Pope, who thanked me cordially for what I had done, and ordered the Cavalierino to give me twenty-five crowns, apologizing to me for his inability to give me more. A few days afterwards the articles of peace were signed. I went with three hundred comrades in the train of Signor Orazio Baglioni toward Perugia, and there he wished to make me captain of the company, but I was unwilling at the moment, saying that I wanted first to go and see my father, and to redeem the ban which was still in force against me at Florence. Signor Orazio told me that he had been appointed general of the Florentines, and Sir Pier Mario de Lotto, the envoy from Florence, was with him, to whom he specially recommended me as his man. In course of time I came to Florence in the company of several comrades. The plague was raging with indescribable fury. When I reached home I found my good father, who thought either that I must have been killed in the sack of Rome, or else that I should come back to him a beggar. However, I entirely defeated both these expectations, for I was alive, with plenty of money, a fellow to wait on me in a good horse. My joy on greeting the old man was so intense, that while he embraced and kissed me, I thought that I must die upon the spot. After I had narrated all the devilries of that dreadful sack, and had given him a good quantity of crowns which I had gained by my soldiering, and when we had exchanged our tokens of affection, he went off to the eight to redeem my ban. It so happened that one of those magistrates who sentenced me was now again a member of the board. It was the very man who had so inconsiderately told my father he meant to march me out into the country with the lances. My father took this opportunity of addressing him with some meaning words, in order to mark his revenge, relying on the favour which Orazio Baglioni showed me. Matters standing thus, I told my father how Signor Orazio had appointed me captain, and that I ought to begin to think of enlisting my company. At these words the poor old man was greatly disturbed, and begged me, for God's sake, not to turn my thoughts to such an enterprise, although he knew I should be fit for this or yet a greater business, adding that his other son, my brother, was already a most valiant soldier, and that I ought to pursue the noble art in which I had laboured so many years, and with such diligence of study. Although I promised to obey him, he reflected, like a man of sense, that if Signor Orazio came to Florence I could not withdraw myself from military service, partly because I had passed my word, as well as for other reasons. He therefore thought of a good expedient for sending me away, and spoke to me as follows. "'Oh, my dear son, 
The plague in this town is raging with immitigable violence, and I am always fancying you will come home infected with it. I remember, when I was a young man, that I went to Mantua, where I was very kindly received, and stayed there several years. I pray and command you, for the love of me, to pack off and go thither, and I would have you do this to-day rather than to-morrow. 40. I had always taken pleasure in seeing the world, and having never been to Mantua, I went there very willingly. Of the money I had brought to Florence, I left the greater part with my good father, promising to help him wherever I might be, and confiding him to the care of my elder sister. Her name was Cosa, and since she never cared to marry, she was admitted as a nun in Santa Orsola, but she put off taking the veil, in order to keep house for our old father, and to look after my younger sister, who was married to one Bartolomeo, a surgeon. So then, leaving home with my father's blessing, I mounted my good horse, and rode off on it to Mantua. It would take too long to describe that little journey in detail. The whole world being darkened over with plague and war, I had the greatest difficulty in reaching Mantua. However, in the end I got there, and looked about for work to do, which I obtained from a maestro Niccolo of Milan, goldsmith to the Duke of Mantua. Having thus settled down to work, I went after two days of work to visit Messer Guiello Romano, that most excellent painter, of whom I have already spoken, and my very good friend. He received me with the tenderest caresses, and took it very ill that I had not dismounted at his house. He was living like a lord, and executing a great work for the duke outside the city gates, in a place called Del Te. It was a vast and prodigious undertaking, as may still, I suppose, be seen by those who go there. Mr. Guiello lost no time in speaking of me to the duke in terms of the warmest praise. That prince commissioned me to make a model for a reliquary, to hold the blood of Christ, which they have there, and say was brought to them by Longinus. Then he turned to Guiello, bidding him to supply me with a design for it. To this Guiello replied, My lord, Benvenuto is a man who does not need other people's sketches, as your excellency will be very well able to judge, when you shall see his model. I set hand to the work, and made a drawing for the reliquary, well adapted to contain the sacred phial. Then I made a little waxen model of the cover. This was a seated Christ, supporting his great cross aloft with the left hand, while he seemed to lean against it, and with the fingers of his right hand he appeared to be opening the wound in his side. When it was finished, it pleased the duke so much that he heaped favours on me, and gave me to understand he would keep me in his service with such appointments as should enable me to live in affluence. Meanwhile I had paid my duty to the cardinal, his brother, who begged the duke to allow me to make the pontifical seat of his most reverend lordship. This I began, but while I was working at it I caught a quartan fever. During each access of this fever I was thrown into delirium, when I cursed Mantua and its master and whoever stayed there at his own liking. These words were reported to the duke by the Milanese goldsmith, who had not omitted to notice that the duke wanted to employ me. When the prince heard the ravings of my sickness, he flew into a passion against me, and I, being out of temper with Mantua, our bad feeling was reciprocal. The seal was finished after four months, together with several other little pieces I made for the duke under the name of the cardinal. His reverence paid me well, and bade me return to Rome, to that marvellous city where we had made acquaintance. I quitted Mantua with a good sum of crowns, and reached Scoverno, where the most valiant general Giovanni had been killed. Here I had a slight relapse of fever, which did not interrupt my journey, and coming now to an end it never returned on me again. When I arrived at Florence I hoped to find my dear father, and knocking at the door, a hump-backed woman in a fury showed her face at the window, she drove me off with a torrent of abuse, screaming that the sight of me was a consumption to her. To this misshapen hag I shouted, Ho! Tell me, cross-grained hunchback, is there no other face to see here but your ugly visage? No, and bad luck to you. Whereupon I answered in a loud voice, In less than two hours it may never vex us more. Attracted by this dispute, a neighbor put her head out, from whom I learned that my father and all the people in the house had died of the plague. As I had partly guessed it might be so, my grief was not so great as it would otherwise have been. The woman afterwards told me that only my sister Liparata had escaped, and that she had taken refuge with a pious lady named Mona Andrea de Bellacci. I took my way from thence to the inn, and met by accident a very dear friend of mine, Giovanni Rigogli. 
Dismounting at his house, we proceeded to the piazza, where I received intelligence that my brother was alive, and went to find him at the house of a friend of his called Bertino Aldobrandini. On meeting, we made demonstrations of the most passionate affection, for he had heard that I was dead, and I had heard that he was dead, and so our joy at embracing one another was extravagant. Then he broke out into a loud fit of laughter, and said, "'Come, brother, I will take you where I'm sure you'd never guess. You must know that I have given our sister Liparata away again in marriage, and she holds it for absolute certain that you are dead. On our way we told each other all the wonderful adventures we had met with, and when we reached the house where our sister dwelt, the surprise of seeing me alive threw her into a fainting fit, and she fell senseless in my arms. Had not my brother been present, her speechlessness and sudden seizure must have made her husband imagine I was some one different from a brother, as indeed at first it did. Cecchino, however, explained matters, and busied himself in helping the swooning woman, who soon came to. Then, after shedding some tears for father, sister, husband, and a little son whom she had lost, she began to get the supper ready, and during our merry meeting, all that evening, we talked no more about dead folk, but rather discoursed gaily about weddings. Then, with gladness and great enjoyment, we brought our supper party to an end. 41. On the entreaty of my brother and sister, I remained at Florence, though my own inclination led me to return to Rome. The dear friend also, who had helped me in some of my earlier troubles, as I have narrated, I mean Piero, son of Giovanni Landi, he too advised me to make some stay in Florence, for the Medici were in exile, that is to say, Signor Ippolito and Signor Alessandro, who were afterwards respectively Cardinal and Duke of Florence, and he judged it would be well for me to wait and see what happened. At that time there arrived in Florence a Sienese, called Girolamo Meretti, who had lived long in Turkey and was a man of lively intellect. He came to my shop, and commissioned me to make a golden medal to be worn in the hat. The subject was to be Hercules wrenching the lion's mouth. While I was working at this piece, Michael Angelo Bunerati came oftentimes to see it. I had spent infinite pains upon the design, so that the attitude of the figure and the fierce passion of the beast were executed in quite a different style from that of any craftsman who had hitherto attempted such groups. This, together with the fact that, that the special branch of art was totally unknown to Michelangelo, made the divine master give such praises to my work that I felt incredibly inspired for further effort. However, I found little else to do but jewel-setting, and though I gained more thus than in any other way, yet I was dissatisfied, for I would fain have been employed upon some higher task than that of setting precious stones. Just then I met with Federigo Ginori, a young man of a very lofty spirit. He had lived some years in Naples, and being endowed with great charms of person and presence, had been the lover of a Neapolitan princess. He wanted to have a medal made, with Atlas bearing the world upon his shoulders, and applied to Michelangelo for a design. Michelangelo made this answer, Go and find out a young goldsmith named Benvenuto. He will serve you admirably, and certainly he does not stand in need of sketches by me. However, to prevent your thinking that I want to save myself the trouble of so slight a matter, I will gladly sketch you something, but meanwhile speak to Benvenuto, and let him also make a model. He can then execute the better of the two designs. Federigo Ginori came to me, and told me what he wanted, adding thereto how Michelangelo had praised me, and how he had suggested I should make a wax and model, while he undertook to supply a sketch. The words of that great man so heartened me, that I set myself to work at once with eagerness upon the model, and when I had finished it, a painter who was intimate with Michelangelo, called Giuliano Bugiardini, brought me the drawing of Atlas. On the same occasion I showed Giuliano my little model in wax, which was very different from Michelangelo's drawing, and Federigo, in concert with Bugiardini, agreed that I should work upon my model. So I took it in hand, and when Michelangelo saw it, he praised me through the skies. This was a figure, as I have said, chiseled on a plate of gold. Atlas had the heaven upon his back, made out of a crystal ball, engraved with the zodiac upon a field of lapis lazuli. The whole composition produced an indescribably fine effect, and under it ran the legend Summa Tulis Juvat. Federigo was so thoroughly well pleased that he paid me very liberally. Al Luigi Almani was at that time in Florence. Federigo Ginori, who enjoyed his friendship, brought him often to my workshop, and through this introduction we became very intimate together. End of chapter thirty eight through forty one.
Chapters forty two through forty five of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume One, translated by John Addington Simons. Chapter forty two through forty five. Forty two. Pope Clement had now declared war upon the city of Florence, which thereupon was put in a state of defence, and the militia being organised in each quarter of the town, I too received orders to serve in my turn. I provided myself with a rich outfit, and went about with the highest nobility of Florence, who showed a unanimous desire to fight for the defence of our liberties. Meanwhile the speeches which are usual upon such occasions were made in every quarter. The young men met together more than was their wont, and everywhere we had but one topic of conversation. It happened one day, about noon, that a crowd of tall men and lusty young fellows, the first in the city, were assembled in my workshop, when a letter from Rome was put into my hands. It came from a man called Maestro Giacopini della Barca. His real name was Giacopa della Scurini, but they called him della Barca in Rome because he kept a ferry-boat upon the Tiber between Pontsisto and Ponte Sant'Angelo. He was a person of considerable talent, distinguished by his pleasantries and striking conversation, and he had formerly been a designer of patterns for the cloth-weavers in Florence. This man was intimate with the Pope, who took great pleasure in hearing him talk. Being one day engaged in conversation, they touched upon the sack and the defence of the castle. This brought me to the Pope's mind, and he spoke of me in the very highest terms, adding that if he knew where I was, he should be glad to get me back. Maestro Giacopo said I was in Florence, whereupon the Pope bade the man write and tell me to return to him. The letter I have mentioned was to the effect that I should do well if I resumed the service of Clement, and that this was sure to turn out to my advantage. The young men who were present were curious to know what the letter contained, wherefore I concealed it as well as I could. Afterwards I wrote to Maestro Giacopo, begging him by no means, whether for good or evil, to write to me again. He, however, grew more obstinate in his officiousness, and wrote me another letter, so extravagantly worded, that if it had been seen, I should have got into serious trouble. The substance of it was that the Pope required me to come at once, wanting to employ me on a work of the greatest consequence, also that if I wished to act aright, I ought to throw up everything, and not to stand against a pope in the party of those hair-brained radicals. This letter, when I read it, put me in such a fright that I went to seek my dear friend Piero Landi. Directly he set his eyes on me, he asked what accident had happened to upset me so. I told my friend that it was quite impossible for me to explain what lay upon my mind, and what was causing me this trouble, only I entreated him to take the keys I gave him, and to return the gems and gold in my drawers to such and such persons, whose names he would find inscribed upon my memorandum book. Next I begged him to pack up the furniture of my house, and keep account of it with his usual loving-kindness, and in a few days he should hear where I was. The prudent young man, guessing perhaps pretty nearly how the matter stood, replied, My brother, go your way quickly, then write to me, and have no further care about your things. I did as he advised. He was the most loyal friend, the wisest, the most worthy, the most discreet, the most affectionate that I have ever known. I left Florence and went to Rome, and from there I wrote to him. 43. Upon my arrival at Rome, I found several of my former friends, by whom I was very well received and kindly entertained. No time was lost before I set myself to work at things which brought me profit, but were not notable enough to be described. There was a fine old man, a goldsmith, called Raffaello del Moro, who had considerable reputation in the trade, and was to boot a very worthy fellow. He begged me to consent to enter his workshop, saying he had some commissions of importance to execute, on which high profits might be looked for, so I accepted his proposal with good will. More than ten days had elapsed, and I had not presented myself to Maestro Giacopina della Barca. Meeting me one day by accident, he gave me a hearty welcome, and asked me how long I had been in Rome. When I told him I had been there about a fortnight, he took it very ill, and said that I showed little esteem for a pope who urgently compelled him to write three times for me. I, who had taken his persistence in the matter still more ill, made no reply, but swallowed down my irritation. 
The man, who suffered from a flux of words, began one of his long yarns, and went on talking, till at last, when I saw him tired out, I merely said that he might bring me to the Pope when he saw fit. He answered that any time would do for him, and I, that I was always ready. So we took our way toward the palace. It was a Maundy Thursday, and when we reached the apartments of the Pope, he being known there, and I expected, we were at once admitted. The Pope was in bed, suffering from a slight indisposition, and he had with him Messer Jacopi Salviati and the Archbishop of Capua. When the Pope set eyes on me, he was exceedingly glad. I kissed his feet, and then as humbly as I could drew near to him, which let him understand that I had things of consequence to utter. On this he waved his hand, and the two prelates retired to a distance from us. I began at once to speak. Most blessed Father, from the time of the sack up to this hour, I have never been able to confess or to communicate, because they refuse me absolution. The case is this. When I melted down the gold and worked at the unsetting of those jewels, your holiness ordered the cavalierino to give me a modest reward for my labors, of which I received nothing, but on the contrary he rather paid me with abuse. When then I ascended to the chamber where I had melted down the gold, and washed the ashes, I found about a pound and a half of gold in tiny grains like millet seeds, and inasmuch as I had not muddy enough to take me home respectably, I thought I would avail myself of this, and give it back again when opportunity should offer. Now I am here at the feet of your holiness, who is the only true confessor. I entreat you to do me the favor of granting me indulgence, so that I may be able to confess and communicate, and by the grace of your holiness regain the grace of my Lord God. Upon this the Pope, with a scarcely perceptible sigh, remembering, perhaps, his former trials, spoke as follows. Benvenuto, I thoroughly believe what you tell me. It is in my power to absolve you of any unbecoming deed you may have done, and what is more, I have the will. So, then, speak out with frankness and perfect confidence, for if you had taken the value of a whole tiara, I am quite ready to pardon you. Thereupon I answered, I took nothing, most blessed father, but what I have confessed and this did not amount to the value of one hundred and forty ducats, for that was the sum I received from the mint in Perugia, and with it I went home to comfort my poor old father. The Pope said, Your father has been as virtuous, good, and worthy a man as was ever born, and you have not degenerated from him. I am very sorry that the money was so little, but, such as you say it was, I make you a present of it, and give you my full pardon. Assure your confessor of this, if there is nothing else upon your conscience which concerns me. Afterwards, when you have confessed and communicated, you shall present yourself to me again, and it will be to your advantage. When I parted from the Pope, Messer Jacopo and the Archbishop approached, and the Pope spoke to them in the highest terms imaginable about me. He said that he had confessed and absolved me. Then he commissioned the Archbishop of Capua to send for me, and ask if I had any other need beyond this matter, giving him full leave to absolve me amply, and bidding him, moreover, treat me with the utmost kindness. While I was walking away with Maestro Jacopino, he asked me very inquisitively what was the close and lengthy conversation I had with His Holiness. After he had repeated the question more than twice, I said that I did not mean to tell him, because they were matters with which he had nothing to do, and therefore he need not go on asking me. Then I went to do what had been agreed on with the Pope, and after the two festivals were over, I again presented myself before His Holiness. He received me even better than before, and said, If you had come a little earlier to Rome, I should have commissioned you to restore my two tiaras, which were pulled to pieces in the castle. These, however, with the exception of the gems, are objects of little artistic interest, so I will employ you on a piece of the very greatest consequence, where you will be able to exhibit all your talents. It is a button for my priest's cope, which has to be made round like a trencher, and as big as a little trencher, one-third of a cubit wide. Upon this I want you to represent God the Father in half-relief, and in the middle to set that magnificent big diamond, which you remember, together with several other gems of the greatest value. Caradoso began to make me one, but did not finish it. I want yours to be finished quickly, so that I may enjoy the use of it a little while. Go, then, and make me a fine model. He had all the jewels shown to me, and then I went off like a shot to set myself to work. 44. During the time when Florence was besieged, Federigo Ginori, for whom I made that medal of Atlas, died of consumption, and the medal came into the hands of Messer Luigi Alamani, who after a little while took it to present in person to Francis, King of France, 
accompanied by some of his own finest compositions. The king was exceedingly delighted with the gift, whereupon Messer Luigi told his majesty so much about my personal qualities, as well as my art, and spoke so favorably, that the king expressed a wish to know me. Meanwhile I pushed my model for the button forward with all the diligence I could, constructing it exactly of the size which the jewel itself was meant to have. In the trade of the goldsmiths it roused considerable jealousy among those who thought they were capable of matching it. A certain Micheletto had just come to Rome. He was very clever at engraving Cornelians, and was moreover a most intelligent jeweller, an old man of great celebrity. He had been employed upon the Pope's tiaras, and while I was working at my model he wondered much that I had not applied to him, being as he was a man of intelligence and of large credit with the Pope. At last, when he saw that I was not coming to him, he came to me, and asked me what I was about. "'What the Pope has ordered me,' I answered. Then he said, "'The Pope has commissioned me to superintend everything which is being made for His Holiness.' I only replied that I would ask the Pope, and then should know what answer I ought to give him. He told me that I should repent, and, departing in anger, had an interview with all the masters of the art. They deliberated on the matter, and charged Michel with the conduct of the whole affair." As was to be expected from a person of his talents, he ordered more than thirty drawings to be made, all differing in their details, for the piece the Pope had commissioned. Having already access to His Holiness's ear, he took into his council another jeweller, named Pompeo, a Milanese, who was in favour with the Pope, and related to Messer Traiano, the first chamberlain of the court. These two together, then, began to insinuate they had seen my model, and did not think me up to a work of such extraordinary import. The Pope replied that he would also have to see it, and that if he then found me unfit for the purpose, he should look around for one who was fit. Both of them put in that they had several excellent designs ready, to which the Pope made answer, that he was very pleased to hear it, but that he did not care to look at them till I had completed my model. Afterwards he would take them all into consideration at the same time. After a few days I finished my model, and took it to the Pope one morning, when Messer Traiano made me wait till he had sent for Micheletto and Pompeo, bidding them make haste and bring their drawings. On their arrival we were introduced, and Micheletto and Pompeo immediately unrolled their papers, which the Pope inspected. The draftsmen who had been employed were not in the jeweller's trade, and therefore knew nothing about giving their right place to precious stones, and jewellers on their side had not shown them how for I ought to say that a jeweller, when he has to work with figures, must of necessity understand design, else he cannot produce anything worth looking at. And so it turned out that all of them had stuck that famous diamond in the middle of the breast of God the Father. The Pope, who was an excellent connoisseur, observing this mistake, approved of none of them, and when he had looked at about ten, he flung the rest down, and said to me, who was standing at a distance, now show me your model, Benvenuto, so that I may see if you have made the same mistake as these fellows. I came forward and opened a little round box, whereupon one would have thought that a light from heaven had struck the Pope's eyes. He cried aloud, If you had been in my own body you could not have done it better, as this proves. Those men there have found the right way to bring shame upon themselves. A crowd of great lords pressing round, the Pope pointed out the difference between my model and the drawings. When he had sufficiently commended it, the others, standing terrified and stupid before him, he turned to me and said, I am only afraid of one thing, and that is of the utmost consequence. Friend Benvenuto, wax is easy to work in. The real difficulty is to execute this in gold. To those words I answered, without moment's hesitation, Most blessed Father, if I do not work it ten times better than the model, let it be agreed beforehand that you pay me nothing. When they heard this, the nobleman made a great stir crying out that I was promising too much. Among them was an eminent philosopher who spoke out in my favour. From the fine physiognomy and bodily symmetry which I observed in this young man, I predict that he will accomplish what he says, and think that he will even go beyond it. The Pope put in, And this is my opinion also. Then he called his chamberlain, Messer Traiano, and bade him bring five hundred golden ducats of the camera. While we were waiting for the money, the Pope turned once more to gaze at leisure on the dexterous device I had employed for combining the diamond with the figure of God the Father. I had put the diamond exactly in the centre of the piece, and above it God the Father was shown seated, leaning nobly in a sideways attitude, which made a perfect composition and did not interfere with the stone's effect. Lifting his right hand, he was in the act of giving the benediction. 
Below the diamond I had placed three children, who, with their arms upraised, were supporting the jewel. One of them, in the middle, was in full relief, the other two in half-relief. All around I set a crowd of cherubs, in diverse attitudes, adapted to the other gems. A mantle undulated to the wind about the figure of God the Father, from the folds of which cherubs peeped out, and there were other ornaments besides which made a very beautiful effect. The work was executed in white stucco on a black stone. When the money came, the Pope gave it to me with his own hand, and begged me in the most winning terms to let him have it finished in his own days, adding that this should be to my advantage. 45. I took the money and the model home, and was in the utmost impatience to begin my work. After I had labored diligently for eight days, the Pope sent word by one of his chamberlains, a very great gentleman of Bologna, that I was to come to him and bring what I had got in hand. On the way, the chamberlain, who was the most gentle-mannered person in the Roman court, told me that the Pope not only wanted to see what I was doing, but also intended to entrust me with another task of the highest consequence, which was, in fact, to furnish dyes for the money of the mint, and bade me arm myself beforehand with the answer I should give. In short, he wished me to be prepared, and therefore he had spoken. When we came into the presence I lost no time in exhibiting the golden plate, upon which I had as yet carved nothing but my figure of God the Father, but this, though only in the rough, displayed a grander style than that of the waxen model. The Pope regarded it with stupefaction, and exclaimed, From this moment forward I will believe everything you say. Then, loading me with marks of favor, he added, It is my intention to give you another commission, which, if you feel competent to execute it, I shall have no less at heart than this or more." He proceeded to tell me that he wished to make dies for the coinage of his realm, and asked if I had ever tried my hand at such things, and if I had the courage to attempt them. I answered that of courage for the task I had no lack, and that I had seen how dies were made, but that I had not ever made any. There was in the presence a certain Messer Tommaso, of Prado, His Holiness's datary, and this man, being a friend of my enemies, put in, Most blessed father, the favors you are showering upon this young man— and he, by nature so extremely overbold, are enough to make him promise you a new world. You have already given him one great task, and now, by adding a greater, you are alike to make them clash together. The Pope, in a rage, turned round on him, and told him to mind his own business. Then he commanded me to make the model for a broad doubloon of gold, upon which he wanted a naked Christ with his hands tied, and the inscription, Echo Homo, the reverse was to have a pope and emperor in the act of propping up a cross which seemed to fall, and this legend, Unus Spiritus et Una Fides Erat in Es. After the pope had ordered this handsome coin, Bandanello the sculptor came up. He had not yet been made a knight, and with his wonted presumption muffled up in ignorance, said, For these goldsmiths one must make drawings for such fine things as that. I turned round upon him in a moment, and cried out that I did not want his drawings for my art but that I hoped before very long to give his art some trouble by my drawings. The Pope expressed high satisfaction at these words, and turning to me said, Go then, my Benvenuto, and devote yourself with spirit to my service, and do not lend an ear to the chattering of these silly fellows. So I went off, and very quickly made two dies of steel. Then I stamped a coin in gold, and one Sunday after dinner took the coin and the dies to the Pope, who, when he saw the piece, was astonished and greatly gratified not only because my work pleased him excessively, but also because of the rapidity with which I had performed it. For the further satisfaction and amazement of his holiness, I had brought with me all the old coins which in former times had been made by those able men who served popes Julio and Leo, and when I noticed that mine pleased him far better, I drew forth from my bosom a patent, in which I prayed for the post of stamp-master in the mint. This place was worth six golden crowns a month in addition to the dies, which were paid at the rate of a ducat for three by the master of the mint. The Pope took my patent and handed it to the datary, telling him to lose no time in dispatching the business. The datary began to put it in his pocket, saying, Most blessed Father, your holiness ought not to go so fast. These are matters which deserve some reflection. To this the Pope replied, I have heard what you have got to say. Give me here that patent. He took it and signed it at once, with his own hand, then, giving it back, added, Now you have no answer left. See that you dispatch it at once, for this is my pleasure, and Benvenuto's shoes are worth the eyes of all those other blockheads. 
So, having thanked His Holiness, I went back, rejoicing above measure, to my work. End of chapters 42 through 45《ポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキャストのポッドキ I was still working in the shop of Raffaello del Moro. This worthy man had a very beautiful young daughter, with regard to whom he had designs on me, and I, becoming partly aware of his intentions, was very willing. But while indulging such desires, I made no show of them. On the contrary, I was so discreet in my behavior that I made him wonder. It so happened that the poor girl was attacked by a disorder in her right hand, which ate into the two bones belonging to the little finger and the next. Owing to her father's carelessness, she had been treated by an ignorant quack doctor, who predicted that the poor child would be crippled in the whole of her right arm, if even nothing worse should happen. When I noticed the dismay of her father, I begged him not to believe all that this ignorant doctor had said. He replied that he had no acquaintance with physicians or with surgeons, and entreated me, if I knew of one, to bring him to the house. I sent at once for a certain Maestro Giacomo of Perugia. A man of great skill in surgery, who examined the poor girl. She was dreadfully frightened through having gained some inkling of the quack's predictions, whereas my intelligent doctor declared she would suffer nothing of consequence, and would be very well able to use her right hand, also that though the last two fingers must remain somewhat weaker than the others, this would be of no inconvenience at all to her. So he began his treatment, and after a few days, when he was going to extract a portion of the diseased bones, Her father called for me, and begged me to be present at the operation. Maestro Giacomo was using some coarse steel instruments, and when I observed that he was making little way, and at the same time was inflicting severe pain on the patient, I begged him to stop and wait half a quarter of an hour for me. I ran into the shop and made a little scalping iron of steel, extremely thin and curved. It cut like a razor. On my return, the surgeon used it, and began to work with so gentle a hand that she felt no pain, and in a short while the operation was over. In consequence of this service, and for other reasons, the worthy man conceived for me as much love, or more, as he had for two male children, and in the meanwhile he attended to the cure of his beautiful young daughter. I was on terms of the closest intimacy with one Messer Giovanni Gatti, who was a clerk of the camera, and a great connoisseur of the arts, although he had no practical acquaintance with any. In his household were a certain Messer Giovanni, a Greek of eminent learning, Master Lodovico of Fano, no less distinguished as a man of letters, Messer Antonio Allegretti, and Messer Annabel Caro, at that time in his early manhood. Messer Bastiano of Venice, a most excellent painter, and I were admitted to their society, and almost every day we met together in Messer Giovanni's company. Being aware of this intimacy, the worthy goldsmith Raffaello said to Messer Giovanni, Good sir, you know me. Now I want to marry my daughter to Benvenuto, and can think of no better intermediary than your worship. So I am come to crave your assistance, and to beg you to name for her such dowry from my estate as you may think suitable. The light headed man hardly let my good friend finish what he had to say, before he put in, quite at random, Talk no more about it, Raffaello. You are farther from your object than January from mulberries. The poor man, utterly discouraged, looked about at once for another husband for his girl, while she and the mother and all the family lived on in a bad humor with me. Since I did not know the real cause of this, I imagined they were paying me with bastard coin for the many kindnesses I had shown them, I conceived the thought of opening a workshop of my own in their neighborhood. Messer Giovanni told me nothing till the girl was married, which happened in a few months. Meanwhile, I labored assiduously at the work I was doing for the Pope, and also in the service of the Mint, for His Holiness had ordered another coin, of the value of two carlins, on which his own portrait was stamped, while the reverse bore a figure of Christ upon the waters, holding out his hand to St. Peter, with this inscription, Quare dubitasti. My design won such applause that a certain secretary of the Pope, a man of the greatest talent, called Il Sanga, was moved to this remark. 
your holiness can boast of having a currency superior to any of the ancients in all their glory. The Pope replied, Benvenuto, for his part, can boast of serving an emperor like me, who is able to discern his merit. I went on at my great piece in gold, showing it frequently to the Pope, who was very eager to see it, and each time expressed greater admiration. 47. My brother at this period was also in Rome, serving Duke Alessandro, on whom the Pope had recently conferred the Duchy of Penna. This prince kept in his service a multitude of soldiers, worthy fellows, brought up to valour in the school of that famous general Giovanni de' Medici, and among these was my brother, whom the Duke esteemed as highly as the bravest of them. One day my brother went after dinner to the shop of a man called Bacino della Croce in the Banchi, which all those men-at-arms frequented. He had flung himself upon a settee, and was sleeping. Just then the guard of the Bargello passed by. They were taking to prison a certain Captain Sisti, a Lombard, who had also been a member of Giovanni's troop, but was not in the service of the Duke. The captain, Catavanzi degli Strozzi, chanced to be in the same shop, and when Sisti caught sight of him he whispered, I was bringing you those crowns I owed. If you want them, come for them before they go with me to prison. Now Catavanzi had a way of putting his neighbors to the push, not caring to hazard his own person. So finding there around him several young fellows of the highest daring, more eager than apt for so serious an enterprise, he bade them catch up Captain Sisti and get the money from him, and if the guard resisted, overpower the men, provided they had pluck enough to do so. The young men were but four, and all four of them without a beard. The first was called Bertino Aldobrandi, another Anguillato of Lucca. I cannot recall the names of the rest. Bertino had been trained like a pupil by my brother, and my brother felt the most unbounded love for him. So then off dashed the four brave lads, and came up with the guard of the Bargello, upwards of fifty constables counting pikes, arquebuses, and two-handed swords. After a few words they drew their weapons, and the four boys so harried the guard, that if Captain Cadavanzi had but shown his face, without so much as a drawing, they would certainly have put the whole pack to flight. But delay spoiled all, for Bertino received some ugly wounds and fell. At the same time, Anguillato was also hit in the right arm and being unable to use his sword, got out of the fray as well as he was able. The others did the same. Bertino Aldebrandi was lifted from the ground seriously injured. Note. The Bargello was the chief constable or sheriff in Italian towns. I shall call him Bargello always in my translation, since any English equivalent would be misleading. He did the rough work of policing the city, and was consequently a mark for all the men of spirit who disliked being kept in order. Giovio, in his life of Cardinal Pompeo Colonna, quite gravely relates how it was the highest ambition of a young Romans of spirit to murder the Bargello. He mentions in particular a certain Pietro Margiano, who had acquired great fame and popularity by killing the Bargello of his city, one Senzio, in the Campo di Fiore. This man became an outlaw, and was favorably received by Cardinal Colonna, then at war with Clement the Seventh. 48. While these things were happening, we were all at table, for that morning we had dined more than an hour later than usual. On hearing the commotion, one of the old man's sons, the elder, rose from table to go and look at the scuffle. He was called Giovanni, and I said to him, For heaven's sake don't go. In such matters one is always certain to lose, while there is nothing to be gained. His father spoke to like purpose, Pray, my son, don't go. But the lad, without heeding any one, ran down the stairs. Reaching the Banchi, where the great scrimmage was, and seeing Bertino lifted from the ground, he ran towards home, and met my brother Cecchino on the way, who, who asked what was the matter. Though some of the bystanders signed to Giovanni not to tell Cecchino, he cried out like a madman how it was that Bertino Aldebrandi had been killed by the guard. My poor brother gave vent to a bellow which might have been heard ten miles away. Then he turned to Giovanni, Ah, me! But could you tell me which of these men killed him for me? Giovanni said, yes, that it was a man who had a big two-handed sword, with a blue feather in his bonnet. My poor brother rushed ahead, and having recognized the homicide by those signs, he threw himself with all his dash and spirit into the middle of the band, and before the man could turn on guard, ran him right through the guts, and with the sword's hilt thrust him to the ground. Then he turned upon the rest with such energy and daring, that his one arm was on the point of putting the whole band to flight, had it not been that, while wheeling round to strike an arquebusier, 
this man fired in self-defense, and hit the brave and fortunate young fellow above the knee of his right leg. While he lay stretched upon the ground, the constable scrambled off in disorder as fast as they were able, lest a pair to my brother should arrive upon the scene. Noticing that the tumult was not subsiding, I too rose from the table, and girding on my sword, for everybody wore one then, I went to the bridge of St. Angelo, where I saw a group of several men assembled. On my coming up and being recognized by some of them, they gave way before me, and showed me what I least of all things wished to see, albeit I made mighty haste to view the sight. On the instant I did not know Cecchino, since he was wearing a different suit of clothes from that in which I had lately seen him. Accordingly he recognized me first, and said, "'Dearest brother, do not be upset by my grave accident. It is only what might be expected in my profession. Get me removed from here at once, for I have but a few hours to live.' They had acquainted me with the whole event while he was speaking, in brief words befitting such occasion. So I answered, Brother, this is the greatest sorrow and the greatest trial that could happen to me in the whole course of my life. But be of good cheer, for before you lose sight of him who did the mischief, you shall see yourself revenged by my hand. Our words on both sides were to the purport, but of the shortest. 49. The guard was now about fifty paces from us, for Mafio, their officer, had made some of them turn back to take up the corporal my brother killed. Accordingly, I quickly traversed that short space, wrapped in my cape, which I had tightened round me, and came up with Mafio, whom I should most certainly have murdered, for there were plenty of people round, and I had wound my way among them. With the rapidity of lightning I had half drawn my sword from the sheaf, when Berlinguer Berlingieri, a young man of the greatest daring and my good friend, threw himself from behind upon my arms. He had four other fellows of like kidney with him, who cried out to Mafio, Away with you, for this man here alone was killing you. He asked, Who is he? And they said, Own brother to the man you see there. Without waiting to hear more, he made haste for Torre di Nona, and they said, Benvenuto, we prevented you against your will, but did it for your own good. Now let us go to succor him who must die shortly. Accordingly, we turned and went back to my brother, whom I had at once conveyed into a house. The doctors who were called in consultation treated him with medicaments, but could not decide to amputate the leg, which might perhaps have saved him. As soon as his wound had been dressed, Duke Alessandro appeared and most affectionately greeted him. My brother had not as yet lost consciousness, so he said to the Duke, My lord, this only grieves me, that your excellency is losing a servant than whom you may perchance to find men more valiant in the profession of arms, but none more lovingly and loyally devoted to your service than I have been. The Duke bade him do all he could to keep alive. For the rest, he well knew him to be a man of worth and courage. He then turned to his attendants, ordering them to see that the brave young fellow wanted for nothing. When he was gone, my brother lost blood so copiously, for nothing could be done to stop it, that he went off his head, and kept raving all the following night, with the exception that once, when they wanted to give him the communion, he said, you would have done well to confess me before. Now it is impossible that I should receive the divine sacrament in this already ruined frame. It will be enough if I partake of it by the divine virtue of the eyesight, whereby it shall be transmitted into my immortal soul, which only prays to him for mercy and forgiveness. Having spoken thus, the host was elated, but he straightway relapsed into the same delirious ravings as before, pouring forth a torrent of the most terrible frenzies and horrible imprecations that the mind of man could imagine. Nor did he cease once all that night until the day broke. When the sun appeared above our horizon, he turned to me and said, Brother, I do not wish to stay here longer, for these fellows will end by making me do something tremendous, which may cause them to repent of the annoyance they have given me. Then he kicked out both his legs, the injured limb we had enclosed in a very heavy box, and made as though he would fling it across a horse's back. Turning his face round to me, he called out thrice, Farewell, farewell, and with the last word that most valiant spirit passed away. At the proper hour, toward nightfall, I had him buried with due ceremony in the church of the Florentines, and afterwards I erected to his memory a very handsome monument of marble, upon which I caused trophies and banners to be carved. I must not omit to mention that one of his friends had asked him who was the man that had killed him, and if he could recognize him, to which he answered that he could, and gave his description. My brother indeed attempted to prevent this coming to my ears, but I got it very well impressed upon my mind, as will appear in the sequel. 50. 
Returning to the monument, I should relate that certain famous men of letters, who knew my brother, composed for me an epitaph, telling me that the noble young man deserved it. The inscription ran thus. Francisco Celino Florentino, qui quod in teneris annis ad ionum, medicum ducum pluris victorius retulit et signifier fruit, facile documentum dedit quante fortitudinis et consili vir futuris erat, ni crudelis fati archbusio transfossis, quinto atelis rostro jusseret, benvenutus frater posuit, abiet dei, twenty-seven May, fifteen twenty-nine. He was twenty-five years of age, and since the soldiers called him Cicino del Pifero, his real name being Giovan Freschino Cellini, I wanted to engrave the former, by which he was commonly known, under the armorial bearings of our family. This name I had then cut in fine antique characters, all of which were broken save the first and last. I was asked by the learned men who had composed that beautiful epitaph, wherefore I used these broken letters, and my answer was, because the marvellous framework of his body was spoiled and dead, and the reason why the first and last remained entire, was that the first should symbolize the great gift God had given him, namely, of a human soul, inflamed with his divinity, the which hath never broken, while the second represented the glorious renown of his brave actions. The thought gave satisfaction, and several persons have since availed themselves of my device. Close to the name I had the coat of us Cellini carved upon the stone, altering it in some particulars. In Ravenna, which is a most ancient city, there exists Cellini of our name, in the quality of very honourable gentry, who bear a lion rampant oar upon a field of azure, holding a lily gules in his dexter paw, with a label in chief and three little lilies oar. These are the true arms of the Cellini. My father showed me a shield as ours which had the paw only, together with the other bearings, but I should prefer to follow those of the Cellini of Ravenna, which I have described above. Now, to return to what I caused to be engraved upon my brother's tomb, it was the lion's paw, but instead of a lily I made the lion hold an axe, with the field of the scutcheon quartered, and I put the axe in solely that I might not be unmindful to revenge him. 51. I went on applying myself with the utmost diligence upon the gold work for Pope Clement's button, he was very eager to have it, and used to send for me two or three times a week, in order to inspect it, and his delight in the work always increased. Often he would rebuke and scold me, as it were, for the great grief in which my brother's loss had plunged me, and one day, observing me more downcast and out of trim than was proper, he cried aloud, Benvenuto, oh, I did not know that you were mad. Have you only just learned that there is no remedy against death? One would think you were trying to run after him. When I left the presence I continued working at the jewel and the dyes, for the mint, but I also took to watching the arquebusier who shot my brother, as though he had been a girl I was in love with. The man had formerly been in the light cavalry, but afterwards had joined the arquebusiers as one of the Bargello's corporals, and what increased my rage was that he had used these boastful words, if it had not been for me who killed that brave young man, the least trifle of delay would have resulted in his putting us all to flight with great disaster. When I saw that the fever caused by always seeing him about was depriving me of sleep and appetite, and was bringing me by degrees to sorry plight, I overcame my repugnance to so low and not quite praiseworthy an enterprise, and made up my mind one evening to rid myself of the torment. The fellow lived in a house near a place called Torre Sanguiga, next door to the lodging of one of the most fashionable courtesans in Rome, named Signora Antea. It had just struck twenty-four, and he was standing at the house-door, with his sword in hand, having risen from supper. With great address I stole up to him, holding a large pistogen dagger, and dealt him a back-handed stroke, with which I meant to cut his head clean off, but as he turned round very suddenly, the blow fell upon the point of his left shoulder and broke the bone. He sprang up, dropped his sword, half stunned with the great pain, and took to flight. I followed after, and in four steps caught him up, when I lifted my dagger above his head, which he was holding very low, and hit him in the back exactly at the juncture of the nape bone and the neck. The poniard entered this point so deep into the bone, that although I used all my strength to pull it out, I was not able. 
for just at that moment four soldiers with drawn swords sprang out from Antea's lodging, and obliged me to set hand to my own sword to defend my life. Leaving the poniard then, I made off, and fearing I might be recognized, took refuge in the palace of Duke Alessandro, which was between Piazza Navona and the Rotunda. On my arrival I asked to see the Duke, who told me that, if I was alone, I need only keep quiet and have no further anxiety, but to go on working at the jewel which the Pope had set his heart on, and stay eight days indoors. He gave this advice the more securely, because the soldiers had now arrived who interrupted the completion of my deed, they held the dagger in their hand, and were relating how the matter happened, and the great trouble they had to pull the weapon from the neck and head-bone of the man, whose name they did not know. Just then Giovan Bendini came up, and said to them, "'That poniard is mine, and I lent it to Benvenuto, who was bent on revenging his brother.' The soldiers were profuse in their expressions of regret at having interrupted me, although my vengeance had been amply satisfied." More than eight days elapsed, and the Pope did not send for me according to his custom. Afterwards he summoned me through his chamberlain, the Bolognese nobleman I have already mentioned, who let me, in his own modest manner, understand that his holiness knew all, but was very well inclined toward me, and that I only had to mind my work and keep quiet. When we reached the presence, the Pope cast so menacing a glance towards me that the mere look of his eyes made me tremble. Afterwards, upon examining my work, his countenance cleared, and he began to praise me beyond measure, saying that I had done a vast amount in a short time. Then, looking me straight in the face, he added, Now that you are cured, Benvenuto, take heed how you live. I, who understood his meaning, promised that I would. Immediately upon this I opened a very fine shop in the Banchi, opposite Raffaello, and there I finished the jewel after the lapse of a few months. End of chapters 46 through 51「Chapters 52 through 56 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lazarus The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1 Translated by John Addington Simmons Chapters 52 through 56 The Pope had sent me all those precious stones, except the diamond, which was pawned to certain Genoese bankers for some pressing needs he had of money. The rest were in my custody, together with a model of the diamond. I had five excellent journeymen, and in addition to the great piece, I was engaged on several jobs so that my shop contained property of much value in jewels, gems, and gold and silver. I kept a shaggy dog, very big and handsome, which Duke Alessandro gave me. The beast was capital as a retriever, since he brought me every sort of bird and game I shot, but he also served most admirably for a watchdog. It happened, as was natural at the age of twenty-nine, that I had taken into my service a girl of great beauty and grace, whom I used as a model in my art, and who was also complacent of her personal favours to me. Such being the case, I occupied an apartment far away from my workmen's rooms, as well as from the shop, and this communicated by a little dark passage with the maid's bedroom. I used frequently to pass the night with her, and though I sleep as lightly as ever yet did man upon this earth, yet after indulgence in sexual pleasure, my slumber is sometimes very deep and heavy. So it chanced one night, for I must say that a thief, under the pretext of being a goldsmith, had spied on me, and cast his eyes upon the precious stones, and made a plan to steal them. Well, then, this fellow broke into the shop where he found a quantity of little things in gold and silver. He was engaged in bursting open certain boxes to get at the jewels he had noticed, when my dog jumped upon him and put him to much trouble to defend himself with his sword. The dog, unable to grapple with an armed man, ran several times through the house and rushed into the rooms of the journeyman, which had been left open because of the great heat. 
When he found they paid no heed to his loud barking, he dragged their bedclothes off, and when they still heard nothing, he pulled first one and then another by the arm till he roused them, and, barking furiously, ran before to show them where he wanted them to go. At last it became clear that they refused to follow, for the traitors cross at being disturbed through stones and sticks at him, and this they could well do, for I had ordered them to keep all night a lamp alight there and in the end they shut their rooms tight, so the dog, abandoning all hope of aid from such rascals, set out alone again on his adventure. He ran down, and not finding the thief in the shop, flew after him. When he got at him, he tore the cape off his back. It would have gone hard with the fellow had he not called for help to certain tailors, praying them for God's sake to save him from a mad dog, and they, believing what he said, jumped out and drove the dog off with much trouble. After sunrise my workman went into the shop and saw that it had been broken open and all the boxes smashed. They began to scream at the top of their voices, Oh, woe is me! Oh, woe is me! The clamour woke me, and I rushed out in a panic. Appearing thus before them, they cried out, Alas to us, for we have been robbed by someone who has broken and borne everything away. These words wrought so forcibly upon my mind that I dared not go to my big chest and look if it still held the jewels of the Pope. So intense was the anxiety that I seemed to lose my eyesight, and told them they themselves must unlock the chest and see how many of the Pope's gems were missing. The fellows were all of them in their shirts, and when on opening the chest they saw the precious stones and my work with them, and they took heart of joy and shouted, There is no harm done, your peace and all the stones are here. But the thief has left us naked to the shirt, because last night, by reason of the burning heat, we took our clothes off in the shop and left them here. Recovering my senses, I thanked God and said, Oh, go and get yourself new suits of clothes. I will pay when I hear at leisure how the whole thing happened. What caused me the most pain, and made me lose my senses and take fright so contrary to my real nature, was the dread lest peradventure folk should fancy I had trumped a story of the robber up to steal the jewels. It had already been paid to Pope Clement by one of his most trusted servants, and by others, that is, by Francesco del Nero, Zana de Bolotti, his accountant, the Bishop of Versona, and several such men. Why, most blessed father, do you confide gems of that vast value to a young fellow who was all fire more passionate for arms than for his art, and not yet thirty years of age? The Pope asked in answer if any one of them knew that I had done aught to justify such suspicions. Whereto Francesco del Nero, his treasurer, replied, No, most blessed father, because he has not as yet had an opportunity. Whereto the Pope rejoined, I regard him as a thoroughly honest man, and if I saw him with my own eyes some crime he had committed, I should not believe it. This was the man who caused me the greatest torment, and who suddenly came before my mind. After telling the young men to provide themselves with fresh clothes, I took my piece together with the gems, setting them as well as I could in their proper places, and went off at once with them to the Pope. Francesco del Nero had already told him something of the trouble in my shop, and had put suspicions in his head. So then, taking the thing rather ill than otherwise, he shot a furious glance at me, and cried haughtily, "'What have you come to do here? What is up?' Here are all your precious stones, and not one of them is missing. At this the Pope's face cleared, and he said, So then you're welcome. I showed him the piece, and while he was inspecting it, I related to him the whole story of the thief and of my agony, and what had been my greatest trouble in the matter. During this speech he oftentimes turned round to look me sharply in the eye, and Francesco del Nero, being also in the presence, this seemed to make him half sorry that he had not guessed the truth. At last, breaking into laughter at the long tale I was telling, he sent me off with these words, Go and take heed to be an honest man, as indeed I know that you are. I went on working assiduously at the button, and at the same time labored for the mint, when certain pieces of false money got abroad in Rome stamped with my own dies. 
They were brought at once to the Pope, who, hearing things against me, said to Jacopo Balducci, the master of the mint, Take every means in your power to find the criminal, for we are sure that Benvenuto is an honest fellow. That traitor of a master, being in fact my enemy, replied, Would God, most blessed father, that it may turn out as you say, for we have some proofs against him. Upon this the Pope turned to the governor of Rome, and bade him see he found the malefactor. During those days the Pope sent for me, and, leading cautiously in conversation to the topic of the coins, asked me at the fitting moment, Benvenuto, should you have the heart to coin false money? To this I replied that I thought I could do so better than all the rascals who gave their minds to such vile work, for fellows who practice lewd trades of that sort are not capable of earning money, nor are they men of much ability. I, on the contrary, with my poor wits, could gain enough to keep me comfortably, for when I set dies for the mint, each morning before dinner, I put at least three crowns into my pocket. This was the customary payment for the dies, and the master of the mint bore me a grudge, because he would have liked to have them cheaper. So then, what I earned with God's grace and the world's sufficed me, and by coining false money, I should not have made so much. The Pope very well perceived my drift, and whereas he had formerly given orders that they should see I did not fly from Rome, he now told them to look well about and have no heed of me, seeing he was ill-disposed to anger me, and in this way run the risk of losing me. The officials who received these orders were certain clerks of the camera, who made the proper search, as was their duty, and soon found the rogue. He was a stamper in the service of the mint, named Cesare Maccheroni, and a Roman citizen. Together with this man they detected a metal founder of the mint. On that very day, as I was passing through the Piazza Novona, and had my fine retriever with me, just when we came opposite the gate of the Bargello, my dog flew barking loudly inside the door upon a youth who had been arrested at the suit of a man called Donino, a goldsmith from Parma, and a formal pupil of Caradozzo, on the charge of having robbed him. The dog strove so violently to tear the fellow to pieces that the constables were moved to pity. It so happened that he was pleading his own cause with boldness, and Donino had no evidence enough to support the accusation, and what was more, one of the corporals of the guard, a Genoese, was a friend of the young man's father. The upshot was that, what with the dog and those other circumstances, they were on the point of releasing their prisoner. When I came up, the dog had lost all fear of sword or staves, and was flying once more at the young man. So they told me if I did not call the brute off, they would kill him. I held him back as well as I was able, but just then the fellow, in the act of readjusting his cape, let fall some paper packets from the hood, which Donino recognized as his property. I, too, recognized a little ring, whereupon I called out, This is the thief who broke into my shop and robbed it, and therefore my dog knows him. Then I loosed the dog, who flew again upon the robber. On this the fellow craved for mercy, promising to give back whatever he possessed of mine. When I had secured the dog, he proceeded to restore the gold and silver and the rings which he had stolen from me, and twenty-five crowns in addition. Then he cried once more to me for pity. I told him to make his peace with God, for I should do him neither good nor evil. So I returned to my business, and a few days afterwards Cesare Maccheroni, the false coiner, was hanged in the banchi opposite the mint. His accomplice was sent to the galleys. The Genoese thief was hanged in the Campo del Fiori, while I remained in better repute as an honest man than I had enjoyed before. When I had nearly finished my peace, there happened that terrible inundation which flooded the whole of Rome. I waited to see what would happen. The day was well nigh spent, for the clock struck twenty-two, and the water went on rising formidably. Now the front of my house and shop faced the Banchi, but the back was several yards higher, because it turned towards Monte Giordano, 
Accordingly, bethinking me first of my own safety, and in the next place of my honour, I filled my pockets with the jewels, and gave the gold pieces into the custody of my workmen, and then descended barefoot from the back windows, and waited as well as I could until I reached Monte Cavallo, where I sought out Messer Giovanni Giardi, clerk of the camera, and Bastiano Viziano, the painter. To the former I confided the precious stones to keep in safety. He had the same regard for me as though I had been his brother. A few days later, when the rage of the river was spent, I returned to my workshop and finished the piece with such good fortune, through God's grace and my own great industry, that it was held to be the finest masterpiece which had been ever seen in Rome. When then I took it to the Pope, he was insatiable in praising me, and said, Were I but a wealthy emperor, I would give my Benvenuto as much land as his eyes could survey. Yet, being nowadays but needy bankrupt potentates, we will at any rate give him bread enough to satisfy his modest wishes. I let the Pope run on to the end of his rotomentade, and then asked him for a mace-bearer's place, which happened to be vacant. He replied that he would grant me something of far greater consequence. I begged His Holiness to bestow this little thing on me, meanwhile by way of earnest. He began to laugh, and said he was willing, but that he did not wish me to serve, and that I must make some arrangement with the other mace-bearers to be exempted. He would allow them through me a certain favour, for which they had already petitioned, namely, the right of recovering their fees at law. This was accordingly done, and that mace-bearer's office brought me in little less than two hundred crowns a year. I continued to work for the Pope, executing now one trifle and now another, and then he commissioned me to design a chalice of exceeding richness. So I made both drawing and model for the piece. The latter was constructed of wood and wax. Instead of the usual top, I fashioned three figures of a fair size in the round. They represented faith, hope, and charity. Corresponding to these at the base of the cup, were three circular histories in bas-relief. One was the Nativity of Christ, the second the Resurrection, and the third St. Peter crucified head downwards, for thus I had received commission. While I had this work in hand, the Pope was often pleased to look at it, wherefore, observing that His Holiness had never thought again of giving me anything, and knowing that a post in the Piombo was vacant, I asked for this one evening. The good Pope, quite oblivious of his extravagances at the termination of the last piece, said to me, That post in Piombo is worth more than eight hundred crowns a year, so that if I gave it to you, you would spend your time in scratching your paunch, and your magnificent handicraft would be lost, and I should bear the blame. I replied at once as thus, Cats of a good breed mouse better when they are fat than starving, and likewise honest men who possess some talent exercise it to far nobler purport when they have the wherewithal to live abundantly. Wherefore, princes who provide such folk with competences, let your holiness take notice, are watering the roots of genius, for genius and talent at their birth come into this world lean and scabby, and your holiness should also know that I never asked for the place with the hopes of getting it, only too happy I to have that miserable post of mace-bearer. On the other I build but castles in the air. Your Holiness will do well, since you do not care to give it to me, to bestow it on a man of talent who deserves it, and not upon some fat ignoramus who will spend his time scratching his paunch, if I may quote your Holiness's own words. Follow the example of Pope Giulio's illustrious memory, who conferred an office of the same kind upon Bramante, that most admirable architect. Immediately on finishing this speech, I made my bow, and went off in a fury. Then Bastiano Veziano, the painter, approached, and said, Most blessed Father, may your holiness be willing to grant it to one who works assiduously in the exercise of some talent, 
and, as your holiness knows, that I am diligent in my art, I beg that I may be thought worthy of it. The Pope replied, That devil Benvenuto will not brook rebuke. I was inclined to give it to him, but it is not right to be so haughty with a Pope. Therefore I do not well know what I am to do. The Bishop of Vesona then came up and put a word in for Bastiano, saying, Most blessed father, Benvenuto is but young, and a sword becomes him better than a friar's frock. Let your holiness give the place to this ingenious person, Bastiano. Some time or other you will be able to bestow on Benvenuto a good thing, perhaps more suitable to him than this would be. Then the Pope, turning to Messer Bartolomeo Valori, told him, When next you meet Benvenuto, let him know from me that it was he who got that office in the Piombo for Bastiano the painter, and add that he may reckon on obtaining the next considerable place that falls. Meanwhile, let him look to his behavior and finish my commissions. The following evening, two hours after sundown, I met Messer Bartolomeo Valori at the corner of the mint. He was preceded by two torches, and was going in haste to the Pope who had sent for him. On my taking off my hat he stopped and called me, and reported in the most friendly manner all the messages the Pope had sent me. I replied that I should complete my work with greater diligence and application than any I had yet attempted, but without the least hope of having any reward whatever from the Pope. Messer Bartolomeo reproved me, saying this was not the way in which one ought to reply to the advances of a Pope. I answered that I should be mad to reply otherwise, mad if I based my hopes on such promises, being certain to get nothing. So I departed and went off to my business. Messer Bartolomeo must have reported my audacious speeches to the Pope, and more, perhaps, than I had really said, for His Holiness waited above two months before he sent to me, and during that while nothing would have induced me to go uncalled for to the palace. Yet he was dying with impatience to see the chalice, and commissioned Messer Roberto Pucci to give heed to what I was about. That right worthy fellow came daily to visit me, and always gave me some kindly word which I returned. The time was drawing nigh now for the Pope to travel toward Bologna. So at last, perceiving that I did not mean to come to him, he made Messer Roberto bid me bring my work that he might see how I was getting on. Accordingly I took it, and, having shown as the piece itself proved that the most important part was finished, I begged him to advance me five hundred crowns, partly on account, and partly because I wanted gold to complete the chalice. The Pope said, Go on, go on at work until it is finished. I answered, as I took my leave, that I would finish it if he paid me the money, and so I went away. End of chapter 52 through 56 Recorded by David Lazarus Chapters 57 through 61 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lazarus. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. Translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 57 through 61. When the Pope took his journey to Bologna, he left Cardinal Salviati as legate of Rome, and gave him commission to push the work that I was doing forward, adding, Benvenuto is a fellow who esteems his own great talents but slightly, and us less. Look to it, then, that you keep him always going, so that I may find the chalice finished on my return. The beast of a cardinal sent for me after eight days, bidding me bring the piece up. On this I went to him without the piece. 
No sooner had I shown my face than he called out, Where is that onion stew of yours? Have you got it ready? I answered, O oh, most reverend Monseigneur, I have not got my onion stew ready, nor shall I make it ready unless you give me onions to concoct it with. At these words the cardinal, who looked more like a donkey than a man, turned uglier by half than he was naturally, and, wanting at once to cut the matter short, cried out, I'll send you to a galley, and then perhaps you'll have the grace to go on with your labour. The bestial manner of the man made me a beast too, and I retorted, Monseigneur, send me to the galleys when I've done deeds worthy of them, but for my present latches I snap my fingers at your galleys. And what is more, I tell you that just because of you I will not set hand further to my peace. Don't send for me again, for I won't appear. No, not if you summon me by the police. After this the good cardinal tried several times to let me know that I ought to go on working, and to bring him what I was doing to look at. I only told his messengers, Say to Monseigneur that he must send me onions if he wants me to get my stew ready. Nor gave I ever any other answer, so that he threw up the commission in despair. The Pope came back from Bologna and sent at once for me, because the Cardinal had written the worst he could of my affairs in his dispatches. He was in the hottest rage imaginable, and bade me come upon the instant with my peace. I obeyed. Now while the Pope was staying at Bologna I had suffered from an attack of inflammation in the eyes, so painful that I scarce could go on living for the torment, and this was the chief reason why I had not carried out my work. The trouble was so serious that I expected for certain to be left without my eyesight, and I had reckoned up the sum on which I could subsist, if I were blind for life. Upon the way to the Pope I turned over in my mind what I should put forward to excuse myself for not having been able to advance his work. I thought that while he was inspecting the chalice I might tell him of my personal embarrassments. However, I was unable to do so, for when I arrived in the presence he broke out coarsely at me. "'Come here with your work. Is it finished?' I displayed it, and his temper rising, he exclaimed, "'In God's truth I tell thee, thou that makest it thy business to hold no man in regard, that were it not for decency and order I would have thee chucked together with thy work there out of the windows.' Accordingly, when I perceived that the Pope had become no better than a vicious beast, my chief anxiety was how I could manage to withdraw from his presence. So while he went on bullying, I tucked the piece beneath my cape, and muttered under my breath, The whole world could not compel a blind man to execute such things as these. Raising his voice still higher, the Pope shouted, Come here, what sayest thou? I stayed in two minds whether or not to dash at full speed down the staircase. Then I took my decision and threw myself upon my knees, shouting as loudly as I could, for he too had not ceased from shouting. If an affirmity has blinded me, am I bound to go on working? He retorted, You saw well enough to make your way hither, and I don't believe one word of what you say. I answered, for I noticed he had dropped his voice a little. Let your holiness inquire of your physician, and you will find the truth out. He said, So ho, softly. At leisure we shall hear if what you say is so. Then, perceiving that he was willing to give me hearing, I added, I am convinced that the only cause of this great trouble which has happened to me is Cardinal Salviati, for he sent to me immediately after your holiness's departure and when I presented myself he called my work a stew of onions, and told me that he would send me to complete it in a galley, and such was the effect upon me of his knavish words, that in my passion I felt my face in flames, and so intolerable a heat attacked my eyes that I could not find my own way home. Two days afterwards cataracts fell on both my eyes, I quite lost my sight, and after your holiness's departure I have been unable to work at all. Rising from my knees, I left the presence without further license. It was afterwards reported to me that the Pope had said, One can give commissions, but not the prudence to perform them, 
I did not tell the cardinal to go so brutally about his business. If it is true that he is suffering from his eyes, of which I shall get information through my doctor, one ought to make allowance for him. A great gentleman, intimate with the Pope, and a man of very distinguished parts, happened to be present. He asked who I was, using terms like these. Most blessed Father, pardon if I put a question. I have seen you yield at one and the same time to the hottest anger I ever observed, and then to the warmest compassion. So I beg your holiness to tell me who the man is, for if he is a person worthy to be helped, I can teach him a secret which may cure him of that infirmity. The Pope replied, He is the greatest artist who was ever born in his own craft. One day, when we are together, I will show you some of his marvellous works, and the man himself to boot, and I shall be pleased if we can see our way toward doing something to assist him. Three days after this the Pope sent for me after dinner-time, and I found that great noble in the presence. On my arrival the Pope had my cape-button brought, and I, in the meantime, drew forth my chalice. The nobleman said on looking at it that he had never seen a more stupendous piece of work. When the button came he was still more struck with wonder, and looking me straight in the face he added, The man is young, I trow, to be so able in his art, and still apt enough to learn much. He then asked me what my name was. I answered, My name is Benvenuto. He replied, And Benvenuto shall I be this day to you. Take flower de luce, stalk, blossom, root together, then decock them over a slack fire, and with the liquid bathe your eyes several times a day. You will most certainly be cured of that weakness. But see that you purge first, and then go forward with the lotion. The Pope gave me some kind of words, so I went away half satisfied. It was true indeed that I had got the sickness, but I believe I had caught it from that fine young servant girl whom I was keeping when my house was robbed. The French disease, for it was that, remained in me more than four months dormant before it showed itself, and then it broke out over my whole body at one instance. It was not like what one commonly observes, but covered my flesh with certain blisters of the size of sixpences and rose-coloured. The doctors would not call it the French disease, albeit I told them why I thought it was. I went on treating myself according to their methods, but derived no benefit. At last, then, I resolved on taking the wood, against the advice of the first physicians in Rome, and I took it with the most scrupulous discipline and rolls of abstinence that could be thought of, and after a few days I perceived in me great amendment. The result was that at the end of fifty days I was cured and as sound as a fish in the water. Some time afterwards I sought to mend my shattered health, and with this view I betook myself to shooting when the winter came. That amusement, however, led me to expose myself to wind and water, and to staying out in marshlands, so that after a few days I fell a hundred times more ill than I had been before. I put myself once more under doctor's orders, and attended to their directions, but grew always worse. When the fever fell upon me, I resolved on having recourse again to the wood, but the doctors forbade it, saying that if I took it with the fever on me I should not have a week to live. However, I made my mind up to disobey their orders, observed the same diet as I had formerly adopted, and after drinking the decoction four days was wholly rid of my fever. My health improved enormously, and while I was following this cure I went on always working at the models of the chalice. I may add that during the time of that strict abstinence I produced finer things and of more exquisite invention than at any other period of my life. After fifty days my health was re-established, and I continued with the utmost care to keep it and confirm it. When at last I ventured to relax my rigid diet, I found myself as wholly free from those infirmities as though I had been born again. Although I took pleasure in fortifying the health I so much longed for, yet I never left off working. Both the chalice and the mint had certainly as much of my intention as was due them and to myself. It happened that, 
Cardinal Salviati, who, as I have related, entertained an hostility against me, had been appointed legate to Parma. In that city, a certain Milanese goldsmith named Tobiah was taking up false coining, and condemned to the gallows and the stake. Representations in his favour, as being a man of great ability, were made to the cardinal, who suspended the execution of the sentence, and wrote to the Pope, saying the best goldsmith in the world had come into his hands, sentenced to death for coining false money, but that he was a good simple fellow who could plead in his excuse that he had taken counsel with his confessor, and had received, as he said from him, permission to do this. Thereto he added, if you send for this great artist to Rome, your holiness will bring down the overweening arrogance of your favourite Benvenuto, and I am quite certain that Tobias' work will please you far more than his. The Pope accordingly sent for him at once, and when the man arrived he made us both appear before him, and commissioned each of us to furnish a design for mounting an unicorn's horn, the finest which had ever been seen and which had been sold for seventeen thousand ducats of the camera. The Pope meant to give it to King Francis, but first he wished it richly set in gold, and ordered us to make sketches for this purpose. When they were finished, we took them to the Pope. That of Tobiah was in the form of a candlestick, the horn being stuck in it like a candle, and at the base of the piece he had introduced four little unicorn heads of a very poor design. When I saw the thing, I could not refrain from laughing gently in my sleeve. The Pope noticed this, and cried, Here, show me your sketch. It was a single unicorn's head, proportioned in size to the horn. I had designed the finest head imaginable, for I took it partly from the horse and partly from the stag, enriching it with fantastic mane and other ornaments. Accordingly, no sooner was it seen than every one decided in my favour. There were, however, present at the competition, certain Milanese gentlemen of the first consequence, who said, Most blessed Father, your holiness is sending this magnificent present into France. Please to reflect that the French are people of no culture, and will not understand the excellence of Benvenuto's work. Pixes like this one of Tobias's will suit their taste well, and these too can be finished quicker. Benvenuto will devote himself to completing your chalice, and you will get two pieces done in the same time. Moreover, this poor man, who you have brought to Rome, will have the chance to be employed." The Pope, who was anxious to obtain his chalice, very willingly adopted the advice of the Milanese gentlefolk. Next day, therefore, he commissioned Tobiah to mount the unicorn's horn, and send his master of the wardrobe to bid me finish the chalice. I replied that I desired nothing in the world more than to complete the beautiful work I had begun, and if the material had been anything but gold, I could very easily have done so myself, but it being gold, his holiness must give me some of the metal if he wanted me to get through with my work. To this the vulgar courtier answered, Zounds! Don't dust the Pope for gold unless you mean to drive him into such a fury as will ruin you. I said, Oh, my good lord, will your lordship please to tell me how one can make bread without flour? Even so, without gold, this piece of mine cannot be finished. The master of the wardrobe, having an inkling that I had made a fool of him, told me he should report all I had spoken to his holiness, and this he did. The Pope flew into a bestial passion, and swore he would wait to see if I was so mad as not to finish it. More than two months passed thus and, though I had declared I would not give a stroke to the chalice, I did not do so, but always went on working with the greatest interest. When he perceived I was not going to bring it, he began to display real displeasure, and protested he would punish me in one way or another. A jeweller from Milan in the papal service happened to be present when these words were spoken. He was called Pompeo, and was closely related to Messer Trajano, the most favoured servant of Pope Clement. The two men came upon a common understanding to him, and said, If your holiness were to deprive Benvenuto of the mint, perhaps he would take it into his head to complete the chalice. To this the Pope answered, No, two evil things would happen. 
First, I should be ill-served in the mint, which concerns me greatly, and secondly, I should certainly not get the chalice. The two Milanese, observing the Pope indisposed towards me, at last so far prevailed that he deprived me of the mint, and gave it to a young Perugian, commonly known as Fagiolo. Pompeo came to inform me that His Holiness had taken my place in the mint away, and that if I did not finish the chalice, he would deprive me of my other things besides. I retorted, Tell His Holiness that he has deprived himself, and not me, of the mint, and that he will be doing the same with regard to those other things of which he speaks, and that if he wants to confer the posts on me again, nothing will induce me to accept it. The graceless and unlucky fellow went off like an arrow to find the Pope and report this conversation. He added also something of his own invention. Eight days later the Pope sent the same man to tell me that he did not mean to finish the chalice, and wanted to have it back precisely at the point to which I had already brought it. I told Pompeo, this thing is not like the mint which it was in his power to take away but five hundred crowns which I received belong to His Holiness, and I am ready to return them. The piece itself is mine, and with it I shall do what I think best." Pompeo ran off to report my speech, together with some biting words, which in my righteous anger I had let fly at himself. After the lapse of three days, on a Thursday, there came to me two favorite chamberlains of His Holiness, one of them is alive now, and a bishop. He was called Messer Pier Giovanni, and was an officer of the wardrobe. The other could claim nobler birth, but his name has escaped me. On arriving they spoke as follows. The Pope has sent us, Benvenuto, and since you have not chosen to comply with his request on easy terms, his commands now are that either you should give us up his peace, or that we should take you to prison. Thereupon I looked them very cheerfully in the face, replying, My lords, if I were to give the work to His Holiness, I should be giving what is mine and not his, and at present I have no intention to make him this gift. I have brought it far forward with great labour, and do not want it to go into the hands of some ignorant beast who will destroy it with no trouble. While I spoke thus, the goldsmith Tobiah was standing by, who even presumptuously asked me for the models also of my work. What I retorted in words worthy of such a rascal need not here be repeated. Then, when those gentlemen, the chamberlains, kept urging me to do quickly what I meant to do, I told them I was ready. So I took my cape up, and before I left the shop I turned to an image of Christ, with solemn reverence and cap in hand, praying as thus. O gracious and undying, just and holy our Lord, all the things thou doest are according to thy justice, which hath no peer on earth. Thou knowest that I have exactly reached the age of thirty, and that up to this hour I was never threatened with a prison for any of my actions. Now that it is thy will that I should go to prison, with all my heart I thank thee for this dispensation." Thereat I turned around to the two chamberlains, and addressed them with a certain lowering look I have. A man of my quality deserve no meaner catchpoles than your lordships. Place me between you, and take me as your prisoner where you like. Those two gentlemen with the most perfect manners burst out laughing, and put me between them. And so we went off, talking pleasantly, until they brought me to the governor of Rome, who was called Il Magellato. When I reached him, and the procurator fiscal was with him, both waiting for me. The Pope's chamberlains, still laughing, said to the governor, We give up to you this prisoner. Now see you take good care of him. We are very glad to have acted in the place of your agents. For Benvenuto has told us that this being his first arrest, he deserved no catchpoles of inferior station than we are. Immediately on leaving us, they sought the Pope, and when they had minutely related the whole matter, he made it first as though he would give away to passion, but afterwards he put crawl upon himself and laughed, because there were then in the presence certain lords and cardinals, my friends who had warmly espoused my cause. Meanwhile the governor and the fiscals were at me, 
partly bullying, partly expostulating, partly giving advice, and saying it was only reason that a man who ordered work from another should be able to withdraw it at his choice, and in any way which he thought best. To this I replied that such proceedings were not warranted by justice, neither could a pope act thus, for that a pope is not of the same kind as certain petty tyrant princes, who treat their folks as badly as they can without regard to law or justice, and so a vicar of Christ may not commit any of these acts of violence. Thereat the governor, assuming his police court style of threatening and bullying, began to say, Benvenuto, Benvenuto, you are going about to make me treat you as you deserve. You will treat me with honour and courtesy, if you wish to act as I deserve. Taking me up again, he cried, Send for the work at once, and don't wait for a second order. I responded, My lords, grant me the favour of being allowed to say four more words in my defence. The fiscal, who was a far more reasonable agent of police than the governor, turned to him and said, Monseigneur, suppose we let him say a hundred words, if he likes, so long as he gives up the work, that is enough for us. I spoke. If any man you like to name had ordered a palace or a house to be built, he could with justice tell the master mason, I do not want you to go on working at my house or palace, and after paying him his labour, he would have the right to dismiss him. Likewise, if a nobleman gave commission for a jewel of a thousand crowns value to be set, when he saw that the jeweller was not serving him according to his desire, he could say, Give me back my stones, for I do not want your work. But in a case of this kind, none of those considerations apply. There is neither house nor jewel here. Nobody can command me further than that I should return the five hundred crowns which I have had. Therefore, Monsignori, do everything you can do, for you will get nothing from me beyond the five hundred crowns. Go and say this to the Pope. Your threats do not frighten me at all, for I am an honest man and stand in no fear of my sins. The governor and fiscal rose and said they were going to the Pope, and should return with the orders which I should soon learn to my cost. So I remained there under guard. I walked up and down a large hall, and they were about three hours away before they came back from the Pope. In that while the flower of our nation among the merchants came to visit me, imploring me not to persist in contending with the Pope, for this might be the ruin of me. I answered them that I had made my mind up quite well what I wished to do. End of chapters 57 through 61 Recording by David Lazarus Chapters 62 through 65 of the Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Volume 1, translated by John Addington Simmons. Chapters 62 through 65. 62. No sooner had the governor returned, together with the procurator from the palace, than he sent for me, and spoke to this effect. Benvenuto, I am certainly sorry to come back from the Pope with such commands as I have received. You must either produce the chalice on the instant, or look to your affairs. Then I replied that, inasmuch as I had never to that hour believed a holy vicar of Christ could commit an unjust act, so I should like to see it before I did believe it. Therefore do the utmost that you can. The governor rejoined, I have to report a couple of words more from the Pope to you, and then I will execute the orders given me. He says that you must bring your work to me here, and that after I have seen it, put into a box and sealed, I must take it to him. He engages his word not to break the seal, and to return the piece to you untouched. But this much he wants to have done, in order to preserve his own honour in the affair. In return to this speech, I answered laughing, that I would very willingly give up my work, in the way he mentioned, 
because I should be glad to know for certain what a pope's word was really worth. Accordingly, I sent for my piece, and having had it sealed as described, gave it up to him. The governor repaired again to the pope, who took the box, according to what the governor himself told me, and turned it several times about. Then he asked the governor if he had seen the work, and he replied that he had, and that it had been sealed up in his presence, and added that it had struck him as a very admirable piece. Thereupon the Pope said, You shall tell Benvenuto that Popes have authority to bind and loose things of far greater consequence than this. And while thus speaking he opened the box with some show of anger, taking off the string and seals with which it was done up. Afterwards he paid it prolonged attention, and as I subsequently heard, showed it to Tobia the goldsmith, who bestowed much praise upon it. Then the Pope asked him if he felt equal to producing a piece in that style. On his saying, yes, the Pope told him to follow it out exactly, then turned to the governor and said, see whether Benvenuto will give it up, for if he does, he shall be paid the value fixed on it by men of knowledge in this art, but if he is really bent on finishing it himself, let him name a certain time, and if you are convinced that he means to do it, let him have all the reasonable accommodations he may ask for. The governor replied, Most blessed father, I know the violent temper of this young man, so let me have authority to give him a sound rating after my own fashion. The Pope told him to do what he liked with words, though he was sure he would make matters worse, and if at last he could do nothing else, he must order me to take the five hundred crowns to his jeweller, Pompeo. The governor returned, sent for me into his cabinet, and casting one of his catchpole's glances, began to speak as follows. Popes have authority to loose and bind the whole world, and what they do is immediately ratified in heaven. Behold your box, then, which has been opened and inspected by His Holiness. I lifted up my voice at once and said, I thank God that now I have learned and can report what the faith of Popes is made of. Then the governor launched out into brutal bullying words and gestures, but perceiving that they came to nothing, he gave up his attempt as desperate and spoke in somewhat milder tones after this wise. Benvenuto, I am very sorry that you are so blind to your own interest, but since it is so, go and take the five hundred crowns, when you think fit, to Pompeo. I took my piece up, went away, and carried the crowns to Pompeo on the instant. It is most likely that the Pope had counted on some want of money or other opportunity preventing me from bringing so considerable a sum at once and was anxious in this way to replace the broken thread of my obedience. When then he saw Pompeo coming to him with a smile upon his lips and the money in his hand, he soundly rated him, and lamented that the affair had turned out so. Then he said, Go find Benvenuto in his shop, and treat him with all the courtesies of which your ignorant and brutal nature is capable, and tell him that if he is willing to finish that piece for a reliquary to hold the corpus domini when I walk in procession, I will allow him the conveniences he wants in order to complete it, providing only that he goes on working. Pompeo came to me, called me out of his shop, and heaped on me the most mawkish caresses of a donkey, reporting everything the Pope had ordered. I lost no time in answering that the greatest treasure I could wish for in the world was to regain the favour of so great a Pope which had been lost to me, not indeed by my fault, but by the fault of my overwhelming illness, and the wickedness of those envious men who take pleasure in making mischief. And since the Pope has plenty of servants, do not let him send you round again, if you value your life. Nay, look well to your safety. I shall not fail, by night or day, to think and do everything I can in the Pope's service, and bear this well in mind, that when you have reported these words to His Holiness, you never in any way whatever meddle with the least of my affairs for I will make you recognize your errors by the punishment they merit. The fellow related everything to the Pope, but in far more brutal terms than I had used, and thus the matter rested for a time while I again attended to my shop and business. 63. Tobia the goldsmith, meanwhile, worked at the setting and the decoration of the unicorn's horn. The Pope, moreover, commissioned him to begin the chalice upon the model he had seen in mine. But when Tobia came to show him what he had done, he was very discontented, and greatly regretted that he had broken with me, blaming all the other man's works and the people who had introduced them to him, and several times Bacino della Croce came from him to tell me that I must not neglect the reliquary. 
I answered that I begged his holiness to let me breathe a little after the great illness I had suffered, and from which I was not as yet wholly free, adding that I would make it clear to him that all the hours in which I could work should be spent in his service. I had indeed begun to make his portrait, and was executing a medal in secret. I fashioned the steel dies for stamping this medal in my own house, whilst I kept a partner in my workshop, who had been my prentice and was called Felice. At that time, as is the want of young men, I had fallen in love with a Sicilian girl who was exceedingly beautiful. On it becoming clear that she returned my affection, her mother perceived how the matter stood and grew suspicious of what might happen. The truth is that I had arranged to elope with the girl for a year to Florence, unknown to her mother, but she, getting wind of this, left Rome secretly one night and went off in the direction of Naples. She gave out that she was gone by the Civita Vecchia, but she really went by Ostia. I followed them to Civita Vecchia, and did a multitude of mad things to discover her. It would be too long to narrate them all in detail, enough that I was on the point of losing my wits or dying. After two months she wrote to me that she was in Sicily, extremely unhappy. I meanwhile was indulging myself in all the pleasures man can think of, and had engaged in another love affair, merely to drown the memory of my real passion. 64. It happened through a variety of singular accidents that I became intimate with a Sicilian priest, who was a man of very elevated genius, and well instructed in both Latin and Greek letters. In the course of conversation one day we were led to talk about the art of necromancy, a propos of which I said, Throughout my whole life I have had the most intense desire to see or learn something of this art. Thereto the priest replied, A stout soul and a steadfast must a man have who sets himself to such an enterprise. I answered that of strength and steadfastness of soul I should have enough and to spare, providing I found the opportunity. Then the priest said, if you have the heart to dare it, I will amply satisfy your curiosity. Accordingly, we agreed upon attempting the adventure. The priest one evening made his preparations, and bade me find a comrade, or not more than two. I invited Vincenzio Romoli, a very dear friend of mine, and the priest took with him a native of Pistoja, who also cultivated the black art. We went together to the Colosseum, and there the priest, having arrayed himself in necromancer's robes, began to describe circles on the earth, with the finest ceremonies that can be imagined. I must say that he had made us bring precious perfumes and fire, and also drugs of fetid odour. When the preliminaries were completed, he made the entrance into the circle, and taking us by the hand, introduced us one by one inside it. Then he assigned our several functions. To the necromancer, his comrade, he gave the pentacle to hold. The other two of us had to look after the fire and the perfumes, and then he began his incantations. This lasted more than an hour and a half, when several legions appeared, and the Colosseum was all full of devils. I was occupied with the precious perfumes, and when the priest perceived in what numbers they were present, he turned to me and said, Benvenuto, ask them something. I called on them to reunite me with my Sicilian Angelica. That night we obtained no answer but I enjoyed the greatest satisfaction of my curiosity in such matters. The necromancer said that we should have to go a second time, and that I should obtain the full accomplishment of my request, but he wished me to bring with me a little boy of pure virginity. I chose one of my shop lads, who was about twelve years old, and invited Vincenzo Romoli again, and we also took a certain Agnolino Gaddi, who was a very intimate friend of both. When we came once more to the place appointed, the necromancer made just the same preparations, attended by the same and even more impressive details. Then he introduced us into the circle, which he had reconstructed with art more admirable and yet more wondrous ceremonies. Afterwards he appointed my friend Vincenzio to the ordering of the perfumes and the fire, and with him Agnolino Gaddi. He next placed in my hand the pentacle, which he bid me turn towards the points he indicated, and under the pentacle I held the little boy, my workman. Now the necromancer began to utter those awful invocations, calling by name on multitudes of demons who are captains of their legions, and these he summoned by the virtue and potency of God, the uncreated, living and eternal, in phrases of the Hebrew, and also of the Greek and Latin tongues, insomuch that in a short space of time the whole Colosseum was full of a hundredfold as many as had appeared upon the first occasion. Vincenzio Romoli, 
together with Agnolino, tended the fire and heaped on quantities of precious perfumes. At the advice of the necromancer, I again demanded to be reunited with Angelica. The sorcerer turned to me and said, Hear you what they have replied, that in the space of one month you will be where she is. Then once more he prayed me to stand firm by him, because the legions were a thousandfold more than he had summoned, and were the most dangerous of all the denizens of hell. And now that they had settled what I asked, it behoved us to be civil to them and dismiss them gently. On the other side, the boy who was beneath the pentacle, shrieked out in terror that a million of the fiercest men were swarming round and threatening us. He said, moreover, that four huge giants had appeared, who were striving to force their way inside the circle. Meanwhile the necromancer, trembling with fear, kept doing his best with mild and soft persuasions to dismiss them. Vincenzio Romoli, who quaked like an aspen leaf, looked after the perfumes, though I was quite as frightened as the rest of them. I tried to show it less, and inspired them all with marvellous courage. But the truth is that I had given myself up for dead when I saw the terror of the necromancer. The boy had stuck his head between his knees, exclaiming, This is how I will meet death, for we are certainly dead men. Again I said to him, These creatures are all inferior to us, and what you see is only smoke and shadow, so then raise your eyes. When he had raised them, he cried out, The whole Colosseum is in flames, and the fire is advancing on us. Then covering his face with his hands, he groaned again that he was dead, and that he could not endure the sight longer. The necromancer appealed for my support, entreating me to stand firm by him, and to have Asafetida flung upon the coals. So I turned to Vincenzio Romoli and told him to make the fumigation at once. While uttering these words I looked at Agnolino Gaddi, whose eyes were staring from their sockets in his terror, and who was more than half dead, and said to him, Agnolo, in a time and place like this we must not yield to fright, but do the utmost to bestir ourselves. Therefore, up at once and fling a handful of that asafetida upon the fire. Agnolo, at that moment when he moved to do this, let fly such a volley from his breech that it was far more effectual than the asafetida. The boy, roused by that great stench and noise, lifted his face little, and hearing me laugh, he plucked up courage, and said the devils were taking to flight tempestuously. So we abode this until the matin bells began to sound. Then the boy told us again that but few remained, and those were at a distance. When the necromancer had concluded his ceremonies, he put off his wizard's robe, and packed up a great bundle of books, which he had brought with him. Then, altogether, we issued with him from the circle, huddling as close as we could to one another, especially the boy, who had got into the middle, and taken the necromancer by his gown and me by the cloak. All the while that we were going toward our houses in the Banshee, he kept saying that two of the devils he had seen in the Colosseum were gambling in front of us, skipping now along the roofs and now upon the ground. The necromancer assured me that, often as he had entered magic circles, he had never met with such a serious affair as this. He also tried to persuade me to assist him in consecrating a book, by means of which we should extract immeasurable wealth, since we could call up fiends to show us where treasures were, whereof the earth is full, and after this wise we should become the richest of mankind. Love affairs like mine were nothing but vanities and follies without consequence. I replied that if I were a Latin scholar I should be very willing to do what he suggested. He continued to persuade me by arguing that Latin scholarship was of no importance, and that if he wanted he could have found plenty of good Latinists, but that he had never met with a man of soul so firm as mine, and that I ought to follow his counsel. Engaged in this conversation, we reached our homes, and each one of us dreamed all that night of devils. 65. As we were in the habit of meeting daily, the necromancer kept urging me to join in his adventure. Accordingly, I asked him how long it would take, and where we should have to go. To this he answered that we might get through with it in less than a month, and that the most suitable locality for the purpose was the hill country of Norkia. A master of his in the art had indeed consecrated such a book quite close to Rome, at a place called the Badia di Farfa, but he had met with some difficulties there, which would not occur in the mountains of Nokia. The peasants also of that district are people to be trusted, and have some practice in these matters, so that at a pinch they are able to render valuable assistance. This priestly sorcerer moved me so by his persuasions that I was well disposed to comply with his request but I said I wanted first to finish the medals I was making for the Pope. 
I had confided what I was doing about them to him alone, begging him to keep my secret. At the same time I never stopped asking him if he believed that I should be reunited to my Sicilian Angelica at the time appointed, for the date was drawing near, and I thought it singular that I heard nothing about her. The necromancer told me that it was quite certain I should find myself where she was, since the devils never break their word when they promise, as they did on that occasion. But he bade me keep my eyes open, and be on the lookout against some accident which might happen to me in that connection, and put restraint upon myself to endure somewhat against my inclination, for he could discern a great and imminent danger in it. Well would it be for me if I went with him to consecrate the book, since this would avert the peril that menaced me, and would make us both most fortunate. I was beginning to hanker after the adventure more than he did, but I said that a certain Maestro Giovanni of Castel Bolognese had just come to Rome, very ingenious in the art of making medals of the sort I made in steel, and that I thirsted for nothing more than to compete with him and take the world by storm with some great masterpiece, which I hoped would annihilate all those enemies of mine by the force of genius and not the sword. The sorcerer on his side went on urging, Nay, prithee, Benvenuto, come with me and shun a great disaster which I see impending over you. However, I had made my mind up, come what would, to finish my medal, and we were now approaching the end of the month. I was so absorbed and enamoured of by 